Chapter 11, Part 2 of The Great White North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Katerina. The Great White North by Helen S. Wright. Chapter 11, Part 2, The Second Grinnell Expedition. But by far the most remarkable feature of the great white north visited by Dr. Kane was the great glacier of Humboldt. I will not attempt to do better by florid description, he writes. Men only rhapsodize about Niagara and the ocean. My notes speak simply of the long ever-shining line of cliff diminished to a well-pointed wedge in the perspective, and again of the face of glistening ice sweeping in a long curve from the low interior the facets in front intensely illuminated by the sun. But this line of cliff rose in solid glassy wall 300 feet above the water level with an unknown, unfathomable depth below, and its curved face, 60 miles in length from Cape Agassiz to Cape Forbes, vanished into unknown space at not more than a single Dales railroad travel from the pole. The interior with which it communicated and from which it issued was an unsurveyed mer de glace, an ice ocean, to the eye of boundless dimensions. It was in full sight, the mighty crystal bridge which connects the two continents of America and Greenland. I say continents, for Greenland, however insulated it may ultimately prove to be, is in mass strictly continental. Its last possible axis, measured from Cape Farewell to the line of this glacier in the neighborhood of the 80th parallel, gives a length of more than 1,200 miles not materially less than that of Australia from its northern to its southern cape. Imagine now the center of such a continent, occupied through nearly its whole extent by a deep unbroken sea of ice that gathers perennial increase from the watershed of vast snow-covered mountains and all the precipitation of the atmosphere upon its own surface. Imagine this moving onward like a great glacial river, seeking outlets at every fjord and valley, rolling icy cataracts and having at last reached the northern limit of the land that has borne it up, pouring out a mighty frozen torrent into unknown Arctic space. It is thus, and only thus, that we must form a just conception of a phenomenon like this great glacier. I had looked in my own mind for such an appearance, should I ever be fortunate enough to reach the northern coast of Greenland. But now that it was before me, I could hardly realize it. I had recognized in my quiet library and home the beautiful analogies which Forbes and Staden have developed between the glacier and the river, but I could not comprehend at first this complete substitution of ice for water. It was slowly that the conviction dawned on me that I was looking upon the counterpart of the great river system of Arctic Asia and America. Yet here were no water feeders from the south. Every particle of moisture had its origin within the polar circle and had been converted into ice. There were no vast alluvians, no forest or animal traces borne down by liquid torrents. Here was a plastic, moving, semi-solid mass, obliterating life, swallowing rocks and islands, and ploughing its way with irresistible march through the crust of an investing sea. By May 5th, Dr. Kane became delirious and fainted every time he was taken from the tent. My comrades would kindly pursue me that, even had I continued sound, we could not have proceeded on our journey. The snows were very heavy and increasing as we went, some of the drifts perfectly impassable, and the level flows often four feet deep in yielding snow. The scurvy had already broken out among the men, with symptoms like my own, and Morton, our strongest man, was beginning to give way. It is the reverse of comfort to me that they shared my weakness. All that I could remember with pleasurable feeling is that to five brave men— Morton, Riley, Hickey, Stevenson, and Hans, themselves scarcely able to travel, I owe my preservation. They carried me back by forced marches after cushing our stores in India rubber boat near Dallas Bay, in latitude 79 degrees 5 minutes, longitude 66 degrees. Such was the failure of the grand expedition. The gentle hand of summer now extended much needed relief to the stricken crew. Seals began to appear in such large numbers that there was no want of fresh meat, which worked wonders in the health of those suffering with scurvy. Snow buntings and gulls and eider ducks came winging their way to their northern breeding places, 
and the warm sun brought out the welcome verdure with marvelous rapidity. Dr. Kane's health improved, but he was obliged to give up further sledge journeys. To Dr. Hayes was entrusted a journey in which he reached the opposite coast of Grinnell Land, which he surveyed as far as Cape Fraser. On June 1st, Morton left the brig with Hans, the Eskimo, for the purpose of surveying the Greenland coast beyond the Humboldt Glacier. The lateness of the season rendered much of the ice extremely unsafe. On June 26, 1854, Morton reached the bold headland of Cape Constitution, where the surf dashed so furiously against the high, overhanging cliffs that further progress was impossible. Climbing from rock to rock in the hope of finding a pass, he stood at last at a height of 300 feet and looked out upon a great waste of waters, stretching as far as the eye could reach into the unknown north. About him the flocks of sea swallows, kittiwakes, and brent geese blended their discordant notes with the thunderous roll of the sea. From Cape Constitution the coast of Washington land trended to the east, but far to the northwest, beyond the open waters of the channel, a peak terminating a range of mountains was seen towering at a height from 2,500 to 3,000 feet, and this remote landmark received the name of Mount Perry. On the 25th of June, Morton commenced his return and reached the brig on the 10th of July, staggering by the side of the limping dogs, one of which was riding as a passenger upon the sledge. Meanwhile, the brief summer was rapidly waning. There seemed no promise of the ice breaking up, and the alarming prospect of passing a second winter in the ice forced itself upon the gallant commander and his brave and suffering crew. "'We have no coal for a second winter here,' he writes. "'Our stock of fresh provisions is utterly exhausted.' and our sick need change as essential to their recovery. An unsuccessful attempt was made to reach Sir Edward Belcher's squadron at Beachy Island. The season travels on, writes Dr. Kane on August 15th. The young ice grows thicker, and my messmates' faces grow longer every day. I have again to play buffoon to keep up the spirits of the party. A raven. The snowbirds begin to fly to the south in groups, coming at night to our brig to hover on the rigging. Winter is hurrying upon us. The poppies are quite wilted. Two days later we find the entry. In five days the spring tides come back. Should we fail in passing with them, I think our fortunes are fixed. The young ice bore a man this morning. It had a bad look, this man supporting August ice. The temperature never falls below 28 degrees, but it is colder nights with no fire. August 18th, Friday, he writes reduced our allowance of wood to six pounds a meal. This, among eighteen mouths, is one-third of a pound of fuel each. It allows us coffee twice a day and soup once. Our fare besides this is cold pork boiled in quantity and eaten as required. This sort of thing works badly, but I must save coal for other emergencies. I see darkness ahead. I inspected the ice again today. Bad, bad. I must look another winter in the face. I do not shrink from the thought, but, while we have a chance ahead, it is my first duty to have all things in readiness to meet it. It is horrible, yes, that is the word, to look forward to another year of disease and darkness to be met without fresh food and without fuel. I should meet it with a more temperate sadness if I had no comrades to think for and protect. August 20th, Sunday. Rest for all hands. The daily prayer is no longer, Lord, accept our gratitude and bless our undertaking, but, Lord, accept our gratitude and restore us to our homes. The ice shows no change, after a boat and foot journey around the entire southeastern curve of the bay. No signs. The future looked so gloomy, and Dr. Kane's apprehension for the ultimate safety of his party was so grave, that he determined to erect a cairn in a conspicuous spot upon a cliff, Looking out upon the icy desert and on a broad face of the rock, the words Advance A.D. 1853 to 54 were painted in letters which could be read at a distance. A pyramid of heavy stones perched above it was marked with the Christian symbol of the cross. It was not without a holier sentiment than that of mere utility that I placed under this the coffins of our two poor comrades. It was our beacon and their gravestone. Near this a hole was worked into the rock, and a paper enclosed in glass, sealed in with melted lead. This paper contained a careful record of the expedition up to date. 
the memory of the first winter quarters of sir john franklin and the painful feelings with which while standing by the graves of his dead i had five years before sought for written signs pointing to the fate of the living made me careful to avoid a similar neglect on august twenty fourth the last hope of liberating the vessel vanished and calling his officers and crew together dr kane explained to them the full gravity of the situation and though he was fully determined to stand by the brig and felt that an attempted retreat to the settlement of Upernavik so late in the season would certainly fail, he nevertheless gave his full permission to those desiring to leave, and the promise of a brother's welcome should they be driven back. The roll was then called, and eight of the men out of the seventeen survivors of the party volunteered to remain in the ship. The rest made ready to abandon her, and with a generous division of stores and appliances left the ship on the twenty-eighth. The party moved off with the elastic step of men confident in their purpose, and were out of sight in a few hours. Reduced in numbers, many of them helpless, the waning efficiency of all, combined with the impending winter darkness and the scant supply of fuel and stores, tended sadly to depress the isolated group of despairing men. But their intrepid commander, realizing the necessity of immediate action, put all hands, sick and well, to work according to their strength in preparation for the approaching of winter. Dr. Kane had made a careful study of the Eskimos and had come to the wise conclusion that their form of habitations and their peculiar diet, minus their unthrift and filth, was the safest and best method of existence under the unusual circumstances of an Arctic winter. He therefore determined to borrow a lesson from the natives and, as far as possible, turn the brig into an igloo. The quarter-deck was padded down with moss and turf, so as to form a nearly cold-proof covering. Below a space some eighteen feet square was packed from floor to ceiling with inner walls of the same material. The floor was carefully caulked with plaster of Paris and common paste, covered a couple of inches deep with manila oakum, and carpeted with canvas. A low moss-lined tunnel was arranged to connect with the hold, and divided with as many doors and curtains as possible to keep out the cold drafts. Large banks of snow were also thrown up along the brig's sides to keep off the cold wind. These arduous labors in the open air greatly improved the health and spirits of the men. Intercourse with the Eskimos at the winter settlements of Eta and Anuatok, distant some thirty and seventy miles, led to a treaty by which the Eskimos, for such presents as needles, pins, and knives, engaged to furnish walrus and fresh seal meat to the ship. Common hunting parties were organized, and the white men were directed by the natives where to find the game. To these supplies of fresh meat, Cain and his companions owed their salvation, and the Eskimos on their part learned to regard the white men as their benefactors, and sincerely mourned their departure. Before the darkness came on, Dr. Cain again nearly lost his life in an attempt to secure a seal. While out in the ice, Hans had just cried out, Pusey! Pusey Mutt! Seal! Seal! At the same instant, writes Dr. Kane, the dogs bounded forward, and, as I looked up, I saw crowds of grey netzig, the rough or hispid seal of the whalers disporting in an open sea of water. I had hardly welcomed the spectacle when I saw that we had passed upon a new belt of ice that was obviously unsafe. To the right and left and front was one great expanse of snow-flowered ice. The nearest solid flow was a mere lump, which stood like an island in the white level. To turn was impossible, we had to keep up our gait. We urged on the dogs with whip and voice, the ice rolling like leather beneath the sledge runners. It was more than a mile to the lump of solid ice. Fear gave to the poor beasts their utmost speed, and our voices were soon hushed to silence. This suspense, unrelieved by action or efforts, was intolerable. We knew that there was no remedy but to reach the flow, and that everything depended upon our dogs, and our dogs alone. A moment's check would plunge the whole concern into the rapid tideway. No presence of mind or resource, bodily or mental, could avail us. The seals, for we were now near enough to see their expressive faces, were looking at us with that strange curiosity which seems to be their characteristic expression. We must have passed some fifty of them, breast high out of water, mocking us by their self-complacency. This desperate race against fate could not last. The rolling of the tough salt-water ice terrified our dogs, and when within fifty paces from the flow, they passed. 
the left-hand runner went through, our leader Tudlamik followed, and in one second the entire left of the sledge was submerged. My first thought was to liberate the dogs. I leaned forward to cut poor Tud's traces, and the next minute was swimming in a little circle of pasty ice and water alongside him. Hans, dear good fellow, drew near to me, uttering piteous expressions in broken English, but I ordered him to throw himself on his belly with his hands and legs extended, and to make for the island by cogging himself forward with his jackknife. In the meantime, a mere instant, I was floundering about with sledge, dogs and lines in a confused puddle around me. I succeeded in cutting poor Toot's lines and letting him scramble to the ice, for the poor fellow was drowning me with his piteous caresses and made my way for the sledge, but I found that it would not buoy me and that I had no resource but to try the circumference of the hole. Around this I paddled faithfully, the miserable ice always yielding when my hopes of a lodgment were greatest. During this process I enlarged my circle of operations to a very uncomfortable diameter and was beginning to feel weaker after every effort. Hans, meanwhile, had reached the firm ice and was on his knees, like a good Moravian, praying incoherently in English and Eskimo. At every fresh crushing in of the ice he would ejaculate, God, and when I recommenced my paddling he recommenced his prayers. I was nearly gone. My knife had been lost in cutting out the dogs, and a spare one which I carried in my trousers pocket was so enveloped in the wet skins that I could not reach it. I owed my extrication at last to a newly broken team dog, who was still fast to the sledge, and in struggling carried one of the runners chock against the edge of the circle. All my previous attempts to use the sledge as a bridge had failed, for it broke through, to the much greater injury of the ice. I felt it was at last a chance. I threw myself on my back so as to lessen as much as possible my weight and placed the nape of my neck against the run or edge of the ice, then with caution slowly bent my leg, and, placing the ball of my moccasined foot against the sledge, I pressed steadily against the runner, listening to the half-yielding crunch of the ice beneath. Presently I felt that my head was pillowed by the ice and that my wet fur jumper was sliding up the surface. Next came my shoulders. They were fairly on. One more decided push and I was launched up on the ice and safe. I reached the ice floe and was frictioned by Hans with frightful zeal. We saved all the dogs, but the sledge, kayak, tents, guns, snowshoots and everything besides were left behind. The thermometer at eight degrees will keep them frozen fast in the sledge till we can come and cut them out. On reaching the ship after a twenty-mile trot, I found so much of comfort and warm welcome that I forgot my failure. The fire was lit up and one of our few birds slaughtered forthwith. It is with real gratitude that I look back upon my escape and bless the great presiding goodness for the very many resources which remain to us. On December 12th, the party which had deserted the ship returned. They had had a bitter experience, struggling for more than four months among the hummocks and snowdrifts, and were in a pitiable condition. The thermometer was at negative 50 degrees, writes Dr. Kane, they were covered with rime and snow and were fainting with hunger. It was necessary to use caution in taking them below, for after an exposure of such fearful intensity and duration as they had gone through, the warmth of the cabin would have prostrated them completely. They had journeyed 350 miles, and their last run from the bay near Eta, some 70 miles in a right line, was through the hummocks at this appalling temperature. Poor fellows! as they threw open their Eskimo garments by the stove, how they relished the scanty luxuries which we had to offer them, the coffee and the meat biscuit soup and the molasses and the wheat bread, even the salt pork which our scurvy forbade the rest of us to touch, how they relished it all. For more than two months they had lived on frozen seal and walrus meat. To Dr. Kane's determination to stand by the brig was due the preservation of the entire party, for had he been less firm in his resolution, the entire expedition would undoubtedly have perished on the ice. February closes, writes the heroic leader. Thank God the lapse of its twenty-eight days. Should the thirty-one of the coming march not drag us further downward, we may hope for a successful close to this dreary drama. By April 10 we should have seals, and when they come, if we remain to welcome them, we can call ourselves saved. But a fair review of our prospects tells me that I must look the lion in the face. The scurvy is steadily gaining on us. 
I do my best to sustain the more desperate cases, but as fast as I partially build up one, another is stricken down. Of the six workers of our party, as I counted them a month ago, two are unable to do outdoor work, and the remaining four divide the duty of the ship among them. Hans musters his remaining energies to conduct the hunt. Peterson is his disheartened, moping assistant. The other two, Bonsall and myself, have all the daily offices of household and hospital. We chop five large sacks of ice, cut six fathoms of eight-inch hawser into junks of a foot each, serve out the meat when we have it, hack at the molasses, and hew out with crowbar and axe the pork and dried apples, pass up the foul slop and cleansings of our dormitory, and in a word cook, scallionize, and attend the sick. Added to this, for five nights running, I have kept watch from 8 p.m. to 4 a.m., catching such naps as I could in the day without changing my clothes, but carefully waking every hour to note thermometers. The sufferings endured during the month of March are painfully interesting. Had Dr. Kane's strength given way at this juncture, the whole party, deprived of their leading spirit, must have perished. He attributes his comparative immunity from scurvy to rat soup. These rodents, surviving the bleak winter, had overrun the ship, but he was the only man who would eat them. Having no fuel, the only method of heating was the Eskimo method of lamps, the soot and fatty carbon blackening everything on which it rested. Heroic methods were made to keep in touch with the friendly natives, and Hans, on more than one occasion, saved the life of the party by securing fresh meat from them. To add to their troubles, two men attempted to desert at this critical juncture, only one succeeded, Godfrey, who joined the Eskimos. But strange as it may seem, this man returned with a supply of meat for his desperate comrades, while refusing to return on board ship. Fearing Godfrey might have done bodily harm to Hans, who was absent, Dr. Kane determined to follow the man and bring him back. To this end he made a journey along with a dog sledge of over 80 miles to the Eskimo settlement and returned with his man. There was no other alternative but to prepare for abandoning the advance, as early in the spring as the weather would permit, and hope to reach the Danish settlements at Upernavik. Before the boats could be transferred to the open water, much labor and preparation must be expended, and the most of the party were bedridden and unable to move. Not until May 20th, 1855, were they able to bid farewell to the brig, and the retreat was started under the most trying experiences of sickness and famine. By June 17th, they stood beside open sea, but not for 56 more days did they reach Upernavik. Before the open water was reached, a sad and tragic accident had befallen one of the ablest men. I had left the party on the flow, writes Dr. Kane, with many apprehensions for their safety, and the result proved they were not without cause. While crossing a tide hole, one of the runners of the Hope's sledge broke through, and, but for the strength and presence of mind of Olsen, the boat would have gone under. He saw the ice give way, and, by a violent exercise of strength, passed the capstan bar under the sledge, and thus bore the load until it was hauled onto safer ice. He was a very powerful man, and might have done this without injuring himself, but it would seem his footing gave way under him, forcing him to make a still more desperate effort to extricate himself. It cost him his life, he died three days afterwards. I was bringing down George Stevenson from the sixth station, and, my sledge being heavily laden, I had just crossed with some anxiety near the spot at which the accident occurred. A little way beyond we met Mr. Olsen, seated upon a lump of ice and very pale. He pointed to the camp about three miles farther on, and told us in a faint voice that he had not detained the party. He had a little cramp in the small of his back, but would soon be better. I put him at once in Stevenson's place and drove him on to the Faith. There he was placed in the stern sheets of the boat and well muffled up in our best buffalo robes. During all that night he was assiduously attended by Dr. Hayes, but he sank rapidly. His symptoms had from the first a certain obscure but fatal resemblance to our winter's tetanus and filled us with forebodings. The strength of the stricken band was gradually reaching its minimum. The exertion of bailing the unseaworthy boats required all the strength left to the enfeebled party. They breathed heavily, their limbs swelled, and they suffered from insomnia, so that each day rendered their weakened efforts less promising. At this crisis of their fortunes, they saw a large seal floating on a small patch of ice and seemingly asleep. 
Trembling with anxiety, writes Dr. Kane, we prepared to crawl down upon him. Peterson, with a large English rifle, was stationed in the bow, and stockings were drawn over the oars as mufflers. As we neared the animal, our excitement became so intense that the men could hardly keep stroke. He was not asleep, for he reared his head when we were almost within rifle shot, and to this day I can remember the hard, careworn, almost despairing expression of the men's thin faces as they saw him move. Their thin lives depended on his capture. I depressed my hand nervously as a signal for Peterson to fire. McGarry hung upon his oar, and the boat seemed to me within certain range. Looking at Peterson, I saw that the poor fellow was paralyzed by his anxiety, trying vainly to obtain a rest for his gun against the cut water of the boat. The seal rose on his foreflipper, gazed at us for a moment with frightened curiosity, and coiled himself for a plunge. At that instant, simultaneously with the crack of our rifle, he relaxed his long length on the ice, and, at the very brink of the water, his head fell helpless to one side. I would have ordered another shot, but no discipline could have controlled the men. With a wild yell, each vociferating according to his own impulse, they urged their boats upon the floes. A crowd of hands seized the seal and bore him up to safer ice. The men seemed half crazy. I had not realized how much we were reduced by absolute famine. They ran over the floe, crying and laughing and brandishing their knives. It was not five minutes before every man was sucking his bloody fingers or mouthing long strips of raw blubber. Not an ounce of the seal was lost. A few days later, the familiar cadence of a halloo fell upon the ears. Listen, Peterson, oars, men, what is it? And he listened quietly at first, and then trembling said in half a whisper, Den markers. I remember this, writes Cain, the first tone of Christian voice which had greeted our return to the world. How we all stood up and peered into the distant nooks, and how the cry came to us again, just as, having seen nothing, we were doubting whether the whole was not a dream, and then how, with long sweeps, the white ash cracking under the spring of the rowers, we stood for the cape that the sound proceeded from, and how nervously we scanned the green spots which our experience, grown now into instinct, told us would be the likely camping ground of Wayfarer. By and by, for we must have been pulling a good half hour, the single mast of a small shallop showed itself, and Peterson, who had been very quiet and grave, burst out into an incoherent fit of crying, only relieved by broken exclamations of mingled Danish and English. "'Tis the Upernavik oil boat, the Fräulein Fleischer. Carly Mossen, the assistant cooper, must be on his road to Kinga Talk for Blubber. The Marianne, the one animal ship, has come, and Carly Mossen, and here he did it all over again, gulping down his words and wringing his hands. Another halt, a night's rest, and the settlement was reached, where a generous welcome awaited the weary explorers. For eighty-four days, says Kane, we had lived in the open air. Our habits were hard and weather-worn. We could not remain within the four walls of a house without a distressing sense of suffocation. But we drank coffee that night before many a hospitable threshold, and listened again and again to the hymn of welcome, which, sung by many voices, greeted our deliverance. The Danish vessel was not ready for our homeward journey till the 4th of September. On the 6th, Dr. Kane and his party left Upernavik in the Marianne, whose captain had promised to convey them to the Shetland Islands. On the 11th, they touched at Godhaven, the inspectorate of North Greenland, and later at Disco, where the Marianne remained a few days. As early as February 3, 1855, a resolution had passed Congress authorizing the Secretary of the Navy to dispatch a suitable steamer and tender for the relief of Dr. Kane. The release and Arctic were accordingly equipped and put in command of Lieutenant Hartstein, accompanied by a brother of Dr. Kane. By July 5th, the relief expedition had reached lively Isle of Disco, Greenland, and from this point, Lieutenant Hartstein says in the letter to the Secretary of the Navy, to avoid further risk of human life in a search so extremely hazardous, I would suggest the impropriety of making any efforts to relieve us if we should not return, feeling confident that we shall be able to accomplish all necessary for our own release under the most extraordinary circumstances. Having forced a passage through the closely packed ice into the north water, they proceeded to examine the coast from Cape York to Walstenholm Island, also Cape Alexander and Sutherland Island. 
A few stones heaped together near Point Palom gave assurance of Kane's having been there, but no other clue was secured. Taking a retrograde course, they examined Cape Haverton and Littleton Island, finally reaching a point some fifteen miles northwest of Cape Alexander. Here they were surprised to fall in with some Eskimos, in whose possession were found certain articles known to have belonged to Dr. Kane. After diligent inquiries, they learned of the abandonment of the ship and the retreat to the south of Dr. Kane's party. After some further reconnoitering in the hope of finding the party should they be in the vicinity, Lieutenant Hartstein decided to make for Apanavik. A furious gale drove them out of their course adrift in the ice pack. After this gale, writes Dr. Kane's brother, we had little or no more troubles with the ice. One or two trifling detentions of a few days brought us to open water. We had drifted so far to the south that Lively was nearer than Upernavik, and Captain Hartstein determined to put in there. We had a heavy gale the night after we left the ice, but so glad were we all to get clear of it that I heard no complaints about rough weather. It cleared away beautifully towards morning, and we were all on the deck, admiring the clear water and the fantastic shapes of the water-washed icebergs. All hands were in high spirits. The gale had blown in the right direction, and in a few hours we should be in Lively. The rocks of its landlocked harbor were already in sight. We were discussing our news by anticipation, when the man in the crow's nest cried out, A brick in the harbor! And the next minute, before we had time to congratulate each other on the chance of sending letters home, that she had hoisted American colors. A delicate compliment, we thought, on the part of our friends, the Danes. I believe our captain was about to return it, when to our surprise she hoisted another flag, the veritable one which had got out with the advance, bearing the name of Mr. Henry Grinnell. At the same moment two boats were seen rounding the point and pulling towards us. Did they contain our lost friends? Yes, the sailors had settled that. Those are Yankees, sir. No Danes ever feathered their oars that way. For those who had friends among the missing party, the few minutes that followed were of bitter anxiety, for the men in the boats were long-bearded and weather-beaten. They had strange wild costumes. There was no possibility of recognition. In Dr. Kane's own words, let us conclude the chapter. Presently we were alongside. An officer whom I shall ever remember as a cherished friend, Captain Hartstein, hailed the little man in a ragged flannel shirt. Is this Dr. Kane? And with the yes that followed, the rigging was manned by our countrymen, and she has welcomed us back to the social world of love by which they were presented. Dr. Kane and his party reached New York October 11, 1855, and received an enthusiastic welcome after an absence of thirty months. Honors of the most flattering kind awaited him on both sides of the Atlantic, but his health was completely broken by the trials of his wonderful journey. On February 16, 1857, he died at Havana in the 37th year of his age. End of chapter 11, part 2「Chapter Twelve of the Great White North This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Carter The Great White North by Helen S. Wright Chapter Twelve Dr. Hayes' Expedition Winter Quarters at Port Falk Greenland Coast Death of Sontag Dr. Hayes' Journey Attempt to Cross Smith Sound Hayes' Farthest Open Polar Sea Homeward Bound In 1860, Dr. Hayes, who had accompanied the second Greenell expedition and rendered much valuable service to Dr. Kane and his party, once more sailed from America for the purpose of completing the survey of the north coasts of Greenland and Greenland land and to make such explorations as he might find practicable in the direction of the North Pole. My proposed base of operations, writes Dr. Hayes, was Greenland land, which I had discovered on my former voyage, and had personally traced beyond latitude 80 degrees, far enough to satisfy that it was available for my design. 
On the morning of July 8, 1860, the United States was fairly on her way, and, by July 30, Dr. Hayes had the satisfaction of being once more within the Arctic Circle. We had some rough handling in Davis Strait, he writes. Once I thought we had surely come ingloriously to grief. We were running before the wind and fighting a wretched cross sea under reefed, fore and mainsail and jib, when the fore rail was carried away. Down came everything to the deck, and there was left not a stitch of canvas on the schooner but the lumbering mainsail. It was a miracle that we did not broach to and go to the bottom. Nothing saved us but a steady hand at the helm. After several narrow escapes in the ice field, the United States was at length compelled to take up her winter quarters at Port Falk on the Greenland coast, about twenty miles to the south of Rensselaer Harbor. An abundant commissariat, amply supplied by fresh meat, kept up the general health of the party during the long night, and they escaped scurvy, which had proved so fatal to Dr. Kane's crew. A great catastrophe was the death by freezing of Sontag, the astronomer, who had been a valuable member of Dr. Kane's expedition, and a much-beloved friend of Dr. Hayes. Accompanied by Hans Hendrick, he had started on a sledge journey of the Eta Eskimo, on February 1, Dr. Hayes writes, Hans has given me the story of his journey, and I sit down to record it with very painful emotions. The travelers rounded Cape Alexander without difficulty, finding the ice solid. They did not halt until they had reached Sutherland Island, where they built a snow hut and rested for a few hours. Continuing thence down the coast, they sought the Eskimo at Sorphalic without success. The native hut at that place being in ruins, they made for their shelter another house of snow, and, after being well rested, they set out directly for Northumberland Island, having concluded that it was useless to seek longer for natives on the north side of the Sound. They had proceeded on their course about four or five miles as nearly as I can judge from Hans' description, when Sontag, growing a little chilled, sprang off the sledge and ran ahead of the dogs to warm himself with the exercise. The tangling of a trace obliging Hans to halt the team for a few minutes, he fell some distance behind and was hurrying to catch up, when he suddenly observed Sontag sinking. He had come upon the thin ice, covering a recently opened tide crack, and probably not observing his footing, he stepped upon it unawares. Hans hastened to his rescue, and aided him out of the water, and then turned back for the shelter which they had recently abandoned. A light wind was blowing at the time from the northeast, and this, according to Hans, caused Sontag to seek the hut without stopping to change his wet clothing. At first he ran beside the sledge, and thus guarded against danger. But after a while he rode, and when they halted at Sorphalic, Hans discovered that his companion was stiff and speechless. Assisting him into the hut with all possible dispatch, Hans states that he removed the wet and frozen clothing and placed Sontag in the sleeping bag. He next gave him some brandy, which he found in a flask on the sledge, and having tightly closed the hut, he lighted the alcohol lamp for the double purpose of elevating the temperature and making some coffee. But all of his efforts were unavailing, and after remaining for nearly a day unconscious, Sontag died. He did not speak after reaching the hut, and left no message of any kind. After closing up the mouth of the hut, so that the body might not be disturbed by bears or foxes, Hans again set out southward, and reached Northumberland Island without inconvenience. Early in April 1861, Dr. Hayes left the ship to plunge into the wilderness, having previously ascertained that an advance along the Greenland shore was utterly impossible. He resolved to cross the Sound, 
and to try his fortunes along the coast of Greenland. Land. By winding to the right and left, he writes, and by occasionally retracing our steps, we managed to get over the first few miles without much embarrassment, but further on the track was rough, past description. I can compare it to nothing but a promiscuous accumulation of rocks, piled up over a vast plain in great heaps and endless ridges. The interstices between these closely accumulated ice masses are filled up to some extent with drifted snow. It is not surprising that after such difficult travel, at the end of twenty-five days they had not yet reached halfway across the sound. My party are in a very sorry condition, writes Dr. Hayes. One of the men has sprained his back from lifting. Another has sprained his ankle. Another has gastritis. Another a frosted toe. And all are thoroughly overwhelmed with fatigue. The men do not stand it as well as the dogs. And the next day, April 26, he writes, I feel tonight that I am getting rapidly to the end of my rope. Each day strengthens the conviction, not only that we could never reach Greenland with provisions for a journey up the coast to the Polar Sea, but that it cannot be done at all. I have talked to the officers, and they are all of this opinion. They say the thing is hopeless. Dodge put it thus. You might as well try to cross the city of New York over the housetops. Though disheartened, their bold leader was not discouraged and sending the main party back to the schooner, he continued to plunge into the hummocks. After fourteen days of almost superhuman exertion, he reached the coast, May 11, when he writes, In camp at last, close under the land, and as happy as men can be who have achieved success and await supper. As we rounded to in a convenient place for our camp, MacDonald looked up at the tall cape, which rose above our heads, and, as he turned away to get our furnace to prepare a much-needed meal, he was heard to grumble in a serio-comic tone, Well, I wonder if that is land, or only cape fly away, after all. But though land was reached, the trials of the journey along the coast were none the less harassing. With untiring energy, Dr. Hayes pushed on until the 18th of May, when further progress became impossible, owing to a deep bay mottled with white sheet and dark patches, these latter being either soft decaying ice or places where the ice had wholly disappeared. And now, writes Dr. Hayes, my journey was ended, and I had nothing to do but make my way back to Port Falk. The advancing season, the rapidity with which the thaw was taking place, the certainty that the open water was eating into Smith Sound, as well as through Baffin Bay from the south, as through Kennedy Channel from the north, thus endangering my return across to the Greenland shore, warned me that I had lingered long enough. It now only remained for us to plant our flag in token of our discovery, and to deposit a record proof of our presence. The flags were tied to the whiplash and suspended between two tall rocks, and while we were building a cairn, they were allowed to flutter in the breeze. Then, tearing a leaf from my notebook, I wrote on it as follows. This point, the most northern land that has ever been reached, was visited by the undersigned May 18th, 19th, 1861, accompanied by George T. Knorr, traveling dog sledge. We arrived here after a toilsome march of forty-six days from my winter harbor near Cape Alexander, at the mouth of Smith Sound. My observations place us in latitude 81 degrees 35, longitude 70 degrees 30 west. Our further progress was stopped by rotten ice and cracks. Kennedy Channel appears to expand into the polar basin, and, satisfied that it is navigable at least during the months of July, August, and September, I go hence to my winter harbor to make another trial to get through Smith Sound with my vessel after the ice breaks up this summer. I. I. 
Hayes, May 19th, 1861. I quit the place with reluctance, he writes. It possessed a fascination for me, and it was with no ordinary sensations that I contemplated my situation, with one solitary companion, in that hitherto untrodden desert, while my nearness to the earth's axis, the consciousness of standing upon land beyond the limits of previous observations, the reflections which crossed my mind respecting the vast ocean which lay spread out before me, the thought that these ice-girdled waters, where dwell human beings of an unknown race, were circumstances calculated to invest the very air with mystery, to deepen the curiosity, and to strengthen the resolution to persevere in my determination to sail upon this sea, and to explore its furthest limits. And as I recall the struggles which have been made to reach this sea, through the ice and across the ice, by generations of brave men, it seemed as if the spirits of these old worthies came to encourage me, as their experience had already guided me, and I felt that I had within my grasp the great and notable thing which had inspired the zeal of sturdy Frobisher, and that I had achieved the hope of matchless Perry. The much-discussed open polar sea, in which Dr. Hayes had implicit faith, has since been found to be only the south half of Kennedy Channel, which freezes late and opens early, owing to the very high tides that sometimes rise thirty feet. Dr. Hayes reached the schooner, June 3rd, after an absence of two months in which he traveled not less than 1,300 miles. After careful examination of his ship, Dr. Hayes found she had greatly suffered from her experience in the ice, and that, for the safety of his party, great care had to be exercised in her navigation. By dint of much earnest exertion, he writes, and the use of bolts and spikes, by replacing the torn cutwater, careful caulking, and renewal of the iron plates, it seemed probable that the schooner would be seaworthy, but I was forced to agree with my sailing master that to strike the ice again was sure to sink her. Dr. Hayes awaited with some anxiety the breaking up of the ice and the liberation of the schooner. Not until July 14, 1861, did the United States glide out to sea under full sail, and by August 10th she was in latitude 74 degrees 19, longitude 66 degrees. By the 12th they made land which proved to be Horse's Head, and three days later found the schooner at anchor in Upernavik Harbor. While the chain was yet clinking in the hoss hole, writes Dr. Hayes, an old Dane, dressed in sealskins and possessing a small stock of English and a large stock of articles to trade, pulled off to us with an Eskimo crew, and with little ceremony clambered over the gangway. Nor met him, and without any ceremony at all, demanded the news. Oh, there's plenty news. Out with it, man. What is it? Oh, the South States, they go again the North States, and there's plenty fight. I heard the answer, and wondering what strange complication of European politics had kindled another continental war, called this polar Emmaus to the quarter-deck. Had he any news from America? Oh, tis America me speak. The South States, you see, and there's plenty fight. Yes, I did see, but I did not believe that he told the truth, and awaited letters which I knew must have come out with the Danish vessel, and which were immediately sent for to the government house. The condition of the schooner necessitated putting in at Halifax for repairs, and, four days after leaving, they made the Boston lights. We picked up a pilot, writes Dr. Hayes, out of the thickest fog that I have ever seen south of the Arctic Circle, and with a light wind stood into harbor. As the night wore on, the wind fell away almost to calm, the fog thickened more and more, if that were possible, as we sagged along over the dead waters towards the anchorage. The night was filled with an oppressive gloom. The lights hanging at the mastheads of the vessels which we passed had the ghastly glimmer of tapers burning in the charnel house. 
we saw no vessel moving but our own, and even those which lay at anchor seemed like phantom ships floating in the murky air. I never saw the ship's company so lifeless, or so depressed, even in times of real danger. I landed on Long Wharf, he continues, and found my way into State Street. Two or three figures were moving through the thick vapors, and their solemn footfall broke the worse than Arctic stillness. I reached Washington Street and walked anxiously westward. A newsboy passed me. I seized a paper, and the first thing which caught my eye was the account of the Ball's Bluff battle, in which had fallen many of the noblest sons of Boston, and it seemed as if the very air had shrouded itself in mourning for them and that the heavens wept tears for the city's slain. I was wending my way to the house of a friend, but I thought it likely that he was not there. I felt like a stranger in a strange land, and yet every object which I passed was familiar. Friends, country, everything seemed swallowed up in some vast calamity, and doubtful and irresolute, I turned back sad and dejected, and found my way on board again through the dull, dull fog. Dr. Hayes made another journey beyond the Arctic Circle in 1869 in the Panther as the guest of the artist Bradford. Over a thousand miles of the Greenland coast was visited, terminating a good way beyond the last outpost of civilization on the globe in the midst of the much-dreaded ice pack of Melville Bay. End of chapter 12。Chapter 13 of the Great White North。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great White North by Helen S. Wright. Chapter 13. Charles Francis Hall, Early Life, Interest and Fate of Sir John Franklin, First Journey to Greenland, Discovery of Frobisher Relics, Experiences and Study of the Eskimos, Second Journey, Delays and Disappointments, Sledging Trips, King William's Land at Last, Franklin Relics, Return of Hall to United States, Polaris Expedition, Reaches High Northing, Hall's Sledge Journey, Return and Death, Polaris Winters No Escape, Polaris is Wrecked, Part of Crew Adrift on the Ice Flow, Remainder Build Winter Hut, Final Rescue and Return to United States. The personality of Charles Francis Hall is singularly interesting. Born in Rochester, New Hampshire in 1821, he received a common school education and pursued the vocation of blacksmith, journalist, stationer, and engraver. In 1850, while living in Cincinnati, Ohio, he became deeply interested in the fate of Sir John Franklin, and for over nine years made a thorough study of Arctic history and, especially, of the Franklin search expeditions. Unconvinced by the admirable report of Captain McClintock, in 1859 of the death of Franklin and the fate of his companions, Hall maintained the opinion that survivors of the unfortunate expedition must still be living among the Eskimos and could be found. By the aid of public subscriptions and the liberal patronage of Mr. Henry Grinnell, Hall undertook a journey May 29, 1860, sailing from New London on the whaler George Henry, commanded by Captain S. O. Buddington. Forty days later, 7th of July, 1860, the George Henry dropped anchor at Holstenborg, Greenland. Hall was unsuccessful in the main object of his undertaking, his proposed journey to King William Land, and spent the best part of two years near Frobisher Bay, where he acquired much knowledge of the speech, habits, and life of the Eskimos, and discovered a quantity of relics left by Frobisher's expedition of 1577 to 1578. Of the first traditionary history gained from the Eskimos relative to Frobisher's expedition, Hall says in notes under date of April 9, 1861, Among the traditions handed down from one generation to another, there is this, that many, 
very many years ago, some white men built a ship on one of the islands of Frobisher Bay and went away. I think I can see through this in this way. Frobisher, in 1578, assembled a large part of his fleet in what he called Countess of Warwick Sound, said to be in that bay below us, when a council was held on the 1st of August, at which it was determined to send all persons and things on shore upon Countess of Warwick Island, and on August 2nd orders were proclaimed, by sound of trumpet, for the guidance of the company during their abode thereon. For reasons stated in the history, the company did not tarry here long, but departed for Meta Incognita, and thence to England, how many, not the fact of timbers, chips, etc., etc., having been found on one of the islands within a day's journey of here many years ago, prove that the said materials were of this Frobisher's company, and that hence the Inuit tradition? In a few days I hope to be exploring Frobisher Bay. Describing the circumstances of his interesting discovery on Countess of Warwick Island, Hall writes, We continued on around the island, finding every few fathoms in our progress numerous Inuit relics. At length we arrived at a plain that extended back a considerable distance from the coast. Here we recognized, at our right, about sixty rods distant, the point to which we first directed our steps on reaching the high land after leaving the boat. I was several fathoms in advance of Ku'u Liang, hastening on, being desirous to make as extended a search as the brief remaining daylight would allow, when, lifting my eyes from the ground near me, I discovered, a considerable distance ahead, an object of an unusual appearance. But a second look satisfied me that what I saw were simply stones scattered about and covered with black moss. I continued my course, keeping as near the coast as possible. I was now nearing the spot where I had first descried the black object. It again met my view, and my original thought on first seeing it resumed at once the ascendancy in my mind. I hastened to the spot. Great God, thou hast rewarded me in my search, was the sentiment that came overwhelmingly into my thankful soul. On casting my eyes all around, seeing and feeling the character, mossed aged for some of the pieces I saw had pellicles of black moss on them, of the relics before and under me, I felt as, I cannot tell what my feelings were, what I saw before me was sea coal of Frobisher's expedition of 1578, left here near three centuries ago. A more thorough search in the vicinity, undertaken at a later period, resulted in the finding of flintstone, fragments of tile, glass, pottery, an excavation which Hall called an abandoned mine, the ruins of three stone houses, one of which was twelve feet in diameter, with palpable evidence of its having been erected on a foundation of stone cemented together with lime and sand, large pieces of iron, time-eaten and weather-worn, which the rust of three centuries had firmly cemented to the sand and stones in which it had lain. It will be remembered that of the one hundred men sent out from England with Frobisher in 1578, the majority were miners sent for the express purpose of digging for the rich ore of which Frobisher had carried specimens home on his return from his second voyage, and which was supposed to be very valuable. The miners made proofs, as they are called, in various parts of the regions discovered by him. Some of these proofs are doubtless what Captain Hall found, and, in connection with other circumstances, evidence the exact location of Frobisher's Countess of Warwick mine. Captain Hall presented many of the relics he brought home to the British government through the Royal Geographical Society of London. Upon his return to New London, September 13, 1862, Hall immediately endeavored, through lectures and personal appeals, to equip another expedition to the Arctic. The unsettled state of the nation, plunged into the horrors of a great civil war, made his efforts practically futile. Undaunted by the discouraging response, he nevertheless sailed July 1, 1864, and in August was landed, with his meager equipment, boat, and provisions, on Depot Island, Hudson Bay, 64 degrees north, 90 degrees west. Adopting the habits and life of the Eskimos, Hall spent five years in pursuing his researches, receiving occasionally supplies from whalers. The first year was spent in unsuccessful efforts to secure Eskimo aid. The winter of 1865-1866, Hall had his headquarters at Fort Hope, Repulse Bay, and in the spring reached Cape Waiton, 68 degrees north, 89 degrees west. The Eskimos refused to accompany him farther, 
but he had the good fortune to meet with natives who had visited the deserted ships and had seen Franklin. Hall secured from these Eskimos considerable silver bearing the crest of Franklin and other officers. In February 1867, Hall visited Igloolik, the winter quarters of Perry, in 1822. He improved the next year by following up the west side of Melville Peninsula, completing and surveying the short gap between Ray's farthest, 1846, and Perry's farthest in Fury Strait, 1825. The winter of 1868 to 1869 was spent at Fort Hope, where he at last succeeded in securing Eskimo aid for the final attempt to reach King William Land. He started in March 1869 in company with 10 Eskimos and dog sledges. Crossing Ray Peninsula to Committee Bay and via Boothia Isthmus, the party reached James Ross Strait, distant some 60 miles from King William Land. Here he had difficulty in persuading the natives to continue, but at Simpson Island the success of a musk ox hunt restored their good humor and they consented to proceed. On the 12th of May, 1869, Hall reached the mainland. His stay was necessarily very brief, as his native companions could not be persuaded to linger in such a desolate country. Upon his return to Repulse Bay, Captain Hall, in a letter to Mr. Henry Grinnell, dated June 20, 1869, writes in part, The result of my sledge journey to King William's Land may be summed up thus. None of Sir John Franklin's companions ever reached or died on Montreal Island. It was late in July, 1848, that Crozier and his party of about 40 or 45 passed down the west coast of King William's Land in the vicinity of Cape Herschel. The party was dragging two sledges on the sea ice, which was nearly in its last stage of dissolution, one a large sledge laden with an awning-covered boat, and the other a small one laden with provisions and camp material. Just before Crozier and party arrived at Cape Herschel, they were met by four families of natives, and both parties went into camp near each other. Two Eskimo men, who were of the native party, gave me such sad but deeply interesting information. Some of it stirred my heart with sadness, intermingled with rage, for it was a confession that they, with their companions, did secretly and hastily abandon Crozier and his party to suffer and die for need of fresh provisions, when in truth it was in the power of the natives to save every man alive. The next trace of Crozier and his party is to be found in the skeleton which McClintock discovered a little below to the southward and eastward of Cape Herschel. This was never found by the natives. The next trace is a camping place on the seashore of King William's Land, about three miles eastward of Pfeffer River, where two men died and received Christian burial. At this place, fish bones were found by the natives, which showed them that Crozier and his party had caught, while there, a species of fish excellent for food, with which the sea there abounds. The next trace of this party occurs about five or six miles eastward, on a long point of King William's Land, where one man died and was buried. Then about south-southeast, two and a half miles further, the next trace occurs on Todd's Islet, where the remains of five men lie. The next certain trace of this boat and the remains of about 30 or 35 of Crozier's party were found by the native Puyeta, of whom Sir John Ross has given a description in the account of his voyage in the Victory in 1829-34. to In the spring of 1849, a large tent was found by the natives whom I saw, the floor of which was completely covered with the remains of white men. Close by were two graves. This tent was a little way inland from the head of Terror Bay. In the spring of 1861, when the snow was nearly all gone, an Eskimo party, conducted by a native well-known throughout the northern regions, found two boats, with many skeletons in and about them. One of these boats had been previously found by McClintock. The other was found lying from a quarter to a half mile distant, and must have been completely entombed in snow at the time McClintock's parties were there, or they most assuredly would have seen it. In and about this boat, beside the skeletons alluded to, were found many relics, most of them similar in character to those McClintock has enumerated as having been found in the boat he discovered. I tried hard to accomplish far more than I did, but not one of the company would on any account, whatever, consent to remain with me in that country and make a summer search over that island, which, from information I had gained from the natives, 
I had reason to suppose, would be rewarded by the discovery of the whole of the manuscript records that had been accumulated in that great expedition, and had been deposited in a vault a little way inland or eastward of Cape Victory. Knowing, as I now do, the character of the Eskimos in that part of the country in which King William's land is situated, I cannot wonder at nor blame the Repulse Bay natives for their refusal to remain there as I desired. It is quite probable that, had we remained there as I wished, no one of us would ever have got out of the country alive. How could we expect, if we got into straitened circumstances, that we would receive better treatment from the Eskimos of that country than 105 souls who were under the command of the heroic Crozier some time after landing on King William's land? Could I and my party, with reasonable safety, have remained to make a summer search on King William's land, it is not only probable that we should have recovered the logs and journals of Sir John Franklin's expedition, but have gathered up and entombed the remains of nearly one hundred of his companions, for they lie about the places where the three boats have even been found, and at the large camping place at the head of Terror Bay, and the three other places that I have already mentioned. In the cove, west side of Point Richardson, however, Nature herself has opened her bosom and given sepulture to the bones of the immortal heroes who died there. Wherever the Eskimos have found the graves of Franklin's companions, they have dug them open and robbed the dead, leaving them exposed to the ravages of wild beasts. On Todd's Island, the remains of five men were not buried, but, after the savages had robbed them of every article that could be turned to account for their use, their dogs were allowed to finish the disgusting work. The native who conducted my native party in its search over King William's land is the same individual who gave Dr. Ray the first information about white men having died to the westward of where he, Dr. Ray, then was, Pelly Bay, in the spring of 1854. His name is Anuk Puzizuk, and he is a native of Nachel, a very great traveler and very intelligent. He is, in fact, a walking history of the fate of Sir John Franklin's expedition. This native I met when within one day's sledge journey of King William's land, off Point Dryden, and after stopping a few days among his people, he accompanied me to the places I visited on and about King William's land. I could have readily gathered quantities, a very great variety of relics of Sir John Franklin's expedition, for they are now possessed by natives all over the Arctic regions that I visited or heard of, from Ponds Bay to Mackenzie River. As it was, I had to be satisfied with taking upon our sledges about 125 pounds total weight of relics from natives about King William's land. Some of these I will enumerate. 1. A portion of one side, several planks and ribs fast together, of a boat, clinker built and copper fastened. This part of a boat is of the one found near the boat found by McClintock's party. 2. A small oak sledge runner, reduced from the sledge on which the boat rested. 3. Part of the mast of the Northwest Passage ship. 4. Chronometer box, with its number, name of the maker, and the Queen's broad arrow engraved upon it. 5. Two long heavy sheets of copper, 3 and 4 inches wide, with countersunk holes for screw nails. On these sheets, as well as on most everything else that came from the Northwest Passage ship, are numerous stamps of the Queen's broad arrow. 6. Mahogany writing desk, elaborately finished and bound in brass. 7. Many pieces of silver plate, forks, and spoons, bearing crests and initial of the owners. 8. Parts of watches. 9. Knives and very many other things which you, Mr. Grinnell, and others interested in the fate of the Franklin expedition, will take a sad interest in inspecting on their arrival in the States. One entire skeleton I have brought to the United States. Hall, some time after his return, placed the carefully preserved remains in charge of Mr. Brevert of Brooklyn, who transferred them to Admiral Inglefield, Royal Navy, to be forwarded to England. Subsequently, by the plug of a tooth, the skeleton was identified as the remains of Lieutenant Vicomte of the Erebus. The same year that the Erebus and Terror were abandoned, one of them consummated the Great Northwest Passage, having five men aboard. The evidence of the exact number is circumstantial. Everything about this Northwest Passage ship was in complete order. It was found by the Ujulik natives near O'Reilly Island, latitude 68 degrees 30 minutes north, longitude 99 degrees west, early in the spring of 1849, 
frozen in the midst of a flow of only one winter's formation. With the unwilling consciousness that he could accomplish nothing further of research in the frozen regions, Captain Hall had now to think of a return to the United States, purposing there to collate and publish the result of his protracted Arctic experience, then to make his long-meditated voyage to the Pole, and, if possible, afterward revisit King William's Land. In regard to his plans, he writes, I hope to start next spring with a vessel for Jones Sound, and thence toward the North Pole, as far as navigation will permit. The following spring, by sledge journey, I will make for the goal of my ambition the North Pole. I do hope to be able to resume snow hut and tent encampment very near the Pole by the latter part of 1870, and much nearer, indeed at the very Pole, in the spring following, to wit, in 1871. There is no use in man saying it cannot be done, that the North Pole is beyond our reach. By judicious plans, and by having a carefully selected company, I trust with a heaven-protecting care to reach it in less time, and with far less mental anxieties, than I have experienced to get to King William's land. I have always held to the opinion that whoever would lead the way there should first have years of experience among the wild natives of the North, and this is one of my reasons for submitting to searching so long for the lost ones of Franklin's expedition. The expression of such purposes, including that of a subsequent return to King William's Land, is certainly remarkable, as coming from one whose sledge journeys only, during the five years which now closed upon him, exceeded the aggregate of 4,000 miles. A willingness to resume snow hut and tent would seem explicable only by supposing that next to the lofty ideas with which his mind enthusiastically invested everything Arctic, was the extreme of a strange fascination with the uncouth life he had been leading. He says himself, at about this same date, that there was nothing in the way of food in which the natives delighted that he did not delight in, and that this may appear strange to some, but was true. He had that day a grand good feast on the kind of meat he had been longing for, the deer killed last fall, rotten, strong, and stinking, and for these qualities excellent for Inuits and for the writer. Hall, accompanied by his faithful Eskimo friends, Joe, Hannah, and our adopted child, Puna, returned to New Bedford, Massachusetts, September 26, 1869. When off the lighthouse of Nantucket, Massachusetts, Hannah and her child dropped their native dresses and put on those of a civilized land. Immediately upon his return to the States, Captain Hall endeavored to arouse public interest in his long-cherished plan for an expedition to the Pole. By untiring personal efforts and the support of enthusiastic friends, he succeeded in engaging the attention of Congress, which authorized an expedition to the North Pole, the only one in the history of the nation. $50,000 was appropriated for expenses, and a vessel selected from the Navy, which was thoroughly fitted out as an expense of 90000 more. Never was an Arctic expedition more completely fitted out, wrote Hall, at Godhaven, in a letter home August 22. The Polaris, in command of Captain Hall, with S.O. Buddington as sailing master, Dr. Emil Bessels in charge of the scientific work, and 24 others, sailed from New London, Connecticut, July 3, 1871. At Proven, Hans, the dog driver, who had served with Kane and Hayes, accompanied by his wife and three children, was taken aboard. The Polaris encountered a great deal of ice at the entrance of Wassenholm Sound, so that the passage through it was effected with much difficulty. Steaming through the leads, she was compelled to stop for the first time off the western shore of Hacklet Island on August 27. By August 29, she stood in latitude 82 degrees 11 minutes north, having successfully navigated Kane Basin, Kennedy Channel, Hall Basin, and Robeson Channel, and into the Polar Sea. Unable to retain her position by the force of the current, she returned southward and went into winter quarters in 81 degrees 38 minutes north latitude at Thank God Harbor, Greenland. Captain Hall was very desirous of making a sledge journey before the winter set in for the purpose of reconnoitering and selecting the best route for his great journey in the spring toward the Pole. By the 28th of September, the final preparations for this journey were complete. The dogs were selected and carefully fed. The Eskimos had put the sledge in order, and those selected to accompany Captain Hall were busy making their personal preparations. 
Not until the 10th of October was the start finally made, Hall being accompanied by Mr. Chester and the Eskimos, Joe and Hans. On the 24th of October, the sledge party returned, having reached as far north as Cape Brevert, 82 degrees north. They had all been well during their two weeks' absence, with the exception of Captain Hall, who had complained that he did not feel his wonted vigor and endurance, and for the last three days had not felt well at all. He had frequently expressed his surprise during the journey that he was not able to run before the sleds and encourage the dogs, as on former expeditions, but had been compelled to keep on the sled. Captain Hall had not been aboard half an hour before he was taken violently ill, and by 8 p.m. his entire left side was paralyzed as the result of an apoplectic attack. By the evening of the 25th, he was delirious. On November 7, he sank into a comatose state, breathing heavily. He remained in this condition until 3.25 a.m. of the 8th, when he died. The sad news was broken to the ship's company, and none felt his loss more than the Eskimos, Joe and Hannah, who had been his constant companions for nearly ten years. These faithful friends had looked upon him as a father and were now heartbroken. On November 11, Captain George Tyson, assistant navigator of the expedition, wrote in his diary, As we went to the grave this morning, the coffin hauled on a sledge, over which was spread, instead of a pall, the American flag, we walked in procession. I walked on with my lantern a little in advance, then came to captain and officers, the engineer, Dr. Bessel, and Myers, and then the crew, hauling the body by a rope attached to the sledge, one of the men on the right holding another lantern. Nearly all are dressed in skins, and, were there other eyes to see us, we should look like anything but a funeral cortege. The Eskimos followed the crew. There is a weird sort of light in the air, partly boreal or electric, through which the star shone brightly at 11 a.m. while on our way to the grave. Thus end poor Hall's ambitious projects. Thus is stilled the effervescing enthusiasm of as ardent a nature as I ever knew. Wise he might not always have been, but his soul was in this work, and had he lived till spring, I think he would have gone as far as mortal man could go to accomplish his mission. But with his death, I fear that all hopes of further progress will have to be abandoned. The death of Captain Hall proved to be fatal to the main object of the expedition, the attainment of the pole, if possible, or the absolute proof of its inaccessibility. The command of the expedition now devolved upon Captain Buddington. Several unsuccessful boat journeys to the north were followed by a sledge journey under Dr. Bessels to Peterman Fjord. Another boat journey by Mr. Chester reached Newman Bay, but it was left to Sergeant F. Meyer, Signal Corps, U.S. Army, to reach on foot the most northerly land at that time ever reached by civilized man near Repulse Harbor, 82 degrees, 9 minutes north. On the 11th of August, 1872, the ice of the Straits was observed to be in motion, drifting to the south. With the hope of releasing the ship and returning home, Captain Buddington, after an examination of the ice, decided it would be safe to force the vessel through. At 4.30 p.m., the engines were started, and the Polaris left Thank God Harbor. With great care, the vessel was piloted between the heavy flows, changing her course frequently, but always gaining ground. By the 18th, she stood 79 degrees, 44 minutes, 30 seconds north. On the 27th, every preparation was made for a possible abandonment of the vessel. A house was built on the flow as a retreat in case the ship should be destroyed. For nearly two months, the Polaris drifted southward at the mercy of the ice pack, and was nipped near Little Island by October 13. At 5 a.m. on the 15th October, writes Admiral Davis in his narrative of the North Polar Expedition, a very heavy snow began to fall and continued until 8 a.m. when the wind blew so hard that it was impossible to distinguish between the falling and drifting snow. The gale increased all day, driving the vessel with its surrounding ice with great rapidity. It commenced to blow from the southeast, but shifted to the south, and finally to the southwest. During its prevalence, the air was so completely filled with the flying snow that one could not see more than 20 or 30 feet. The ship had remained fast to the flow so long, and drifted with it so far, that no particular anxiety was felt as to the result. The captain had, however, always said that if the vessel passed through Smith Strait, he would not feel easy until the ice in which she lay had joined the regular Baffin's Bay pack. The North Water, 
as it is called by whalemen, is always found in the northern part of Baffin Bay, and he knew that, were this safely crossed, the ship would float quietly down with the pack all winter and be released in the spring far to the south. The direction in which the vessel was moving was a matter of speculation. The fact of her moving was admitted. The daily work being done, after dinner, the men settled themselves down as usual for the enjoyments of the evening. At 6 p.m., it was reported that the starboard side of the vessel was free from ice. The captain turned out the crew and secured the ship by an additional hawser to the flow. This extra hawser was over the stern and led from a large ice anchor sunk in the flow to the mainmast. Two hawsers had served during the whole of the drift to hold the Polaris to the flow, one over the bows and one over the stern. Final preparations were made to abandon the vessel. Nearly everything had been got ready on deck. The seamen still had their clothes and personal effects to look after. The Polaris was driven along at a very rapid rate. Many eager faces looked over the rail and peered into the darkness and the gloom, wondering what would happen next. The sky was threatening. The moon struggled in vain to break through the clouds. Two icebergs were passed in close proximity. Some judgment could be formed by means of them as to the rapidity with which the vessel was moving. One could scarcely help shuddering as he thought of the consequences of running into one of those gigantic ice mountains. One or two persons thought the land was visible, but it was very uncertain. At 7.30, the vessel ran among some icebergs, which brought up the flow to which she was attached. At the same time, the pack closed up, jamming her heavily. It was then the vessel secured her severest nip. It is hard to describe the effect of that pressure. She shook and trembled. She was raised up bodily and thrown over on her port side. Her timbers cracked with loud report, especially about the stern. The sides seemed to be breaking in. The cleat to which one of the after hawsers was attached snapped off, and the hawser was secured to the mast. One of the firemen, hurrying on deck, reported that a piece of ice had been driven through the sides. Escape from destruction seemed to be impossible. The pressure and the noise increased together. The violence of the night and the grinding of the ice added to the horror of the situation. Feeling it was extremely doubtful whether the ship would stand, Captain Buddington ordered provisions and stores to be thrown upon the ice. Then followed a busy scene. Each one was deeply impressed with the exigency of the moment and exerted himself to the utmost. Boxes, barrels, cans, etc. were thrown over the side with extraordinary rapidity. Men performed gigantic feats of strength, tossing with apparent ease, in the excitement of the moment, boxes at which at other times they would not have essayed to lift. Forward, coal and more substantial provisions and bags of clothing were thrown overboard. Abaft, the lighter boxes of canned meats and tobacco, with all the musk ox skins and fresh seal meat, were transported to and fro. The cabin was entirely emptied, beds and bedding, clothes and even ornaments were carried out. Messrs. Bryan and Meyer placed upon the floe the boxes containing all their notebooks, observations, etc. This was done deliberately and after mutual consultation. The boxes were too large to be carried about, and, in the actual condition of things, the flow appeared to be decidedly the best place. The Eskimo women and children took refuge on the ice, and two boats were lowered and with a scow placed on the flow. The pressure had now become so great that the great flow itself had cracked in several places, and the vessel was gradually breaking its edge and bearing down the pieces. Many articles had been thrown in a heap near the ship, and it was found that some of the lower things in the pile were dropping through between the vessel and the ice. It was also seen that should the ship be cut through and sink, many, if not all, these articles would sink with her. A call was therefore made for these men to carry these articles to a safer place on the flow. There was no special designation for that duty, but Captain Tyson, taking several persons with him, at once entered on it. After laboring about one hour and a half, the decks were cleared and the men on board ship had finished their work. At 9.30 p.m., by some change in the ice, the starboard side was again clear, the vessel was free from pressure, and the cracks in the flow began to open. Unfortunately, two of these cracks ran through the places where the stern anchors had been planted, breaking their hold. The wind, still strong, now drove the vessel from the flow, and, the anchors dragging under the strain, she swung round to the forward hawser. 
The ladder slipped, and the vessel was carried rapidly away from the ice. The night was black and stormy, and in a few moments the floe and its precious freight could no longer be seen through the drifting snow. Before the separation, it had been noticed that the floe was much broken on its edge, that the provisions and stores were separated from each other by rapidly widening cracks, that the men also were on different pieces of ice, that active efforts were being made to launch boats in order to bring the scattered people together. Several men were seen rushing toward the ship as she was leaving, but they failed to reach her. The voice of the steward, John Heron, was heard calling out, Goodbye, Polaris! Nineteen persons were thus separated from the ship, including eight Eskimos and the baby of Hans and Hannah. Fourteen men remained on board. This remnant of a crew, so suddenly reduced, gazed on each other for a few moments in silence. When the order was given to station the lookouts, the duties of the ship were resumed. A few moments after the separation, a fireman who was below getting up steam reported that the vessel was leaking badly. Upon examination, it was found that the water was pouring in so rapidly that it was feared that the fires would be put out before steam could be raised to work the pumps. All hands were immediately ordered to the large deck pumps, and a few pails of hot water started the four pumps. The captain called out, Work for your lives, boys, and the crew set to work with a will. In spite of their utmost efforts, the leaks still gained upon them. The engineers and firemen were urged to their utmost. Everything of a combustible character, including seal blubber, was thrown upon the fire, and at the end of an hour and ten minutes of the severest labor, the steam pumps were at last in working order. Nor was this a moment too soon, for at the moment the pumps began to work, the water was lapping over the floor of the fire room. Captain Buddington awaited a favorable opportunity to beach the Polaris, and this was accomplished a few days later near Lifeboat Cove, where a comfortable house was built of the vessel for the winter. Some Eskimos rendered them considerable assistance and received suitable gifts in return. We have taken stock of our ammunition, writes Captain Buddington in his journal, and find that we can avail ourselves of about eight pounds of powder, which some of the men had stored away in their chests and powder flasks. This is all we have on board, the powder can having been also put off on the ice during the fearful night of the 15th. Also, all our sharps cartridges, except some open, loose ones, which were found amongst the men's things. One box of musket cartridges we have, and plenty of shot and lead, also several shotguns. In fact, we are not altogether as bad off as we first supposed, and the only thing that we are short of is clothing. This, if we cannot get any game, we may feel considerably before spring comes on. The Eskimos from Ida made frequent visits, but could give them no information of the lost members of the party. The general opinion with Captain Buddington and his men was that Tyson had been able to effect a landing with his men somewhere to the south, and that he would probably use his dogs, sleds, and boats to travel up the coast and rejoin the main party. In the spring of 1873, two boats were carefully constructed from the material of the Polaris, and the party made preparations to read Upernavik. On June 3, the boats, having been freighted and manned, got underway, and after an exciting journey of 200 miles, were picked up near Cape York by the Scotch waver Ravenscraig. One of the boats used on this retreat was brought back to civilization and presented to the Smithsonian Institution at Washington. It was exhibited at the International Exhibition, Philadelphia, May 10, 1876, by the side of Kane's boat, Faith, and formed part of the Arctic collection furnished for the centennial by the United States Naval Observatory. To return to the 19 souls adrift on the ice floe, of the moment of parting from the Polaris, Captain Tyson writes, The ice exploded and broke in many places, and the ship broke away in the darkness, and we lost sight of her in a moment. Gone, but an ice-bound horror seemed to cling to air. It was snowing at the time also. It was a terrible night. On the 15th of October, it may be said, that the Arctic night commences, but in addition to this, the wind was blowing strong from the southeast. It was snowing and drifting, and was fearfully dark, and the wind was exceedingly heavy, and so bad was the snow and sleet that one could not even look to the windward. We did not know who was on the ice or who was on the ship, but I knew some of the children were on the ice, because almost the last thing I had pulled away from the crushing heel of the ship were some musk ox skins. They were lying across a wide crack in the ice, 
and as I pulled them toward me to save them, I saw that there were two or three of Hans's children rolled up in one of the skins. A slight motion of the ice, and in a moment more, they would either have been in the water and drowned in the darkness, or crushed between the ice. It was nearly ten o'clock when the ship broke away, and we had been at work since six. The time seemed long, for we were working all the time. Hannah was working, but I did not see Joe or Hans. We worked till we could scarcely stand. They were throwing things constantly over to us till the vessel parted. Some of the men were on small pieces of ice. I took the little donkey, a small scow, and went for them, but the scow was almost instantly swamped. Then I shoved off one of the whale boats and took off what men I could see, and some of the men took the other boat and helped their companions, so that we were all on firm ice at last. We did not dare to move about much after that, for we could not see the size of the ice we were on, on account of the storm and darkness. All the rest but myself, the men, women, and children, sought what shelter they could from the storm by wrapping themselves in the musk ox skins, and so laid down to rest. I alone walked the floe all night. The following morning, an inventory was taken of the stores on the floe, and they were found to be 14 cans of pemmican, 11 and a half bags of bread, one can of dried apples, and 14 hams. If the ship did not come for us, writes Tyson, we might have to support ourselves all winter or die of starvation. Fortunately, we had the boats. Captain Tyson made an effort to reach Little Island in order to secure the assistance of the Eskimos living in the neighborhood in procuring food and shelter for his party during the winter. This he was unable to accomplish, and soon after the Polaris was seen rounding a point. Signals were made by hoisting the colors and showing an India rubber cloth, but neither the signals nor the men were seen by the Polaris. Another futile attempt was made to attract the attention of those on the ship, and Captain Tyson endeavored to launch the boats and reach her, but without success. Gales now forced the floe out of sight of the ship, and the forlorn men set to work to make the best of a desperate situation. By late November, the effects of exposure and want of food began to show themselves. Some of the men trembled when they tried to walk, the children often cried with hunger, although all was given to them that could possibly be spared. The seals brought in were received with gratitude. The invaluable success of Joe and Hans was fully appreciated. Without them, the chances of life would have been very much diminished. So keen had the appetites of the party become that the seal meat was eaten uncooked with the skin and hair on. December 25, Captain Tyson records, Our Christmas dinner was gorgeous. We each had a small piece of frozen ham, two whole biscuits of hard bread, a few mouthfuls of dried apples, and also a few swallows of seal's blood. The last of the ham, the last of the apples, and the last of our present supply of seal's blood. So ends our Christmas feast. New Year's dinner, I have dined today on about two feet of frozen entrails and a little blubber, and I only wish we had plenty even of that, but we have not. On January 23, 1873, Captain Tyson makes the following observation. I was thinking the other evening how strange it would sound to hear a good hearty laugh, but I think there never was a party so destitute of every element of merriment as this. I cannot remember ever having seen a smile on the countenance of any one on this floe, except when Heron came out of his hut and saw the sun shining for the first time. The months of February and March passed dismally enough, with varying fortune with the hunters. Toward the end of March, the condition of the party was growing rapidly worse. On March 3, Joe shot a monster ugjuk, a large kind of seal. It was, indeed, a great deliverance to those who had been reduced to one meal of a few ounces a day. Hannah had but two small pieces of blubber left, continues Captain Tyson, enough for the lamp for two days. The men had but little, and Hans had only enough for one day. And now, just on the verge of absolute destitution, comes along this monstrous ugjuk, the only one of the seal species seen today, and the fellow, I have no doubt, weighs six or seven hundred pounds, and will furnish, I should think, thirty gallons of oil. Truly, we are rich indeed. April 1st. We have been the fools of fortune now for five months and a half. On this day, it was found necessary to abandon the flow, which had now become wasted to such an extent that it was no longer safe. At 8 a.m., therefore, the party took to their boat. 
This boat, intended to carry six or eight men, was crowded with twelve men, two women, and five children, with the tent and skins and some provisions. There was so little room that it was difficult to handle the oars and yoke ropes. After making fifteen or twenty miles to the south and west in the pack, a landing was effected. The tent pitched with the intention of remaining all night. For the next twenty-eight days, the party advanced to the south by boat, camping upon the ice at night, undergoing the most perilous hardships from the upheavals of the ice through gales and storms. At 4.30 p.m. on April 28, a steamer hove in sight, right ahead, and at one time appeared to be bearing down upon the boat. The American colors were hoisted, and the boat pulled for her. She was recognized as a sealer returning southwest and apparently working through the ice. For a few moments, the hearts of the shipwrecked party were thrilled with joy, but the steamer failed to see them, and night coming on, she soon disappeared. That night, the boat was again hauled upon the ice, and fires lighted to attract the attention of passing vessels. At daylight, a steamer was seen eight miles off. The boat was launched and headed for the ship, but after two hours pulling, she was so beset by ice that she could make no headway. The party landed on a small piece of ice, hoisted their colors, mounted the highest point of the flow, collected all the rifles and pistols, and fired them together to attract attention. After three rounds, the steamer fired three shots and, changing her course, headed toward the flow. The party gave a shout of delight, but soon after the steamer again changed her course and steamed away. Again, in the morning of the 30th, when the fog opened, a steamer was seen close to the flow. The guns were fired, the colors were set on the boat's mast, and loud shouts were uttered. Hans shoved off in his kayak of his own accord to intercept her, if possible. The morning was foggy, but the steamer's head soon turned towards them, and in a few moments she was alongside of the flow. The three cheers given by the shipwrecked people were turned by a hundred men on deck and aloft. The vessel proved to be the Barkentine Tigress, sealer Captain Bartlett of Conception Bay, Newfoundland. Her small seal boats were very soon in the water, but the shipwrecked party did not wait for them. They threw everything out of their own boat, launched her, and in a few moments were on board the Tigress, where they became objects of extreme curiosity, as well as of the most devoted attention. When the time during which they had been on the ice was mentioned, they were regarded with astonishment and warmly congratulated upon their miraculous escape. They were picked up in latitude 53 degrees, 35 minutes north, off Grady Harbor, Labrador. Thus ended one of the most remarkable escapes on record. For five months, the little band of shipwrecked men and women had drifted at the mercy of the Arctic ice pack a distance of 1,300 miles. End of chapter 13. Chapter 14 of The Great White North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Katerina. The Great White North by Helen S. Wright. Chapter 14. Captain Thomas Long. Discovery of Wrangell Land. Captain Carlson and Captain Palliser sail across the Sea of Kara. Captain Johansen circumnavigates Nova Zembla. First German Expedition. Second German Expedition. Germania, Captain Caldervey commanding. Hansa, Captain Hegemann. Departure from Bremen. Crossing the Arctic Circle. Isle of Jan Mayen. The Ice Line. Separation from the Hansa. A drift on the ice floe. Winter. Final rescue. Germania beset. Winter. Sledging parties. Lieutenant Payer's remarkable journey. 77 degrees, 1 minute north latitude. Return of the Germania. Other important discoveries followed the journeys of Dr. Hayes and Captain Hall, including that of Captain Thomas Long, an American whaler who in 1867 discovered a mountainous country of considerable extent in the polar ocean, beyond Bering Strait, supposed at that time to be the western prolongation of Plover Island. The same year, Captain Carlson and Captain Palliser sailed across the generally inaccessible Sea of Kara to the mouths of the Obi, and Captain Johansen succeeded in circumnavigating the whole archipelago of Nova Zembla. 
In 1868, the first German North Polar expedition was fitted out through the exertions of the scientist Dr. A. Peterman of Gotha. The yacht Greenland, commanded by Captain Caldeway, sailed to Spitsbergen, reaching 84 degrees 5 minutes north of the north coast, and passing down Henlopen Strait, sighted Vigiland, returning home the fall of the same year. In 1869 and 1870, the Germans made a more successful attempt to enter the lists of Arctic discovery by exploring a considerable part of the previously unvisited coast of East Greenland. The ship Germania was chosen for this purpose, being expressly adapted for ice navigation. The Hansa of nearly the same size was to accompany her. Captain Karl Caldeway and Captain Fur Hegemann were first and second in command respectively. The departure of the expedition from Bremerhaven, writes Captain Caldeway, took place on the 15th of June, 1869, in the presence of His Majesty the King of Prussia, whose warm interest in this great national undertaking showed itself in this solemn hour in a manner never to be forgotten. Amongst the numerous gentlemen in attendance on His Majesty were His Royal Highness, the Grand Duke of Mecklenburg-Schwerin, Count Bismarck, the Minister of War and Marin, von Roon, General von Moltke and Vice Admiral Jackman. The ships lay at the entrance of the new harbor just outside the sluice. The king, having been introduced to the scientific gentleman and the commander of the expedition, and having greeted them with a hearty shake of the hand, the president of the Bremen Committee, Herr A. G. Mosler, requested His Majesty's permission to speak a few parting words, and in an earnest and impressive manner the speaker referred to the greatness and importance of the object. The self-denial difficulties and dangers which lay before them but which they all willingly braved for the honor of their native land for the honor of the german navy and of german science july first found the expedition in sixty one degrees north latitude passing the entrance between norway and the shetland isles with that the german ocean was left behind and the open sea reached which already made itself felt by the peculiar atlantic swell on the fifth of july at fifty minutes past eleven the Germania passed the Arctic Circle, nearly under the meridian of Greenwich. A violent wind was blowing, writes Captain Caldeway, and with a speed of nine knots we entered the Arctic Ocean, which was to be our quarters for a whole year. The Hansa was some miles in advance of us, and was the first to unfurl the North German flag, at the same time firing one gun. We followed. Conformably to the custom as on crossing the equator, Neptune came on board to welcome us and wish us success on our voyage, of course not without all those who had not yet crossed the Arctic Circle having to undergo the rather rough shaving and christening customary on such occasions. The ceremony closed, as is usual on such occasions, with a good glass of wine to wash away the evil effects of the cold water. On board the Hansa the proceeding was carried out much more scrupulously, Describing the frolic, Dr. Lauber writes thus, We entered into the spirit of the fun willingly, knowing that our sailors were decent fellows, and would not carry things too far, even had we not entered on the ship's books with them in Bremen and become seamen. Our carpenter went about the whole day with a sly, laughing face, and towards evening had quite lost his usual chattiness. We ourselves kept in the cabin, so as not to witness the preparations. At midnight we were called on deck. A gun was fired, and as its thunder died away, we heard the well-known cry, Ship ahoy! Three wonderful figures climbed over the bowsprit, Neptune first in an Eskimo's dress, with a great white cotton beard, a seven-pronged dolphin harpoon for a trident in one hand, and a speaking trumpet in the other. A tarpaulin was spread on the quarter-deck, and a stool placed upon it. It looked like a judge's bench. Here each of us was seated with eyes bound while the masked followers of the northern ruler went through the customary proceedings. I was soaked and chafed. God Neptune was most favorable to me. He knows what good cigars are and has great respect for those to whom they belong. Then came the christening, which in this case was not applied to the head as is usual, but to the throat and stomach. Neptune put some questions to me through his speaking trumpet, desiring me to answer. I saw his object, answered with a short yes, and then closed my lips. The mischievous waterfall rattled over me, causing universal merriment. They then took the bandage from my eyes that I might see my handsome face in the glass, but instead of a looking-glass it was the combing of the wooden hatchway, which with great gravity was held before my face by the barber's assistant. I was now absolved and could laugh with the others whilst seeing my comrades obliged to go through the same course one after the other. 
By the 9th of July, the expedition came in sight of the island of Jan Mayen. The midnight hours had now become perceptibly lighter. Even in the cabin, a lamp was no longer needed, and at 12 o'clock at night, it was possible to read and write without difficulty. Fog and snow had already begun their rule of terror, and Captain Coldaway records 368 hours of fog from the 10th of July to the 1st of August. The island of Jan Mayen lies in the middle of the wide, deep sea between Norway and Greenland, Iceland and Spitsbergen, and is distant about 60 geographical miles from the coast of Greenland. It was discovered and named after a Dutchman who visited it in the year 1611. It is nine miles in length and one mile in breadth, rocky and mountainous, with only two spots of flat beach suitable for landing places. The northeast part rises to a height of 6,863 feet, in the lofty Berenberg, which has a large crater. In the year 1732, Burgomaster Anderson of Hamburg reported a decided eruption from a small side crater, and in 1818, Scoresby and another captain saw great pillars of smoke rising from the same place. Of this wonderful isolated snow-covered peak, Lord Dufferin in Letters from High Latitudes wrote, My delight was of an anchorite in catching a glimpse of the seventh heaven. Jane Mayen lies so near the edge of the ice fields that from 1612 to 1640 it afforded the English and Dutch whale fishers a comfortable station for their train oil preparation. One ship is reported to have brought home 196,000 gallons of oil in a single year. The ice line was reached July 15th. After a foggy day, a light southerly breeze got up, the sails filled, the ship answered the helm once more, and we moved in a northwesterly course between small flows and brashes. A practiced ear might now notice a peculiar distant roar, which seemed to come nearer by degrees. It was the sea singing against the still hidden ice. Nearer and nearer comes the rushing noise. Every man is on deck, when, as with the touch of a magic wand, the mist divides, and a few hundred yards before us lies the ice, in long lines like a deep indented rocky coast, with walls glittering blue in the sun, and the foaming of the waves mounting high, with the top covered with blinding white snow. The eyes of all rested with amazement on this grand panorama. It was a glorious but serious moment, stirred as we were by new thoughts and feelings, by hopes and doubts, by bold and far-reaching expectations. Up to this time the Germania and Hansa had stood well together with occasional separation in the fogs, and on the 18th of July the officers of the two ships exchanged hospitalities. The next day, through a fatal misunderstanding of signals, the Hansa separated from the Germania, and they never met again. On the 28th of July, the Hansa stood in 72 degrees 56 minutes north latitude and 16 degrees 54 minutes west latitude. The dark rock coast of East Greenland was visible for the first time from Cape Boraroos to Cape James. By sailing, towing, and warping, the Hansa made slow progress through the ice. The captain and two officers and two sailors made an attempt to land on August 24, but were obliged to return to the ship without having accomplished their mission. On the 25th of August, the Hansa reached within 35 nautical miles of Sabine Island. The ship was continually subjected to dangerous ice pressure and often forced southward by the drifting ice fields. By the 6th of September, she lay between two promontories of a large ice field, which eventually proved a raft of deliverance. By the 14th of September, she was completely frozen up in 73 degrees 25.7 minutes north latitude and 18 degrees 39.5 minutes west latitude. At the mercy of the drifting currents, the Hansa stood in imminent peril of total destruction. Between October 5th and 14th, the drift had carried the ship 72 nautical miles to the south-southwest. The nights were cold, sometimes 4 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. The only sign of animal life to be seen were ravens, which were doubtless wintering on the coast. Once a gull and a falcon made the ship a visit. A severe storm from the north-northwest on the 19th brought disastrous pressure upon the Hansa. Shortly before one o'clock, the deck seemed sprang, but still she seemed tight. Mighty blocks of ice pushed themselves under the bow, and although they were crushed by it, they forced the ship up no less than 17 feet. The rising of the ship was an extraordinary and awful, yet splendid spectacle, of which the whole crew were witnesses from the ice. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Captain Hegemann at once ordered clothing, nautical instruments and stores to be removed from the ship to a safe distance. 
The pumps were put in action to free her from water, but to the horror of all, it was discovered before many hours that the Hansa was doomed. Calmly, though much moved, we faced this hard fact. There was not a minute's time to lose. While one half of the men stayed by the pumps, the others were busily engaged bringing the most necessary articles from the vessel to the flow. Gradually the ship filled with water, and by eight in the morning the men who were busy in the forepeak getting out firewood came with anxious faces to say that the wood was already floating below. At three o'clock the water in the cabin had reached the table, and all movable articles were floating. Round about the ship lay a chaotic mass of heterogeneous articles and groups of feeble rats struggling with death and trembling with cold. On the morning of the 21st, a last trip was made to the Hansa for fuel and her mast sacrificed to the stress of need. She was then cut away from the ice that she might not endanger the lives of those on the floe when she sank. The shipwrecked crew, in the miserable shelter of the coal house, settled themselves to meet the exigencies of their frightful position. In the far distance, Halloway Bay and Glasgow Island were distinctly visible, but nowhere away through the icy labyrinth. Slowly, steadily, the ice field drifted to the south. By November 3rd, the Liverpool coast had been passed, and the picturesque formation of the coast surrounding Scoresby Sound was distinctly visible. The health of the party remained good, a monotonous routine of daily duties occupied officers and men. The capture of a walrus and bear gave a welcome supply of fresh meat. Christmas was cheerfully celebrated by these shipwrecked mariners in the coal hut on their Greenland flow. A tree artistically manufactured of pine wood and birch broom was gaily decorated with paper rings and candles. Nor were gifts wanting, and finally what Dr. Laube in his day book. In quiet devotion the festival passed by. The thoughts which passed through our minds, they were much alike with all, I will not put down. If this should be the last Christmas we were to see, it was at least bright enough. If, however, we were destined for a happy return home, the next were being a brighter one, may God grant it. The month of January and February were fraught with many anxious hours, owing to the numerous and severe storms which threatened destruction to the flow. The horrors of such an experience are vividly described as follows. On the 11th of January, at six in the morning, Hildebrand, who happened to have the watch, burst in with the alarm. All hands turn out! An indescribable tumult was heard without. With furs and knapsacks all rushed out. But the outer entrance was snowed up, so to gain the outside quickly we broke through the snow roof of the front hall. The tumult of the elements which met us there was beyond anything we had already experienced. Scarcely able to leave the spot, we stood huddled together for protection from the bad weather. Suddenly we heard, Water on the flow close by. The flow surrounding us split up. A heavy sea arose. Our field began to break on all sides. On the spot between our house and the piled-up store of wood, which was about twenty-five paces distant, there suddenly opened a huge gap. Washed by the powerful waves, it seemed as if the place just broken off was about to fall upon us, and at the same time we felt the rising and falling of our now greatly reduced flow. All seemed lost. From our split-up ice field all the firewood was drifting into the raging sea and in like manner we had nearly lost our boat Bismarck, even the whaleboat was obliged to be brought for safety into the middle of the flow. The large boat, being too heavy to handle, we were obliged to give up entirely. All this in a temperature of negative nine and a half degrees, and a heavy storm was an arduous piece of work. The community were divided into two parts. We bade each other goodbye with a farewell shake of the hands, for the next moment we might go down, Deep despondency had taken hold of our scientific friends. The crew were still and quiet. Thus we stood or cowered by our boats the whole day, the fine pricking snow penetrating through the clothes to the skin. It was a miracle that just that part of the flow on which we stood should from its soundness keep together. Our flow, now only 150 feet in diameter, was the 35 to 40 feet nucleus of the formerly extensive field to which we had entrusted our preservation. Towards evening the masses of ice became closely packed again. At the same time the heavy sea had subsided, and immediate danger seemed past. Relieved, we partook of something in the house and lay down, after setting a good watch. It was past midnight when we were roused from our sleep by the cry of terror, the voice of the sailor on watch, exclaiming, "'Turn out! We are drifting onto a high iceberg!' All rushed to the entrance." Dressed as we always were, we had no time to run through the long snow passage, but burst open the roof, climbed on to the door and so out. What a sight! 
close upon us, as if hanging over our heads, troubled a huge mass of ice of giant proportions. It is past, said the captain. Was it really an iceberg or the mirage of one or the high coast? We could not decide the question. Owing to the swiftness of the drift, the ghastly object had disappeared the next moment. Again on the evening of the 14th a frightful storm raged, which set the ice once more in motion. In the immediate neighborhood of the house our floe burst, and the broken ice flew high around us. It was high time to bring the boat Bismarck and the whale boat more to the middle. This we did, but they were far too heavily laden to bring further. On this account, furs, sacks of bread and clothing were taken out and packed on two sledges, which were, however, soon completely snowed up. All our labor was rendered heavier by the storm, which made it almost impossible to breathe. About eleven we experienced a sudden fissure which threatened to tear our house asunder, with a thundering noise an event took place, the consequences of which, in the first moments, deranged all calculations. God only knows how it happened that, in our flight into the open, none came to harm. But there, in the most fearful weather, we all stood roofless on the ice, waiting for daylight, which was still ten hours off. The boat King William lay on the edge of the floe, and might have floated away at any moment. Fortunately, the fissure did not get any larger. As it was somewhat quieter at midnight, most of the men crept into the captain's boat, when the thickest sail we had was drawn over them, some took refuge in the house. But there, as the door had fallen in, they entered by the skylight, and in a hurry broke the panes of glass, so that it was soon full of snow. This night was the most dreadful one of our adventurous voyage on the floe. For five nights the men slept in the boats, the days were employed in raising their settlement from its ruins. A wooden kitchen was built in a dwelling house, exactly like the one destroyed, but half as large, fourteen feet long by ten broad and one and a half high in the middle. In spite of such frightful experiences, the men kept cheerful, undaunted and exalted. In fact, the cook kept the right seaman-like humor, having exclaimed while repairing the coffee kettle during the frightful pressure of the ice which destroyed the floe, if the floe would only hold together until he had finished his kettle, he wished so to make the evening tea in it, so that before our departure we might have something warm. February and March found them helplessly drifting to the southward, and by Easter, 17th of April, they lay floating backwards and forwards in the Bay of Unbarbic. Linnets and snow buntings soon made their appearance, so fearless and confiding that some of them, so says Bates' day book, will almost perch upon our noses, and in five minutes allowed themselves to be caught three times. On the 7th of May, the agreeable sight of open water in the direction of land cheered both officers and men. The captain now decided that an attempt would be made to leave the floe and reach the coast. The little community, divided amid three boats, bade farewell to the ice floe which had been their home for two hundred days. During several days of bad weather, small progress was made. The men suffered considerably from exhaustion, snow blindness, and want of proper shelter and food. The latter problem was occasioning considerable concern, and already the men were almost looking their eyes out after a seal. There was but six weeks' short provisions on hand, and a long distance to travel over a barren and uninhabited coast before the settlement could be reached. The ice remaining unnavigable, it was decided to make the island of Uluitlek, dragging the heavy boatloads over the all but impassable ice hummocks. By the 24th of May, Mr. Hildebrand and the sailors Philip and Paul set foot on firm ground. Their encouraging report cheered the others to similar exertions, but the progress was slow and exhausting. Not until the 4th of June were the entire party landed at Eluitlek. The island proved of rocky formation, naked and bare of vegetation. Everywhere we find nothing, writes one of the party, but bare, barren cliffs, the higher the wilder, sparingly clothed with moss and stunted willows, but no trace of human inhabitants. Two days later, June 6, they started once more. Their object was to make for Friedrichsthal, the nearest colony on the southwest coast of Greenland. On June 13, 1870, after passing through the Straits of Torsudatik and skirting the coast, the longed-for bay was reached. A few hundred steps from the shore on the green ground stood a rather spacious red house, topped by a small tower. It was the mission house. Groups of natives from the shore speedily welcomed the wanderers and the cheerful greeting of the Moravian missionaries. That is the German flag. They are our people. Welcome, welcome to Greenland, fell like music in their ears. After partaking of the generous hospitality extended by the missionaries and taking a much-needed rest, 
they pushed on in the hopes of reaching the settlement of julian's herb distant some eighty miles where the danish constance was expected at any moment and would be their only means of reaching europe that year by the twenty fifth of july the officers and crew of the hansa weighed anchor for the homeward voyage by the thirty first of july they were on the high sea in davis strait no more ice set southwards and o heavenly music of the word homewards it will be remembered that on july twenty eighteen sixty nine the two ships had parted company the germania proceeding on her course with officers and crew under the impression that the hansa would rejoin her within a short time when this did not take place much concern was felt for her fate by the twenty seventh of july the germania stood seventy three degrees seven minutes north latitude and sixteen degrees four minutes west longitude two days later an interesting notice made of the peculiar condition of the atmosphere the weather was clear and still and we had a good opportunity of observing the refraction of light in the mirage the whole atmosphere was quivering with a kind of wavy motion so that the exact outline of the object was often so distorted as to be unrecognizable it may be imagined that pictures of things far beyond our range of sight could thus be seen scoresby relates and it afterwards proved true that he once saw and recognized his father's ship perfectly in the mirage when it was thirty miles distant the effects of this phenomenon on the distant ice was wonderful sometimes it appeared like a mighty wall and sometimes like a town rich in towers and castles carefully pushing away between the floes the germania stood within thirty miles of sabine island by august four sailing straight for griper roads she at last anchored in a small bay which was afterward her winter harbour on the fifth of august anchor was dropped and the german flag hoisted on greenland soil amid loud cheers sabine island forms a part of the group known as pendulum islands discovered by clavering in eighteen twenty three sabine's observatory was carefully searched for but no indications of its remains were found traces of eskimo summer huts were discovered however giving evidence of long habitation on the fifteenth of august the germania sailed as far as seventy five degrees thirty one minutes north latitude some distance beyond shannon island the extreme point discovered by clavering and sabine at shannon island first lieutenant payer accompanied by seven companions and provisioned for six days made a try of investigation lieutenant payer's description of the plateau to the southwest of shannon is interesting tel plate as it is called is six hundred and seventy feet above the sea here on the broad mountain top were masses of rubbish of nice formation resembling those on pendulum island we were also astonished by the sight of a large flat promontory south of haystack which is not distinctly marked on clavering's charts the view of the front coast of greenland was full of majestic beauty having taken up winter quarters at sabine island september thirteenth captain coldaway and lieutenant payer undertook a sledge journey to flagley fjord they returned to the ship september twenty first after an absence of seven days having travelled a hundred and thirty three and a half miles the long winter passed in the usual monotonous fashion and in preparation for the spring sledge journeys a thrilling incident however occurred early in march which is almost unprecedented in arctic adventure we were sitting writes lieutenant payer fortunately silent in the cabin when called away suddenly heard a faint cry for help we all hurriedly tumbled up the companion ladder to the deck when an exclamation from borgen a bear is carrying me off struck painfully on our ears it was dark we could scarcely see anything but we made directly for the quarter whence the cry proceeded armed with poles weapons etc over hummocks and drifts when an alarm shot which we fired in the air seemed to make some little impression as the bear dropped his prey and ran forward a few paces he turned again however dragging his victim over the broken shore ice close to a field which stretched in a southerly direction all depended upon our coming up with him before he should reach this field as he would carry his prey over the open plain with the speed of a horse and thus escape we succeeded the bear turned upon us for a moment and then scared by our continuous fire let fall his prey we lifted our poor comrade up onto the ice to bear him to his cabin a task which was rendered somewhat difficult by the slippery and uneven surface of the ice but after we had gone a little way borgen implored us to make as much haste as possible on procuring a light the coldest nature would have been shocked at the spectacle which poor borgen presented the bear had torn his scalp in several places and he had received injuries in other parts of his body his clothes and hair were saturated with blood we improvised a couch for him in the rear of our cabin as his own was not large enough 
the first operation was performed upon him on the cabin table. And here we may briefly notice the singular fact that, although he had been carried more than 100 paces with his skull almost laid bare at a temperature of negative 13 degrees Fahrenheit, his scalp healed so perfectly that not a single portion was missing. Borgen describes the sudden attack of the bear as follows. About a quarter before 9 p.m. I had gone out to observe the occultation of a star, which was to take place about that time, and also to take the meteorological readings. As I was in the act of getting on shore, Captain Coldaway came onto the ice. We spoke for a few moments when I went on shore while he returned to the cabin. On my return from the observatory, about fifty steps from the vessel, I heard a rustling noise to the left, and became aware of the proximity of a bear. There was no time to think or use my gun. The grip was so sudden and rapid that I am unable to say how it was done, whether the bear rose and struck me down with his forepaws, or whether he ran me down. But from the character of the injuries I have received, contusions and a deep cut on the left ear, I conclude that the former must have been the case. The next thing I felt was the tearing of my scalp, which was only protected by a skull cap. This is their mode of attacking seals, but, owing to the slipperiness of their skulls, the teeth glide off. The cry for help which I uttered frightened the animal for a moment, but he turned again and bit me several times on the head. The alarm had meanwhile been heard by the captain, who had not yet reached the cabin. He hurried on deck, convinced himself that it was really an alarm, roused up the crew and hastened on to the ice, bringing assistance to his struggling comrade. The noise evidently frightened the bear, and he trotted off with his prey, which he dragged by the head. A shot fired to frighten the creature effected its purpose, inasmuch as he dropped me and sprang a few steps aside, but he immediately seized me by the arm, and, his hold proving insufficient, he seized me by the right hand on which was a fur glove, and this gave the pursuers time to come up with the brood, which had by its great speed left them far behind. He was now making for the shore, and would certainly have escaped with his prey, had he succeeded in climbing the bank. However, as he came to the edge of the ice, he turned along the coast side, continuing on the rough and broken ice, which greatly retarded his speed, and thus allowed his pursuers upon the ice to gain rapidly upon him. After being dragged in this way for about three hundred paces, almost strangled by my shawl, which the bear had seized at the same time, he dropped me, and immediately afterwards Coldaway was bending over me with the words, Thank God, he is still alive. The bear stood a few paces on one side, evidently undecided what course to pursue, until a bullet gave him a hint that it was high time to take himself off. Preparations having been completed for an extended sledge journey to examine the bays and inlets of the mainland, the party started March 8, 1870, and were absent until April 27, after 23 days of most arduous labors. Lieutenant Payer had the satisfaction of reaching 77 degrees 1 minute north latitude, at that time the most northerly point ever reached on the east coast of Greenland. From an elevated site the sea appeared covered with an unbroken field of hummocks, and the land was seen to stretch out in a northerly direction as far as the eye could reach. Other journeys, which followed at close intervals, greatly added to the geographical knowledge of the coast. On the return from one of these they discovered, 9th of August, the entrance to a magnificent fjord to the south of Cape Franklin, 73 degrees 10 minutes north latitude, into which they penetrated to a distance of 72 nautical miles. As they advanced into the interior, a decided change in the temperature was noticed, the atmosphere and water became warmer, and herds of reindeer and musk oxen were seen. Butterflies, bees, and other insects fluttered over the green earth. Nothing could exceed the grandeur of the scenery. Numerous glaciers and cascades descended from the mountains, which rose higher and higher as they advanced towards the west. Lieutenant Payer and Dr. Copeland, having climbed a peak 7,000 feet high, saw the fjord still branching out in the distance, and towards the west a remote chain of mountains, situated about 32 degrees west long, rising to an altitude of at least 14,000 feet, terminated the magnificent prospect. The interior of Greenland thus proved itself to be not a mere naked plateau covered with perpetual ice fields, but in some parts at least a country of alpine grandeur. On the 24th of August the Germania steered her course for home, as the ship cleared the last of the Greenland ice, Captain Calderway quoted the words of Old Scoresby under similar conditions. My watch is over, he used to say, and turning to Mr. Sangstash, Captain Calderway exclaimed, My watch is over, and retired to his cabin with a feeling of security that he had not enjoyed for many a day. Pursuing a course past Iceland between the Faroe and Shetland Isles, 
they stood off Heligoland September 10. At daybreak, though we had seen no pilot, we recognized Wangaroog and steered along the south wall to the mouth of the Weser. No sign of a ship. The Weser seemed to have died out. Where are the pilots hidden? Are they lying perdue on account of yesterday's storm? Well then, we must run into the Weser without them. The wind is favorable, the weather clear, the outer buoy will be easy to find. There is the church tower of Wangaroog. Suspecting nothing, we steered on. The tower bears south-southwest, southwest by south, southwest, but no buoy in sight. The captain and steersman look at each other in astonishment. Can we have been so mistaken and out of our reckoning? But no, that is certainly Wangaroog. The depth of water agrees. Our compass is correct. No doubt about it. We are in the Weser. Something unusual must have happened. Still, no sail in sight. But what is that? Yonder are the roads. There are several large vessels under steam. They at least can give us some information. So we make for them. We saluted the German flag, and soon the cry was heard. War! War with France! Napoleon a prisoner! France has declared a republic. Our armies are before Paris. And then... Hans are destroyed in the ice, crew saved. We thought we were dreaming, and stood stiff with astonishment at such grand and heart-stirring news. Not until a loud hurrah for King William sounded from a hundred German throats did we regain our speech, and answer with another hurrah. End of chapter 14《Chapter Fifteen of the Great White North》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Katerina. The Great White North by Helen S. Wright. Chapter Fifteen. Austrian Expedition, 1871. Peer and Weyprecht. The Tegetov Adrift in the Polar Pack. Discovery of Franz Josef Land. Payer's Sledge Journeys. Payer's Farthest 82 degrees 5 minutes north latitude. Cape Fleischley. Abandonment of the Tegetov. Retreat of officers and crew. Picked up by Russian fishermen. Home. Having gained much distinction for his valuable services in the second German expedition, Lieutenant Payer was resolved to continue in the path of polar discovery. The following year, in company with his colleague and friend, Lieutenant Weyprecht of the Austrian-Hungarian Navy, he equipped the Norwegian schooner Isbjorn and examined the edge of the ice between Spitsbergen and Nova Zembla, reaching 78 degrees 43 minutes north latitude and 42 degrees 30 minutes east longitude, on the 1st of September, 1871. The zealous endeavors of Peyer and Weyprecht succeeded in calling into existence a still larger Austrian expedition in 1872. Their plan was to select a route by the north end of Nova Zembla with a view to making the northeast passage. Weyprecht was to command the ship Tagetov, while Lieutenant Payer was to conduct the sledge parties. The Tagetov sailed from Bremerhaven, June 13, 1872, bearing in her course to Tromso. Her equipment was liberal and carefully selected, the total expense of the expedition amounting to £18,333. The officers and crew numbered 24 souls. Delayed by storms among the Lofoden Isles, they did not reach Tromso until July 3rd. Ten days later, the Tagetov turned her prow to the north. The Norwegian coast with its many glaciers was in full view on July 16. North Cape bloomed in the blue distance. By July 25, while in latitude 74 degrees, 0 minutes 15 seconds north, the ice was sighted. Proceeding with careful navigation through opens in the frozen ocean, the ship moved in her course until the end of August, when she became beset near Cape Nassan at the northern end of Nova Zembla, having just parted with the Isbjorn near Barents Isle, where Count Wilczek was placing supplies for their possible retreat. Ominous were the events of that day, writes Payer, for immediately after we had made fast the Tagetov to that floe, the ice closed in upon us from all sides, and we became close prisoners in its grasp. No water was to be seen around us, 
and never again were we destined to see our vessel in water. Happy is it for men that inextinguishable hope enables them to endure all the vicissitudes of fate which are to test their powers of endurance, and that they can never see, at a glance, the long series of disappointments in store for them. We must have been filled with despair, had we known that evening that we were henceforward doomed to obey the caprices of the ice, that the ship would never again float on the waters of the sea, that all the expectations with which our friends, but a few hours before, saw the Tegethoff steam away to the north, were now crushed, that we were in fact no longer discoverers, but passengers against our will on the ice. From day to day we hoped for the hour of our deliverance. At first we expected it hourly, then daily, then from week to week, then at the seasons of the year and changes of the weather, then in the chances of New Year's. But that hour never came, yet the light of hope which supports man in all his suffering and raises him above them all never forsook us amid all the depressing influence of expectations cherished only to be disappointed. To reach the coast of Siberia under these circumstances had become an impossibility, and even in case the ship became liberated, the search for a winter harbor in Nova Zembla would be a matter of peril and difficulty. Drifting, not with the current, but in the direction of the prevailing wind, the land of Nova Zembla receded until it faded out of sight, and only a desert of ice surrounded them. The frightful ice convulsions which frequently threatened their destruction determined the men to build a house on the main floe, where supplies of coal, fuel, and provisions were stored. Lieutenant Payer comments on the terrible conditions under which they existed. One of us, today, remarked very truly that he saw perfectly well how one might lose his reason with the continuance of these sudden and incessant assaults. It is not dangers that we fear, but worse far, we are kept in a constant state of readiness to meet destruction, and know not whether it will come today or tomorrow or in a year. Every night we are startled out of sleep, and, like hunted animals, up we spring to a mate amid an awful darkness the end of an enterprise from which all hope of success has departed. It becomes at last a mere mechanical process to seize our rifles and our bag of necessaries and rush on deck. In the daytime, leaning over the bulwarks of the ship, which trembles, yeah, and almost quivers the while, we look out on a continual work of destruction going on, and at night, as we listen to the loud and ever-increasing noises of the ice, we gather that the forces of our enemy are increasing. The hours of these dark and disheartening days were passed in taking observations, exercise, and occasional bear and sledge journeys. In spite of this, the time crept away with indescribable monotony. During February, the ship drifted first northwest and then north, the greatest longitude attained being 71 degrees east, in 79 degrees north and the summer of 1873 advanced without any signs of freeing them. With sad resignation, the officers and crew looked forward to passing another winter in the ice, although plenty of birds, seal, and bears ensured them fresh meat, so essential for the preservation of health in high latitudes. A memorable day, writes Payer, was the 31st of August, 1873, in 79 degrees, 43 minutes latitude, and 59 degrees, 33 minutes east longitude. That day brought a surprise, such as only the awakening to a new life can produce. About midday, as we were leaning on the bulwarks of the ship and scanning the gliding mists through which the rays of the sun broke ever and anon, a wall of mist, lifting itself up suddenly, revealed to us, afar off in the northwest, the outlines of bold rocks, which in a few minutes seemed to grow into a radiant alpine land. At first we all stood transfixed, and hardly believing what we saw. Then, carried away by the reality of our good fortune, we burst forth into shouts of joy. Land! Land! Land at last! There was now not a sick man on board the Tagethoff. The news of the discovery spread in an instant. Everyone rushed on deck, to convince himself with his own eyes that the expedition was not after all a failure. There before us lay the prize that could not be snatched from us. Yet not by our own action, 
but through the happy caprice of our flow and as in a dream had we won it but when we thought of the flow drifting without intermission we felt with redoubled pain that we were at the mercy of its movement as yet we had secured no winter harbour from which the exploration of the strange land could be successfully undertaken for the present too it was not within the verge of possibility to reach and visit it if we had left our flow we should have been cut off and lost it was only under the influence of the first excitement that we made a rush over our ice field although we knew that numberless fissures made it impossible to reach the land but difficulties notwithstanding when we ran to the edge of our flow we beheld from a ridge of ice the mountains and glaciers of the mysterious land its valleys seemed to our fond imagination clothed with green pastures over which herds of reindeer roamed in undisturbed enjoyment of their liberty and far from all flows for thousands of years this land had lain buried from the knowledge of men and now its discovery had fallen into the lap of a small band themselves almost lost to the world who far from their home remembered the homage to their sovereign and gave to the newly discovered territory the name kaiser franz josef land with loud hurrahs we drank to the health of our emperor and grog hastily made on deck in an iron coffee pot and then dressed the tagged half with flags all cares for the present at least disappeared and with them the passive monotony of our lives there was not a day there was hardly an hour in which this mysterious land did not henceforth occupy our thoughts and attention in october the vessel drifted within three miles of an island lying off the main mass of land lieutenant payer landed on it and found it to be in latitude seventy nine degrees fifty four minutes north it was named after count wilczek whose deep interest in the expedition had won for him the affection of all a second winter settled upon the tagethoff and her crew at this point the chief diversion being bear hunts in which no less than sixty seven bears were killed on the tenth of march eighteen seventy four payer made a preliminary sledge journey the object of which was to determine the position and general relations of the new land a large sledge was used and was equipped for a week it carried an extra quantity of provisions which were intended to form depots for the more extended sledge journey contemplated for later on thirty nine pounds of hard bread five pounds of pemmican sixteen pounds of boiled beef one pound of pea sausage one half pound of salt and pepper six pounds of rice two pounds of grits five pounds of chocolate five gallons of rum one pound of extract of meat two pounds of condensed milk and eight gallons of alcohol the party consisted of payer and six men with three dogs intense cold and violent snowstorms the thermometer falling as low as minus fifty nine degrees caused great suffering to the men from frost bites this frightful temperature was experienced march fourteen on that day payer with the tyrolese mountain climber stood on the summit of the precipitous face of the sonkla glacier whose broad terminal front overhangs the frozen bay of northern skjold fjord after making deposits of provisions the party were obliged to return to the ship after an absence of five days on march twenty six lieutenant payer with ten men and three dogs started on a more extended journey of thirty days the equipment for the second trip consisted of the large sledge a hundred fifty pounds the provisions including packing six hundred twenty pounds the dog sledge thirty seven pounds the tent sleeping bags tent poles and alpine stock three hundred twenty pounds alcohol and rum a hundred twenty eight pounds fur coats and fur gloves a hundred forty pounds instruments rifles ammunition a hundred seventy pounds shovel two cooking machines drag ropes dog tent etc one thousand five hundred sixty five pounds each of the four sacks of provisions calculated for seven days and seven men contained fifty one pounds of boiled beef forty eight pounds of bread eight pounds of pemmican seven pounds of bacon two pounds of extract of meat four pounds of condensed milk two pounds of coffee four pounds of chocolate seven pounds of rice 
three pounds of grits, one pound of salt and pepper, two pounds of pea sausage, four pounds of sugar, besides a reserve bag with twenty pounds of bread. Boiled beef was taken as food for the dogs, and it was hoped that game would supplement the general rations. From almost the first hour, violent blizzards, intense cold, and the uneven condition of the ice made the journey disheartening and laborious. By April 1st, they penetrated by Cape Hossa into a newly discovered passage, covered with heavy ice, to which Payer gave the name of Austria Sound. By the 7th of April, they advanced into Rawlinson Sound, over a track between hummocks, some of which were 40 feet high, the depressions between them filled with deep layers of snow. The noble mountain forms and mighty glaciers of Crown Prince Rudolf Land could be seen in the distance. Pursuing their course in a westerly direction, they reached Hohenlohe Island the next day, where the expedition encamped and the party divided, the smaller continuing to the north for the purpose of examining the glaciers of Rudolf Land. A disaster occurred the first day after the departure which nearly proved fatal to the success of their undertaking. While crossing the Middendorf Glacier, the snow gave way beneath a sledge, which precipitated one of the men, Zaninovich by name, the dogs and sledge into a crevasse. From an unknown depth, writes Payer, I heard a man's voice mingled with the howling of dogs. All this was the impression of a moment, while I felt myself dragged backwards by the rope. Staggering back and seeing the dark abyss beneath me, I could not doubt that I should be precipitated into it the next instant. A wonderful providence arrested the fall of the sledge, at a depth of about thirty feet it stuck fast between the sides of the crevasse, just as I was being dragged to the edge of the abyss by its weight. The sledge having jammed itself in, I lay on my stomach close to the awful brink, the rope which attached me to the sledge tightly strained and cutting deep into the snow. The situation was all the more dreadful as I, the only person present accustomed to the dangers of glaciers, lay there unable to stir. When I cried down to Zaninovich that I would cut the rope, he implored me not to do it, for if I did, the sledge would turn over and he would be killed. For a time I lay quiet, considering what was to be done. By and by it flashed into my memory how I and my guide had once fallen down a wall of ice in the Ertler Mountains, 800 feet high, and had escaped. This inspired me with confidence to venture on a rescue, desperate as it seemed under the circumstances. Aurel had now come up, and, although he had never been on a glacier before, this gallant officer dauntlessly advanced to the edge of the crevasse, and laying himself on his stomach, looked down into the abyss and cried to me, Zaninovich is lying on a ledge of snow in the crevasse, with precipices all around him, and the dogs are still attached to the traces of the sledge, which has stuck fast. I called to him to throw me his knife, which he did with such dexterity that I was able to lay hold of it without difficulty, and as the only means of rescue, I severed the trace which was fastened round my waist. The sledge made a short turn and then stuck fast again. I immediately sprang to my feet, drew off my canvas boots, and sprang over the crevasse, which was about ten feet broad. I now caught sight of Zaninovich and the dogs, and shouted to him that I would run back to Hohenlohe Island to fetch men and ropes for his rescue, and that rescued he would be if he could contrive for four hours to keep himself from being frozen. I heard his answer. Fate, signora, fate pure, and then Aurel and I disappeared. Heedless of the crevasses which lay in our path, or of the bears which might attack us, we ran down the glacier back to Cape Schroeder, six miles off. Only one thought possessed us, the rescue of Zaninovich, the jewel and pride of our party, and the recovery of our invaluable store of provisions, and of the book containing our journals, which, if lost, could never be replaced. But even apart from my personal feeling for Zaninovich, I keenly felt the reproaches to which I should be exposed of incautious travelling on glaciers and it gave me no comfort to think that my previous experiences in this kind of travelling over the glaciers of Greenland appeared to justify my proceedings. Stung with these reflections, I pressed on at the top of my speed, leaving Aurel far behind me. 
bathed with perspiration, I threw off my bird-skin garments, my boots, my gloves, and my shawl, and ran in my stockings through the deep snow. After passing the labyrinth of icebergs, I saw the rocky pyramid of Cape Schroeder before me in the distance. The success of my venture depended on the weather. If snow driving should set in, and the footprints should be obliterated, it would be impossible to find Horn Lower Island. All around me it was fearfully lonely. Encompassed by glaciers, I was absolutely alone. At last I saw clots emerge from behind an iceberg at some distance off, and though I continued to shout his name till I almost reached him, I failed to rouse him from his usual reverie. When at last he saw me breathlessly pushing on, scarcely clothed, and constantly calling, his sack slipped from his back, and he stared at me as if he had lost his senses. When the hardy son of the mountains came to understand that Zaninovich with the sledge was buried in the crevasse, he began to weep, in his simplicity of heart taking the blame of what had happened on himself. He was so agitated and disturbed that I made him promise that he would do himself no mischief, and then, leaving him to his moody silence, I ran on again towards the island. It seemed as if I should never reach Cape Schroeder. With head bent down I trudged on, counting my steps through the deep snow. When I raised it again, after a little time, it was always the same black spot that I saw on the distant horizon. At last I came near it, saw the tent, saw some dark spots creep out of it, saw them gather together and then run down the snow slope. These were the friends we had left behind. A few words of explanation, with an exhortation to abstain from idle lamentations, were enough. They at once detached a second rope from the large sledge and got hold of a long tent pole. Meanwhile I had rushed upon the cooking machine, quickly melted a little snow to quench my raging thirst, and then we all set off again. Holler, Sasik, Lukinovich, and myself, to the Middendorf Glacier. Tent and provisions were left unwatched. We ran back for three hours and a half. Fears for Zaninovich gave such rings to my steps that my companions were scarcely able to keep up with me. Ever and anon I had to stop to drink some rum. At the outset we met Oral and rather later Klotz, both making for Cape Schwader, Klotz to remain behind there, and Oral to return with us at once to Middendorf Glacier. When we came among the icebergs under Cape Haberman, I picked up, one by one, the clothes I had thrown away. Reaching the glacier, we tied ourselves together with a rope. Going before the rest, I approached with beating heart the place where the sledge had disappeared four hours and a half ago. A dark abyss yawned before us, not a sound issued from its depth, not even when I lay on the ground and shouted. At last I heard the whining of a dog, and then an unintelligible answer from Zaninovich. Haller was quickly let down by a rope. He found him still living, but almost frozen, on a ledge of snow forty feet down the crevasse. Fastening himself and Zaninovich to the rope, they were drawn up after great exertion. A storm of greetings saluted Zaninovich, stiff and speechless though he was, when he appeared on the surface of the glacier. I need not add that we gave him some rum to stimulate his vital energies. It was a noble proof how duty and discipline assert themselves, even in such situations, that the first word of this sailor, safe from being frozen to death, was not a complaint, but thanks, accompanied with a request that I would pardon him if he, in order to save himself from being frozen, had ventured to drink a portion of the rum which had fallen down in its case with a sledge to his ledge of snow. Holler again descended and fastened the dogs to a rope. The clever animals had freed themselves from their traces in some inexplicable way and had sprung to a narrow ledge, where Holler found them, close to where Zaninovich had lain. It was astonishing how quickly they discerned the danger of the position and how great was their confidence in us. They had slept the whole time, as Zaninovich afterwards told us, and he had carefully avoided touching them lest they should fall down deeper into the abyss. We drew them up with some difficulty, and they give expression to their joy, first by rolling themselves vigorously in the snow, and then by licking our hands. We then raised Holler by the rope some ten feet higher than the ledge on which Zaninovich had lain, so that he might be able to cut the ropes which fastened the loading of the firmly wedged-in sledge. At this moment Oral arrived, 
and with his help we raised one by one the articles with which the sledge was loaded. It was ten o'clock before we were convinced that we had lost nothing of any importance in the crevasse. On April 12, 1874, Peyer and his companions attained their farthest north, 82 degrees 5 minutes north latitude. On that day they stood on a promontory about 1,000 feet high, to which the name of Cape Fleischli was given. Rudolf land still stretched in a northeasterly direction, writes Payer, towards a cape, Cape Gerard Osborne, though it was impossible to determine its further course and connection. In the distant north, blue mountain ranges indicated masses of land, and to these the names of King Oscar Land and Petermann Land were given. Proudly we planted the Austro-Hungarian flag, continues Payer, for the first time in the high north. A document we enclosed in a bottle and deposited in a cleft of rock. The return to the ship was rendered doubly hazardous by the insecurity of the ice and the increasing water holds. The results of the journey may be summed up as follows. Payer found the newly discovered country to be about the size of Spitzbergen and consisting of two large masses, Wilczek land to the east and Zichy land to the west intersected by numerous fjords and skirted by many islands austria sound divides the two main masses of land and extends to eighty two degrees north where rawlinson sound forks off to the northeast the mountains reach a height of two thousand to three thousand feet glaciers abound in the ravines and even the islands are covered with a glacial cap a third sledge journey was undertaken by lieutenant payer on april twenty nine to explore a large island named after McClintock. The momentous day, May 20, on which the Tagatov was abandoned, came at last. Three boats were selected by the return expedition. Two of these were Norwegian whale boats, 20 feet long, 5 feet broad, and two and a half deep. The third was somewhat smaller. The hummocks rendered their advance discouragingly slow. It was necessary to pass over the same short distance many times in the course of a day, and after two months of indescribable efforts, the distance reached by the party was not more than two German miles. An occasional bear, shot by the men, restored the waning strength and courage, but not until August 14 did the welcome sound of the open water reach their ears, and in 77 degrees, 40 minutes north latitude, they launched their boats. Nine days later, they were picked up by Russian fishermen off the coast of Nova Zembla. End of chapter 15。Chapter 16 of the Great White North。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jake Militia. The Great White North by Helen S. Wright Chapter 16 Baron A. E. von Nordenskjöld First Voyage, 1858 Accompanies succeeding Swedish expeditions Spitsbergen Voyage of Sophia, 1868 Nordenskjöld's journey to Greenland Voyage of the Polem Attempt to reach the Pole by reindeer sledge Unexpected Discouragements and Disasters Voyage of the Proven 1875 The Kara Sea Journey repeated the following year In the Amur Voyage of the Vega The career of Baron A. E. von Nordenskjöld is one of the most distinguished in Arctic history. Born in Helsingfors, Finland, November 18, 1832, he learned at an early age the thrill of adventure and the joys of research while accompanying his distinguished father on his mineralogical tours in the Ural Mountains. After graduating at Helsingfors in 1857, Nordenskjöld was himself appointed a professor of mineralogy at Stockholm. Baron Nordenskjöld's scientific interests in polar research began as early as 1858 when he accompanied Otto Turell, chief geologist of Sweden, who sailed on the Frithrup for Spitsbergen. This was the beginning of a series of Swedish expeditions that covered a quarter of a century, in which Nordenskjöld had a most valuable and active part. 
two months were spent on the west coast of Spitsbergen, in dredging the sea, studying the land formation and its botanical and glacial conditions. Nordenskjöld's chief contribution to science on this expedition was the discovery of a fossil-bearing rock in Carboniferous formations. Another journey beyond the Arctic Circle was undertaken by Tyrrell in 1861 for a more thorough survey and study of the natural history and geology of Spitsbergen. On this journey, Tyrrell, Nordenskjöld and Peterson undertook a boat journey to Hinlopen Strait and later visited the coast of North East Land. Passing North Cape and visiting seven islands, they reached their farthest, 80 degrees, 42 seconds north, August 5th, at Phipps Island. Prince Oskarland was reached a week later, and from a mountain 2,000 feet high near Cape Raider, two islands could be seen in the distance, to which were given the names of Charles XII and Drabanton. Pushing their way east of Cape Platon, the ice conditions forced their return. In 1863, Nordenskjöld again visited Spitsbergen, and again in 1864, when he was placed in charge of the Swedish expedition, and was accompanied by Duner and Malmgren. In a small boat of 26 tons burden, and provisioned for less than six months, they entered safe harbour at the entrance of the magnificent ice fjord. After rounding the southern cape of Spitsbergen, they entered Storfjord, and visited Edgesland and Barentsland. After entering Hellis Sound and ascending White Mountain, they again rounded South Cape with the intention of following the west coast as far north as the ice would permit. On this journey, while off Charles Foreland, they rescued some shipwrecked sailors whose vessels had become beset of seven islands, and who had journeyed in open boats some 200 miles in 14 days. An immediate return was thus made necessary, but the results of the summer's work was a map executed by Nordenskjöld and Duner which delineates Spitsbergen with great accuracy. In 1868, the Swedish expedition had for its objective point the Pole. The Sophia was chosen for this purpose and commanded by Captain Count F. W. von Otter, with Nordenskjöld as scientific chief. Smearenberg Bay, at the north end of Spitsbergen, was decided upon as a place of rendezvous, and from this point the Sophia made two attempts for a high northing. In the second, she was rewarded by reaching on September 19th, 1868, 81 degrees 42 seconds north, and 17 degrees 30 seconds east, at that time the farthest north attained by any ship. A third attempt to push the Sophia through the impenetrable pack resulted in her becoming disabled and necessitated the return of the expedition to Sweden. In 1870, Skild made a journey to Greenland, accompanied by Dr. Berggren the noted professor of botany at Lund. The object of the expedition was to penetrate the unexplored interior from a point at the northern arm of a deep inlet called Arletsevik Fjord, some 60 miles south of the discharging glacier at Jacobs Harbour, and 240 north of the glacier at Godtharb. He commenced his inland journey on the 19th of July. Besides Dr. Berggren, he was assisted by two Eskimos, but the disheartening difficulties of travel over the inland ice of Greenland, caused by the slow movement of the glaciers, which produce chasms and clefts of almost bottomless depth, soon caused the party to abandon their sledge, and later the two natives refused to proceed. Undaunted by their desertion, Nordenskjöld and Dr. Berggren continued their explorations alone, and advanced 30 miles over the glaciers to a height of 2,200 feet above the sea. One of the most important results of this remarkable journey was the discovery of two meteorites, the largest ever known. In 1871, Nordenskjöld again set out for Spitsbergen. His object was to reach the Pole by reindeer sledging. Sailing in the ship Polem, commanded by Lieutenant Palander of the Swedish Navy and accompanied by two convoys, the Gleden and Onkel Adam, they reached Muscle Bay and there established winter quarters. In an attempt to return, the convoys were beset in a violent storm Unable to extricate themselves and not being provisioned for winter, the crews, numbering 43 men, were suddenly forced upon Nordenskjöld's party for fuel and supplies. To distribute food intended for 24 persons among a party of 67 was a serious problem, and was only accomplished by reducing the rations of all one-third. Hardly had this blow fallen upon the prospects of the expedition when they were visited by four men with the overwhelming news that six walrus vessels had been frozen in at Point Grey and Cape Welcome. 
By hunting, it was hoped that the 58 unfortunate men would manage to avoid starvation until the 1st of December. After that, their only salvation rested with the generosity of Nordenskjöld. The only relief to the appalling situation was in the fact that a Swedish colony had that year worked a phosphatic deposit at Cape Thorsden, Icefjord, and the manager, after abandoning the work, had returned to Norway, leaving behind him a considerable amount of stores. Cape Thorsen was distant 200 miles, but 17 of the walrus hunters determined to undertake it. These men succeeded in reaching the depot, where an ample supply of all the necessaries of life awaited them, including a house, fuel, preserved and dried vegetables, and fresh potatoes. Huddling in one room, living on salt beef and pork, rather than go to the exertion of availing themselves of the ample diet at hand, these men were attacked by scurvy, and not one survived the rigours of the winter. At Mussel Bay, the food conditions were deplorable, but were eked out by the utilisation of reindeer moss mixed with rye flour, which produced a very bitter bread. The sacrifice of the food of the reindeer greatly crippled Nordenskjöld's cherished plans for his spring journeys, and, to add to his disappointments, the reindeer themselves were carelessly allowed to escape by the lapse during a violent snowstorm. A fortunate opening of the ice early in November allowed two vessels to escape, and these vessels took the crews of the four others. The Arctic night was passed by the expedition in making scientific observations, dredging under the ice, and in mental and physical exercise. In spite of every precaution against the dreaded foe, scurvy broke out among the men, but was overcome under a strict diet regime. In spite of the disastrous loss of his reindeer and the depleted state of his stores and provisions, Norden Skild attempted his northern journey the following spring. At Seven Islands, he was stopped by the ice, but in spite of this disappointment, he concluded to visit North East Land for the purpose of geographical research. A journey of five days over impassable hummocks resulted in his making Cape Platon and later Otter Island. The increased dangers of travel and the presence of water holes determined him to abandon the coast route and strike across the inland ice. This arduous journey was over hard-packed, blinding white snow. Glazed and polished, he writes so that we might have thought ourselves to be advancing over an unsurpassably faultless and spotless floor of white marble. Blinding storms, blizzards or ice fogs marked each step of their fifteen days' journey. Snow bridges covered treacherous chasms, some of which were forty feet in depth. On June 15th they descended into Hinlopen Strait at Wallenberg Bay, and finally the party reached Mussel Bay after an absence of sixty days. In the early summer, they had the good fortune to be visited by Mr. Lee Smith, the veteran Arctic navigator and scientist, in his private yacht, Diana, through whose generosity the expedition was liberally supplied with fresh provisions which removed the pending anxiety for the future. In 1875, Nordenskjöld turned his attention to the possibility of navigating the seas along the northern coast of Siberia. This route had already been opened by Captain Wiggins of Sunderland, who in 1874 1875, and 1876 opened the way to trade between Europe and the mouth of the Yenisei River. Norden Skild sailed from Tromsø in the Proven, June 1875, and successfully navigating the Kara Sea, reached an excellent harbour on the eastern side of the mouth of the Yenisei, to which he gave the name of Port Dixon, in honour of Mr. Oscar Dixon of Gothenburg, for many years the liberal supporter of the Swedish expeditions. To demonstrate that the Kara Sea had not been more free of ice than usual in the summer of 1875, and that the route would be practicable another season, Norden Skjöld repeated his voyage in the Ema the following year. His long Arctic experience had by this time convinced him of the feasibility of the Northeast Passage. To demonstrate this conviction, he enlisted the patronage of the King of Sweden, Mr. Oscar Dixon and Mr. Sibiriakov, a Siberian proprietor of vast wealth, and the result was the purchase of the Vega, which was liberally equipped for a successful expedition. The Vega had been used for whale fishing in the North Polar Sea. Her register was 357 tons gross, or 299 net. Her dimensions were as follows. Length of keel, 37.6 metres. Length over deck, 43.4 metres. Beam extreme, 8.4 metres. Depth of hold, 4.6 metres. She had a 60 horsepower engine, which required 10 cubic feet of coal per hour, developing an average speed of 6 or 7 knots per hour. 
The vessel was a full-rigged bark with pitch pine masts, iron wire rigging, and patent reefing topsails. Under sail alone she was able to attain a speed of nine or ten knots. She carried the Swedish man-of-war flag with a crowned O in the middle, and bore this triumphantly throughout a voyage which stands in history as the first circumnavigation of Asia and Europe. With Nordenskjöld as leader, Lieutenant Palander, commander of the ship, and an efficient staff of officers and scientists, which included such men as Lieutenant Horgard of the Royal Danish Navy, the superintendent of the magnetical and meteorological work, F. R. Schellmann, Ph.D., docent in botany in the University of Uppsala, and Lieutenant G. Bore of the Royal Italian Navy, superintendent of the hydrographical work. The Vega sailed from Gothenburg July 4, 1878 in company with her convoy, the Lena. Port Dixon was reached on the morning of August 10th, and nine days later, Cape Serrero, or Chelyushkin, in 77 degrees 41 minutes north latitude. Of this, the most northern part of Siberia, Nordenskjöld, writes, We had now reached a great goal, which for centuries had been the object of unsuccessful struggles. For the first time, a vessel lay at anchor off the northernmost cape of the old world. No wonder, then, that the occurrence was celebrated by a display of flags and the firing of salutes, and when we returned from our excursion on land, by festivities on board, by wine and toast. The north point of Asia forms a low promontory, which a bay divides into two, the eastern arm projecting a little farther to the north and the western. A ridge of hills, with gently sloping sides, runs into the land from the eastern point, and appears within sight of the western to reach a height of 300 metres. Like the plain lying below, the summits of this range were nearly free of snow. Only on the hillsides or in deep furrows excavated by the streams of melted snow and in dales in the plains were large white snowfields to be seen. A low ice foot still remained at most places along the shore, but no glacier rolled its bluish-white ice masses down the mountain sides, and no inland lakes, no perpendicular cliffs, no high mountain summits gave any natural beauty to the landscape, which was the most monotonous and the most desolate I have seen in the high north. On the 23rd, the Vega was again steaming forward among the fields of drift ice. The difficulties of voyaging through unknown waters, overhung with fogs and mists, may better be understood by an anecdote described by Nordenskjöld, which illustrates how completely a person may be deceived by size and distance of objects. One can scarcely, without having experienced it, he writes, form any idea of the optical illusions which are produced by mist in regions where the size of the objects which are visible through fog is not known beforehand, and thus does not give the spectator an idea of the distance. Our estimate of the distance and size in such cases depends wholly on accident. The obscure contours of the fog-concealed objects themselves, besides, are often by the ignorance of the spectator converted into whimsical, fantastic forms. During a boat journey in Hinlopen Strait, I once intended to row among drift ice to an island at a distance of some few kilometres. When the boat started, the air was clear, but while we were employed, and as best we could, in shooting sea fowl for dinner, all was wrapped in a thick mist, and that so unexpectedly that we had not time to take the bearings of the island. This led to a not altogether pleasant row by guests among the pieces of ice that were drifting about in rapid motion in the sound. All exerted themselves as much as possible to get sight of the island, whose beach would afford us a safe resting place. While thus occupied, a dark border was seen through the mist at the horizon. It was taken for the island which we were bound for, and it was not at first considered remarkable that the dark border rose rapidly, for we thought that the mist was dispersing, and in consequence of that more of the land was visible. Soon, two white snowfields that we had not observed before were seen on both sides of the land, and immediately after this was changed to a sea monster, resembling a walrus head as large as a mountain. This got life and motion, and finally sank all at once to the head of a common walrus, which lay on a piece of ice in the neighbourhood of the boat. The white tusks formed the snowfields, and the dark brown round head the mountain. Scarce was this illusion gone, when one of the men cried out, Land right ahead! High land. We now all saw before us a high alpine region with mountain peaks and glaciers, but this too sank a moment afterwards, all at once to a common ice border, blackened with earth. In the spring of 1873, Philander and I, with nine men, made a sledge journey round northeast land. In the course of this journey, a great many bears were seen and killed. When a bear was seen, 
while we were dragging our sledge forward, the train commonly stood still, and not to frighten the bear, all the men concealed themselves behind the sledges, with the exception of the marksman, who, squatting down in some convenient place, waited till his prey could come sufficiently in range to be killed with certainty. It happened once during foggy weather on the ice at Wallenberg Bay, that the bear was expected and had been clearly seen by all of us, instead of approaching us with his usual supple zigzag movements, and with his ordinary attempts to nose himself to a sure insight into the fitness of the foreigners for food, just as the marksman took aim, spread out gigantic wings and flew away in the form of a small ivory gull. Another time, during the same sledge journey, we heard from the tent in which we rested the cook, who was employed outside, cry out, A bear! A great bear! No! A reindeer! A very little reindeer! The same instant, a well-directed shot was fired, and the bear reindeer was found to be a very small fox, which thus paid with its life for the honour of having for some moments played the part of a big animal. From these accounts, it may be seen how difficult navigation among drift ice must be in unknown waters. It had been understood that the Lena would accompany the Vega as far as one of the mouth arms of the Lena River. But on the night of the 27th of August, while off Tumat Islands, all conditions being favourable, the ships parted company after Captain Johansen had received orders, passports and letters for home. As a parting salute to our trusty little attendant during our voyage round the north part of Asia, some rockets were fired, on which we steamed or sailed on each to his destination. Following an easterly course through shallow open water, the Vega all but made the northeast passage in one season. Toward the end of September, however, she was frozen in off the shore of a low plain of tundra in 67 degrees 71 seconds north and 173 degrees 20 seconds west, near the settlements of the Chuchkis, numbering about 300 souls. The open water, which to a late date in the season had favoured the progress of the expedition, was accounted for by the volumes of warm water discharged into the polar sea during the summer by the great Siberian river systems. During the voyage, valuable natural history collections were made, and the sea bottom was found to abound in animal and vegetable life. When we were beset, writes Nordenskjöld, the ice next the shore was too weak to carry a foot passenger, and the difficulty of reaching the vessel from land with the means which the church keys had at their disposal was thus very great. When the natives observed us, there was in any case immediately a great commotion among them. Men, women, children, and dogs were seen running up and down the beach in eager confusion. Some were seen driving in dog sledges on the ice street next the sea. They evidently feared that the splendid opportunity which here lay before them of purchasing brandy and tobacco would be lost. From the vessel we could see with glasses how several attempts were made to put out boats, but they were again given up, until at last a boat was got to a lane, clear of ice or only covered with a thin sheet, that ran from the shore to the neighbourhood of the vessel. In this a large skin boat was put out, which was filled brim full of men and women, regardless of the evident danger of navigating such a boat, heavily laden, through sharp newly formed ice. They rowed immediately to the vessel, and on reaching it, most of them climbed without the least hesitation over the gunwale with jests and laughter, and the cry, Anawag, Anawag, translation, good day, good day. Our first meeting with the inhabitants of this region, where we afterwards passed ten long months, was on both sides very hearty, and formed the starting point of a very friendly relation between the Chushkis and ourselves, which remained unaltered during the whole of our stay. On the 5th of October, continues Nordenskjöld, the openings between the drift ice fields next the vessel were covered with splendid skating ice, of which we availed ourselves by celebrating a gay and joyous festival. The Chuchki women and children were now seen fishing for winter roach along the shore. In this sort of fishing, a man who always accompanies a fishing woman with an iron-shored lance cuts a hole in the ice so near the shore that the distance between the under corner of the hole and the bottom is only half a metre. Each hole is used only by one woman, and that only for a short time. Stooping down at the hole, in which the surface of the water is kept quite clear of pieces of ice by means of an ice sieve, she endeavours to attract the fish by means of a peculiar, wonderfully clattering cry. First, when a fish is seen in the water, an angling line, provided with a hook of bone, iron or copper, is thrown down, strips of the entrails of fish being employed as bait. A small, metre-long staff with a single or double crook in the end was also used as a fishing implement. With this little leaster, the men cast up fish on the ice with incredible dexterity. 
Hunting and exploring excursions were sent out from the Vega with varying success. As the seasons advanced, the natives were threatened with the usual scarcity of food, which was largely relieved by the generosity of the Europeans. A most careful and thorough study was made of these natives, their characteristics, mode of life, manners, speech, and customs. On July 18th, the Vega was liberated from the ice, after having been imprisoned 294 days. After a lapse of 326 years, when Sir Hugh Willoughby made the first attempt at a northeast passage, the Vega sailed through Bering Strait, July 20th, 1879, being the first vessel to penetrate by the north from one of the great world oceans to another. The Vega anchored at Yokohama on the evening of the 2nd of September. On our arrival off Yokohama, writes Nordenskjöld, we were all in good health and the Vega in excellent condition, though after the long voyage in want of some minor repair, of docking, and possibly of coppering. Naturally, among thirty men, some mild attacks of illness could not be avoided in the course of a year, but no disease had been generally prevalent, and our state of health had constantly been excellent. Of scurvy, we had not seen a trace. From Yokohama, the news of the Vega's success was telegraphed throughout the world, and the homeward journey of the expedition via Hong Kong, Singapore, Suez, Naples, Lisbon, Copenhagen, to Stockholm, was one of triumphant progress, each country trying to outdo the others in giving a royal welcome to the gallant explorers. The Vega reached Stockholm April 24, 1880, after a journey of 22,189 miles. End of chapter 16, read by Jake Militia. Chapter 17, Part 1 of The Great White North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jim Dykstra, Farragut, Iowa. The Great White North by Helen S. Wright. Chapter 17, Part 1. British Expedition of 1875 The Alert and Discovery Captain George F. Nares, FRS Albert H. Markham, FRGS Two Voyages of the Pandora, 1875-1876 to Schwatka's Search for the Franklin Records, 1878-1879 to the British North Polar Expedition of 1875 comprised the Alert, a 17-gun sloop, and the Discovery, originally a Dundee whaler. Under the supervision of the Admiral Superintendent of the Dockyard at Portsmouth, Sir Leopold McClintock, these ships were completely overhauled, reinforced, and admirably outfitted for the service expected of them. Each vessel was supplied with nine boats of various sizes, especially constructed for service in Arctic waters. Great care was exercised in selection of officers and men, and their social, moral, and physical qualifications were strictly inquired into. To Captain George S. Nares, FRS, was entrusted the command of the expedition, and Commander Albert H. Markham was placed second in command. On the afternoon of May 29, 1875, the vessels steamed out of Portsmouth Harbor. At Spithead, the squadron was joined by the Valorous, which accompanied the ships as far as Disco. After a stormy but uneventful voyage, the expedition stood off some distance from Cape Farewell, June 25. On the 27th, a falling temperature and a peculiar light blink along the horizon gave due notice of the immediate proximity of the ice. The weather being thick and foggy, extra precautions were taken to avoid collision with any icebergs. The following morning, the high, bold, snow-capped hills near Cape Desolation were sighted. Seals were now seen basking lazily on the ice, and birds common to these regions hovered round the ships, awakening the echoes with their gladsome cries. On July 1, the little Danish settlement of Fiskerness was passed and later that of Godthaub. On July 4, the Arctic Circle was crossed, and two days afterwards, the expedition was safely landed in the Bay of Lively 
off Godhaven, the inspector and inhabitants giving a warm and hearty welcome. Stores were now taken aboard the Valorous, and every preparation made to plunge into the frozen north and meet the experiences of a long period of enforced isolation. A dense fog soon necessitated making the ships fast to icebergs to await a more favorable opportunity of advancing. Whilst attempting to secure the ships, continues Markham, an alarming catastrophe occurred. The boat had been dispatched containing three men with the necessary implements, such as an ice drill and anchor, for making the vessel fast. As soon as the first blow of the drill was delivered, the berg, to our horror, split in two with a loud report, one half with one of our men on it toppling over, while the other half swayed rapidly backwards and forwards. On this latter piece was another of our men, who was observed with his heels in the air, the violent agitation of the berg having precipitated him head foremost into a rent or crevasse. The water alongside was a mass of seething foam and spray, but curious to relate, the boat with the third man in it was in no way injured. They were all speedily rescued from their perilous position and brought on board, sustaining no further harm than that inflicted by a cold bath. Their escape appeared miraculous. On the 19th of July, the ships came to anchor off the Danish settlement of Proven, and here Hans Hendrik, the Eskimo, dog-driver, and hunter, who had accompanied so many expeditions to Smith Sound, was engaged. Putting to sea once more, they passed the headland of Sanderson, his hope, the 21st of July, anchoring off Upper Navik the following morning. Pushing boldly through the middle ice, the passage through Melville Bay was safely accomplished, and the north water reached without incident. Arriving off the Gary Islands on the morning of the 27th, a cache of provisions was landed sufficient to sustain 60 men for two months. Other depots were cached at Cape Hawks and Cape Lincoln. By the 28th of July, both ships came to anchor at Port Falk, the winter quarters of Dr. Hayes, in 1860. An excursion from this point was taken by Captain Nares and Commander Markham to Lifeboat Cove the winter quarters of the remnant of the Polaris crew in 1872-1873. Traces of that expedition were immediately found upon landing. Various relics, such as a trunk, an old basket lined with tin, boxes, stores, pieces of wood, gun barrels, and odds and ends lay strewn about. A collection was made of such articles as were of any value for the purpose of returning them to the United States. Nares and Markham now proceeded to Littleton Island in the hopes of finding an iron boat left there by Dr. Hayes in 1860. Though a careful search was made, no traces of it were discovered. After erecting a cairn at the southwest end of the island on a hill some five or six hundred feet above sea level, from which point Cape Sabine and Cape Fraser could be seen, the intervening distance, navigable, open water, Captain Nares and Commander Markham congratulated themselves on the prospect of rapid progress. A few hours after the return to the ship, the favorable conditions suddenly changed, and from that time on the two ships battled with the ice pack. Hugging the west shore and keeping free from the main pack after leaving Cape Sabine, Captain Nares hardly left the crow's nest in his heroic efforts to take advantage of every lead and opening. Little rest was enjoyed by any on these days during which we were subjected to the wayward will of the pack, writes Commander Markham. On the 19th of August, he says, during the last three weeks we had advanced exactly 90 miles, or at the rate of about four and a quarter a day. This cannot be considered a rapid rate of traveling, yet to accomplish even this necessitated a constant and vigilant lookout. Pushing their way steadily onward, they passed Cape Lieber and crossed Lady Franklin Bay. On the 25th of August, while threading among the ice floes that bordered the coast, a herd of musk oxen 
were seen browsing on an adjacent hill. A shooting party was sent ashore, which separated into three parties upon landing and advanced cautiously toward the spot where the animals were seen grazing. So successful was the hunt that twenty-one hundred and twenty-four pounds of fresh meat was the result of the morning's bag. The harbor in which the ships were anchored possessed all the necessary qualifications for comfortable winter quarters, so that Captain Nares decided to leave the discovery and proceed with the alert. Everything having been satisfactorily arranged, the alert steamed away from Discovery Harbor on the morning of the 26th, pushing her cautious way along the west shore of Kennedy Channel. September 1st, 1875, writes Commander Markham, must always be regarded, at least by all those connected with, or interested in, Arctic research, as a red-letter day in the annals of naval enterprise, and, indeed, in English history. For on this day, a British man-of-war reached a higher northern latitude than had ever yet been reached by any ship. 82 degrees, 25 minutes north, 62 degrees west, and we had the extreme gratification of hoisting the colors at noon to celebrate the event. After rounding Cape Union, the coast trended away to the westward of north. Further advance became impossible, and the alert found herself on the bleak shores of the polar ocean. A more desolate position in which to pass the winter could hardly be imagined. Without a harbor, writes Markham, or projecting headland of any description to protect our good ship from the furious gusts that we must naturally expect. The alert lay, apparently, in a vast frozen ocean, having land on one side, but bounded on the other by the chaotic and illimitable polar pack. After a preliminary sledge journey to ascertain if a more sheltered harbor might be sought, it was decided to winter in their present position. Preparations were immediately made to secure the ship to Floberg Beach, and plans were laid out for autumn sledge journeys to deposit caches of provisions for the following spring. On the 11th of September, Markham, Parr, and Egerton, accompanied by 18 men, made a journey northward along the proposed route of exploration for the purpose of advancing two boats to be used during future sledging operations. On September 25, Commander Markham, with Lieutenants Parr and May, assisted by members of the crew, set out upon another journey. They reached October 4, 82 degrees, 50 minutes north, off Cape Joseph Henry, and a depot was established. The return journey became most irksome and laborious. The snow had accumulated to such a depth as to render some of the ravines and promontories almost impassable. A sudden fall in temperature produced severe frostbites. On the 14th of October, in a temperature of 25 degrees below zero, the exhausted party reached the ship. Preparations for the winter having been finished, and the sledging parties all having returned, there was little left to do but await the coming of the sun, which was absent 145 days, during which officers and crew united in keeping up cheerful spirits and good health by the usual exercise, amusements, and routine of daily duties. Early in March 1876, an attempt was made to communicate with the discovery. Lieutenants Egerton and Ross were selected for this journey and were accompanied by Peterson, the Danish interpreter and sledge driver. On the 12th of March, in a temperature of 30 degrees below zero, the party left the alert, carrying messages, letters, and instructions to those aboard the sister ship. The temperature fell very low soon after their departure, and on the third day, they unexpectedly returned with the poor Dane utterly prostrate and helpless on the sledge. I cannot do better than relate the sad story in Lieutenant Egerton's own words, writes Markham. We read in his official report that not five hours after they had left the ship, 
frostbites became so numerous that I thought it advisable to encamp. This was only the beginning of the story, for they appear to have passed a comparatively comfortable night. At any rate, they were up early the next morning, and again under way. At about one o'clock, when they halted for lunch, Peterson complained of cramp in his stomach and was given some hot tea. He had no appetite, which perhaps was as well, for we read of the bacon, which is always used for lunch. We were unable to eat it, being frozen so hard that we could not get our teeth through the lean. They still continued their journey, encountering some very rough traveling, which necessitated severe physical labor on the part of the two officers. The dogs were of little or no use in getting across these slopes, as it was impossible to get them to go up the cliff, and Peterson being unable to work, Lieutenant Rawson and I had to get the sledge along as best we could. Towards the end of the day, we read, Peterson began to get rather worse, and was shivering all over, his nose being constantly frostbitten, and at times taking five or ten minutes before the circulation could be thoroughly restored. Lieutenant Rawson had several small frostbites, and I escaped with only one. On halting for the night, continues Markham, directly the tent was pitched, they sent Peterson inside with strict injunctions to shift his footgear and get into his sleeping bag, whilst they busied themselves in preparing supper and attending to the dogs. But when they entered the tent, they found that he had turned in without shifting his footgear, was groaning a good deal, and complaining of cramp in the stomach and legs. Having made him change, they gave him some tea, and then administered a few drops of sal volatile, which appeared to give the poor fellow a little ease. The next morning, the wind was so high, and their patient in such a weak state, that they did not think it prudent to attempt to start. He had passed a very restless night, and still complained very much of cramp. Later in the day, he appeared to get worse, shaking and shivering all over, and breathing in short gasps. His face, hands, and feet were all frostbitten, the latter severely, and he had pains in his side as well. After restoring the circulation, they rubbed him with warm flannels, and placed one of their comforters round his stomach. In such a wretched state was the poor fellow that they agreed it would endanger his life if they proceeded on their journey and that when the weather moderated, the only course they could pursue was to return with all haste to their ship. As it was impossible to keep their patient warm in the tent, these two young officers burrowed a hole in a snowdrift, and into this cavity they transported the sick man, themselves, and all their tent robes, closing the aperture by placing over it the tent and sledge. They deprived themselves of their own clothing for the benefit of the invalid, whose frozen feet they actually placed inside their clothes in direct contact with their bodies until their own heat was extracted and they were themselves severely frostbitten in various parts. The poor fellow was now in a very low state. He could retain neither food nor liquid. About 6 p.m. he was very bad, this time worse than before. There appeared to be no heat in him of any kind whatever and he had acute pains in the stomach and back. We chafed him on the stomach, hands, face, and feet, and when he got better, wrapped him up in everything warm we could lay our hands upon, namely their own clothing, which they could ill afford to lose. But they entirely forgot their own condition in their endeavors to ameliorate that of their comrade. Lighting their spirit lamp, and carefully closing every crevice by which the cold air could enter, they succeeded in raising the temperature of the interior to seven degrees, but the atmosphere in the hut became somewhat thick. This was, however, preferable to the intense cold. Let us follow the story out and learn how nobly these two officers tended their sick and suffering companion. We were constantly asking if he was warm in his feet and hands, to which he replied in the affirmative. But before making him comfortable, fancy being comfortable under such circumstances, for the night we examined his feet 
and found them both perfectly gelid and hard from the toes to the ankle, his hands nearly as bad. So, taking each foot, we set to work to warm them with our hands and flannels. As each hand and flannel got cold, warming them about our persons, and also lit up the spirit lamp. In about two hours, we got his feet too, and put them in warm footgear, cut his bag down to allow him more room to move in, and then wrapped him up in the spare coverlet. His hands we also brought round and bound them up in flannel wrappers, with mitts over all, gave him some warm tea and a little rum and water, which he threw up. Shortly after I found him eating snow, which we had strictly forbidden once or twice before. In endeavoring to do this again during the night, he dragged his feet out of the covering, but only a few minutes could have elapsed before this was detected by Lieutenant Rawson, who, upon examining his feet, found them in much the same state as before. We rubbed and chafed them again for over an hour, and when circulation was restored, wrapped him up again, and so passed the third night. On the following morning, Peterson appeared to be slightly better, so, thinking it was preferable to run the risk of taking him back as he was, rather than to pass another such night as the last, they put him on the sledge, and, having hurriedly eaten their breakfast, they started for the ship with all dispatch. They had a rough journey before them of eighteen miles, but they knew it was a case of life and death, and they encouraged the dogs to their utmost speed. The dogs, being homeward bound, were willing enough and needed little persuasion, so that, for a time, they rattled along at a good pace. But actual progress could not have been very rapid, for we read in Egerton's report that the patient's circulation was so feeble that his hands and face were constantly frostbitten, entailing frequent stoppages whilst we endeavored to restore the affected parts. The difficulties of the homeward journey may be gathered from the following extracts. On arriving at the Black Cape, we had to take the patient off the sledge, and while one assisted him round, the other kept the dogs back, for by this time they knew they were homeward bound and required no small amount of trouble to hold in. After getting the sledge round and restoring Peterson's hands and nose, which were almost as bad again a few minutes after, and securing him on the sledge, we again set off. At the Cape, the same difficulties were experienced, in fact, rather more, for the sledge took a charge down a ditch, about twenty-five feet deep, turning right over three times in its descent, and out of which we had to drag it, while clearing harness, which employed us both, one to stand in front of the dogs with the whip, while the other cleared the lines. The dogs made a sudden bolt past Lieutenant Rawson, who was in front with the whip, and dragged me more than a hundred yards before we could stop them. At length, after the usual process with Peterson, that of thawing his hands and nose, which we did every time we cleared harness, or it was actually necessary to stop, we got away, thankful that our troubles were over. The dogs got their harness into a dreadful entanglement in their excitement to get home, but we were afraid to clear them, lest they should break away from us, or cause us any delay, as we were both naturally anxious to return with the utmost speed to the ship, and so relieve ourselves of the serious responsibility occasioned by the very precarious state in which our patient was lying. Upon arriving alongside at 6.30 p.m., we were very thankful that Peterson was able to answer us when we informed him that he was at home. In conclusion, Lieutenant Egerton says, I regret exceedingly that I have been compelled to return to the ship without having accomplished my journey to HMS Discovery, but I trust that what I have done will meet with your approval, and that the course I adopted may be the means of having lessened the very serious and distressing condition of Peterson. Poor Peterson never recovered from the effects of his terrible experience. He gradually sank and died peacefully on the 14th of May. The work of these two brave young officers on this occasion stands out conspicuously amongst 
the many deeds of daring and devotion with which the annals of Arctic adventure abound. Five days after their return to the ship, 20th of March, the same two officers, accompanied by a couple of sailors and a sledge drawn by seven dogs, started once more for the discovery. After five days of a toilsome journey rendered all the more severe by intense cold, they reached the ship and were warmly welcomed by her officers and crew. The serious sledging work of the expedition was undertaken as early in the season as April 3, in a temperature of 33 degrees below zero. Seven sledges under the command of Markham and Aldrich, and manned by a force of 53 officers and men, started on that day for the long-cherished object of reaching the Pole and of exploring the northern shores of Grinnell Land. On the second day out, writes Markham, the temperature fell to 45 degrees below zero, or 77 degrees below freezing point. The cold then was so intense as to deprive us of sleep, the temperature inside the tent being as low as negative 25 degrees, the whole period of resting being occupied in attempting to keep the blood in circulation. Several frostbites were sustained, but they were all attended to in time and resulted in nothing worse than severe and very uncomfortable blisters. By the 10th of April, the depot of provisions established near Cape Joseph Henry during the autumn was found undisturbed. At this point, the supporting sledges returned to the ship, and the two divisions separated and advanced on their solitary missions. The northern division under Markham, with two heavily laden sledges and seventeen men, leaving land, pushed straight out into the rugged polar pack. Handicapped by the two boats which they carried, and in dread of an open polar sea, they advanced, after abandoning one of their boats, seventy-three miles. But the advance being made with divided loads, more than 276 miles was actually covered. Reaching the farthest north up to that time, 83 degrees 20 minutes north, 64 degrees west, May 12, 1876, the depleted condition of the party and the rugged conditions of the ice flows forced the gallant Markham to retreat. It is unnecessary to describe, writes Markham, the incidents that occurred on each successive day during the return journey. Snow fell heavily during the greater part of the return journey, and fogs were very prevalent. Gales of wind had to be endured, for to halt was out of the question. Rest there was none. Onward was the order of the day. As the disease gradually assumed the mastery over the party, so did the appetites decrease, and in a very alarming manner, until it was with the greatest difficulty that anybody could be induced to eat at all. Instead of each man disposing of one pound of pemmican a day, the same quantity sufficed for the entire party in one tent, and even this, occasionally, was not consumed. Nor was the subject of eating and drinking so often discussed. During the outward journey, beefsteaks and onions, mutton chops and new potatoes, and Bass's beer formed the chief topics of conversation. On the return journey, they were scarcely alluded to. Hunger was never felt, but we were all assailed by an intolerable thirst, which could only be appeased at mealtimes, or after the temperature was sufficiently high to admit of quenching our thirst by putting icicles into our mouths. On the 27th of May, the condition of the party was so critical that it became evident that to ensure their reaching the ship alive, the sledges must be considerably lightened. Five men were utterly unable to move, and were consequently carried on the sledges. Five more were almost as helpless, but insisted on hobbling after the sledges. Three others were showing decided scorbutic symptoms, leaving only two officers and two men who could be considered effective. Terra firma was reached on May 5, but the party were in such a deplorable condition that though only 40 miles remained between them and the ship, 
their progress was so slow that it would take them fully three weeks to cover the distance, and by that time who would be left alive? Assistance had, therefore, to be obtained. To procure it, writes Commander Markham, one amongst us was ready and willing to set out on this lonely and solitary mission with the firm reliance of being able to accomplish what he had undertaken, and with the knowledge that he possessed the full confidence of those for whose relief he was about to start on a long and hazardous walk. On the 7th of June, Lieutenant Parr started on his arduous march to the ship. Deep and heartfelt were the godspeeds uttered as he took his departure, and anxiously was his retreating form watched until it was gradually lost to sight amidst the interminable hummocks. The following day, one of their number died and was buried nearby. The saddened and suffering party now left this desolate spot and made an attempt to push on toward the ship. On the morning of the ninth, writes Markham, a rainbow was seen which, being an unusual sight, afforded much interest. On the same day, shortly after the march had been commenced, a moving object was suddenly seen amidst the hummocks to the southward. At first it was regarded as an optical illusion, for we could scarcely realize the fact that it could be anybody from the alert. With what intense anxiety this object was regarded is beyond description. Gradually emerging from the hummocks, a hearty cheer put an end to the suspense that was almost agonizing, as a dog sledge with three men was seen to be approaching. A cheer in return was attempted, but so full were our hearts that it resembled more a wail than a cheer. It is impossible to describe our feelings as May and Moss came up, and we received from them a warm and hearty welcome. We felt that we were saved, and a feeling of thankfulness and gratitude was uppermost in our minds as we shook the hands of those who had hurried out to our relief the moment that Parr had conveyed to them intelligence of our distress. Those who a few short moments before were in the lowest depths of despondency appeared now in the most exuberant spirits. Pain was disregarded and hardships were forgotten as numerous and varied questions were asked and answered. We heard with delight that they were only the vanguard of a larger party, headed by Captain Nairs himself, that was coming out to our relief, and which we should probably meet on the following day. A halt was immediately ordered, cooking utensils lighted up, ice made into water, and we were soon all enjoying a good pannikin full of lime juice, with the prospect of mutton for supper. On the 14th of June, after 72 days of travel and hardship, Commander Markham's party reached the alert. Out of 15 men, one had gone to his long home. Eleven others were carried alongside the ship on sledges, the remaining three barely able to hobble aboard. A more thorough breakup of a healthy and strong body of men it would be difficult to conceive, comments Markham. Not only had the men engaged in the extended party under my command been attacked with scurvy, but also those who had been absent from the ship only for short periods, and some who may be said never to have left the ship at all, or if they did, only for two or three days. The seas must have been sown during the time nearly five months that the sun was absent, and we were in darkness. The serious condition of the crew of the Alert determined Captain Nares to publicly announce on the 16th of June that immediately upon the return of the other sledge parties, he would rejoin the Discovery, transfer all the invalids, and send the ship home. The Alert would remain a second winter at Port Falk, and in the spring, sledge parties would endeavor to explore Hayes Sound and the adjacent lands after which the alert would return to England. This cheerful news did much to restore the invalids to convalescence, and immediately a change for the better was noticed among all hands. Considerable anxiety was felt, however, for Lieutenant Aldridge's party. Although his route was along the coastline, 
and it was hoped that a supply of hares, geese, and perhaps musk oxen might occasionally be secured. Everyone knew that his supply of provisions was all but exhausted, and for the purpose of his relief, a party of three men under Lieutenant May left the ship June 18th. The intervening time until Sunday, June 25, was one of great concern to all on board. On that day, the wanderers were seen struggling through the hummocks some six or seven miles off. A relief party immediately left the ship and brought the men on board. All but two were suffering from scurvy. Only Lieutenant Aldrich and two men were able to walk alongside the ship, and one of these was in a critical condition for many weeks after. They had been absent from the ship 84 days, having explored 220 miles of new coast. Passing Cape Columbia, 83 degrees, 7 minutes north, Lieutenant Aldrich reached his farthest point on the 18th of May, 1876, in 82 degrees, 16 minutes north, 86 degrees west, at Cape Alfred Ernst. It now became the arduous work of the few members of the ship's company who were in good health to minister to the numerous invalids, prepare the ship for leaving winter quarters as soon as the ice would permit, and make hunting trips in search of fresh meat, so essential to the cure of scurvy patients. On the 31st of July, a fresh southwesterly wind had blown the pack off the shore. A clear channel of open water to the southward was hailed with delight. The throbbing of the engines told the men that liberation was at hand, and the alert bade farewell to her northern home. Progress was slow, and threatened nips in the short journey to the Discovery tried the patience of the crew. But on August 5, while yet twenty miles distant from the sister ship, Rawson and two of the men of the Discovery came on board. We were, of course, delighted to see them and to hear news of our consort, writes Commander Markham. From them we learnt that poor Egerton had lost his way and did not arrive on board their ship until after he had been wandering about for eighteen hours. The news from the discovery was what we feared. Notwithstanding the large amount of musk ox flesh cured by them during the autumn and following summer, scurvy had attacked her crew in almost the same virulent manner as it had ours. The return journeys of some of their sledge parties were simply a repetition of our own. Beaumont's division, the one exploring the northwestern coast of Greenland, had suffered very severely, and we heard with extreme regret that two of his small party had succumbed to this terrible disease. The rest of his men, with himself and Dr. Coppinger, had not yet returned to the discovery, having remained in Polaris Bay to recruit their healths. This was, indeed, a bitter ending to our spring campaign, on which we had all set out so full of enthusiasm and hope. It had the effect, however, of confirming Captain Nares in his resolution to proceed to England. The excellent work done by the sledging parties from the Discovery may be summed up as follows. Lieutenant Archer had made a thorough survey of Archer Fjord. Dr. Coppinger had visited Peterman Fjord, and Lieutenant L. A. Beaumont made extensive explorations of the Greenland coast. He had traveled to Repulse Harbor, following the coast to Cape Bryant. Pushing his way across Gerard Osborne Fjord, he had left all but one man to recuperate and traveled with his single companion as far on the eastern shore as 82 degrees, 20 minutes north, 51 degrees west, which he reached May 20, 1876. The return journey was a fight for life against the encroachments of scurvy. A relief party under Lieutenant Rawson and Dr. Coppinger saved the party, but two men died at Hall's old quarters at Thank God Harbor. The two ships now fought the good fight against the ice on their homeward journey, boring, charging, and towing as occasion required. 
It was with no small amount of thankfulness, writes Markham, that on the 9th of September we emerged from the cold, grim clutches that seemed only too ready to detain us for another winter in the realms of the Ice King, and that we felt our ship rise and fall once more on the bosom of an undoubted ocean swell. End of chapter 17, part 1「Chapter Seventeen, Part Two of the Great White North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jim Dykstra, Farragut, Iowa. The Great White North by Helen S. Wright. Chapter Seventeen, Part Two. On the 29th of October, 1876, the two ships reached Queenstown, having passed the Pandora in mid-ocean. The two voyages of this gallant little ship will now be taken up. The objects of the first voyage of the Pandora in 1875, writes Sir Alan Young, were to visit the western coast of Greenland, thence to proceed through Baffin Sea, Lancaster Sound, and Barrow Strait, towards the Magnetic Pole, and if practicable, to navigate through the Northwest Passage to the Pacific Ocean in one season. As, in following this route, the Pandora would pass King William Island, it was proposed, if successful in reaching that locality, in the summer season, when the snow was off the land, to make a search for further records and for the journals of the ships Erebus and Terror. The Pandora was rigged as a barkentine and carried eight boats, including a steam cutter and three whale boats. Her officers and crew numbered 31 men, with Captain Young in command. The expenses of the expedition and the purchase and equipment of the Pandora were undertaken by Sir Alan Young, assisted by contributions from Lady Franklin and Mr. James Gordon Bennett, who was second in command. On the 27th of June, 1875, the Pandora sailed from Plymouth, and by July 19, stood in latitude 58 degrees, 58 minutes north, longitude 31 degrees, 33 minutes west. By the 28th of July, the first icebergs were encountered. The following day, they saw the first Spitzbergen ice. At noon the same day, the land about Cape Desolation could be plainly seen whenever the fog lifted. Soon after they stood off the entrance of Arsac Fjord, this coast is the west bide of the ancient Norse colonizers of Greenland, and near Arsac was the old Norse church of Steinals. The whole coast, writes Captain Young, from southeast to north-northeast, stood before us like a panorama, and the sea so calm, and everything so still and peaceful, excepting now and then the rumbling of an overturning berg, or the distant echo of the flows as they pressed together to seaward of us, that it almost seemed like a transition to some other world. At Iritut, where the Pandora put into coal, Captain Young had the pleasure of visiting his old ship, the Fox. At Iritut also are located the famous cryolite mines, discovered by the Danish missionaries who first sent specimens to Copenhagen as ethnographical curiosities. The cryolite is found near the shore, resting immediately upon gneiss. The purest is of snow-white color, the grayish-white variety being second in quality. It much resembles ice, which has been curved and grooved by the action of the sun's rays. Its component parts are double hydrofluate of soda and alumina. It melts like ice in the flame of a candle, and it is used principally for making soda, also for preparing aluminum. The Pandora was highly favored by the singularly open condition of Melville Bay. Bergs proved plentiful, but no dreaded ice flow impeded her progress. A change in the ice conditions was first noticeable while off the Gary Islands, and upon leaving the islands and proceeding toward Lancaster Sound, the Pandora fell in with the ice the 20th of August while lying about 30 miles east of Cape Horsburg. 
Three bears being seen on the ice, writes Captain Young. I went away in the second cutter with Peary and Bainan, and after shooting the old she-bear and one cub, we succeeded in getting a rope around the larger cub and towing him to the ship. Now began a most lively scene. The bear was almost full-grown, and it was with some difficulty we got him on board and tied down the ring bolts with his hind legs secured, and notwithstanding this rough treatment, he showed most wonderful energy in trying to attack anyone who came within reach, and especially our dogs, who seemed to delight in trying his temper. He was at last secured on the quarter-deck with a chain round his neck and under his forearm, and soon began to feed ravenously on, I am sorry to have to write it, his own mother, who was speedily cut up and pieces of her flesh thrown to my new shipmate. I hope that he was only an adopted child, and the great difference between him and the other cub warranted this supposition, as, being three times the size of the other, he could not have been of the same litter. A few days later we read, Our new shipmate, the bear, made desperate struggles to get over the rail into the sea, but the chain was tightened, and at last he went to sleep. On the 23rd of August, a barrier of ice across Lancaster Sound obliged Captain Young to retrace his steps. Snow, sleet, and wind prevailed as they scudded onward, an ice blink frequently ahead. Then the inevitable flow in streams and loose pieces, with the sea dashing over them as they flew between. While we were in this situation, Captain Young observes, our bear gradually worked himself into a state of frantic excitement, getting up to the rail watching the flow ice rapidly dashing past our side, and, in his attempts to get over the bulwarks, he released his chain until it was evident that in a few moments he would be free, whether to dive overboard or to run amuck among the watch appeared a question of doubt. The alarm being given by Peary, who was riding up the deck log, the watch was called to secure the bear, and I fear that during the half-hour which elapsed, the ship was left, more or less, to take care of herself. The whole watch, besides Peary with a revolver and myself with a crowbar, assaulted the unfortunate Bruin, whose frantic struggles and endeavors to attack everyone within reach were quite as much as we could control. He was loose, but by a fortunate event a running noose was passed round his neck and the poor brute was hauled down to a ring bolt until we could secure the chain round his neck and body. I had hitherto no conception of the strength of these animals, and especially of the power of their jaws. Fearing that the iron crowbar might injure his teeth, I jammed a mop handle into his mouth while the others were securing his chain, and he bit it completely through. At last Bruin gave in and beyond an occasional struggle to get loose, and a constant low growling, he gave us no further trouble. I ought to mention that in the midst of the scrimmage, the doctor was called up to give him a dose of opium, in the hope of subduing him by this means. But having succeeded in getting him to swallow a piece of blubber saturated with chloroform and opium sufficient to kill a dozen men, our Bruin did not appear to have experienced the slightest effect and the doctor, who volunteered to remain up and expressed some anxiety as to the bear's fate, retired below, somewhat disappointed. Making Barrow Strait for the purpose of reaching Beachy Island, the Pandora pursued her course in fog and snow. Beachy Island was reached on the 25th. Going on shore, Captain Young and two officers inspected the state of provisions and boats at Northumberland House. It will be remembered that Northumberland House was built by Commander Pullen of the North Star, which wintered there in 1852 to 1853 and 1853 to 1854, as a depot for Sir Edward Belcher's expedition. The house was built in the fall of 1852 of the lower masts and spars from the American whaler McClellan which had been crushed in the ice in Melville Bay in 1852. Captain Young found that the house had been stove in at the door and sides 
by the wind and by bears, and almost everything light and movable had been blown out or dragged out by the bears, which had also torn up all the tops of the bales and scattered the contents in all directions. The house was nearly full of ice and snow frozen so hard as to necessitate the use of pickaxe and crowbar before anything could be moved. Tea chests and beef casks had been broken open and the contents scattered or devoured. The place presented a scene of ruin and confusion, although there were no traces of the place having been visited by human beings since the departure of Sir Leopold McClintock in the Fox, the 14th of August, 1853. A cask of rum had remained intact, a conclusive proof to my mind, writes Captain Young, that neither Eskimo nor British sailor had entered that way. The boats, however, were found in good condition, and had escaped the ravages of time and wild animals. Weighing anchor, the Pandora stood to the southward for Peel Strait. Captain Young visited a cairn in which a record had been placed by Captain James C. Ross, 7th of June, 1849. An attempt was made to push through to Bellot Strait, but the fast closing in of the ice determined Captain Young to retreat and abandon his cherished hope of making the Northwest Passage this year. A race with the ice to Cape Rennell and a second visit to the Cary Islands resulted in finding a record left there by the alert and discovery, which brought glad tidings to friends at home. By the 11th of September, the Pandora sighted Cape Dudley Diggs, about ten miles distant, the wind freshening to a gale with a high flowing sea which froze as it lapped our sides. Cape York was passed the next day. A stormy passage continued to harass them until the 19th when the Pandora reached the harbor of Godhaven. After a four days' stay at Godhaven, she continued in her course. On the 1st of October, she stood southward of the Cape steering direct for the English Channel, and anchored at Spithead, the 16th of October, 1875. The Pandora put to sea on her second voyage from the Southampton docks, May 17, 1876, for the double purpose of making another attempt to sail through Peel and Franklin Straits, and navigate the coast of North America to Bering Strait, and to carry out the instructions of the British Admiralty, in an attempt to communicate with the Alert and Discovery at Littleton Island or Cape Isabella. Proceeding under sail, she reached Godhaven by the 7th of July. Here, desolation and gloom seemed to overwhelm the little settlement, owing to the storehouse having burned and consumed the entire winter's production of oil and blubber, some 200 barrels, as well as all the store belonging to the United States Polaris Expedition. Such a disaster to the poor Greenlanders was quite as great a catastrophe as the burning of half of London would be to a Britisher. However, a cordial welcome awaited Captain Young from the hospitable natives, and, in fact, he writes, we thoroughly enjoyed our stay in port, and all made great friends with the Greenlanders. The only drawback was caused by the quantities of the most venomous mosquitoes I ever saw, and they did their very best thoroughly to torment us. I never in any climate knew such a pest as we found these Greenland mosquitoes, for wherever we went, either on shore or in a boat, and even on board ship, they followed us persistently, and at whatever hour, night or day, it was always the same. I was this time more bitten than I ever was before. My head and hands were completely swollen, and one of my eyes shut up. On the 11th of July, the Pandora steamed out of Godhaven in the direction of Wagat, making a brief stop at Nuragsuk and putting in for coal at Kudlist. By the 16th, she stood off Hare Island, and two days later was running under canvas toward Upper Navik. Leaving on the 19th, the ship proceeded slowly through a dense fog toward Brown Island. The Duck Islands were passed on the 21st, 
The fog again made progress extremely difficult, and the complications of thousands of icebergs, of every conceivable form and shape, intermingled with the drifting flows of ice, almost blocked the way to the north. The following days were passed in the greatest anxiety by Captain Young. The Pandora was beset in the ice pack of Melville Bay, and in spite of blasting with gunpowder all around her, where the pressure was greatest, the enormous icebergs driving through towards her position threatened her destruction at any moment. On the 29th of July, a frightful storm disrupted the pack, and after 24 hours of uncertainty and danger, the Pandora steamed her way, inch by inch, yard by yard, into the open sea. Cheers burst spontaneously from the crew as we launched out into the ocean and made all sail to a fair wind from the southwest. The north water at last, with the whole season ahead, and a straight course for Cape York and the Cary Islands, a brief stop to examine the Pandora's depot of the previous year, and by August 2, the ship was passing west of Hakluyt Island. A stop was made at Sutherland Island for the purpose of finding any dispatches from Captain Nairs that may have been left there, but only Captain Hartstein's record was found, left there August 16, 1855, when he touched at this point in his search for Dr. Kane. At Littleton Island, which was reached August 3, Captain Young was more successful and a written record July 28, 1875, and left there by Captain Nairs, gave full information of the British expedition up to that date. As it was evident that no sledging party had touched at that point in the spring, Captain Young's mission was over, and he turned his attention to the main object of his voyage, that of attempting the Northwest Passage via Peel Strait, previous to which, however, he made an examination of the bays and inlets between Littleton Island and Cape Alexander. Touching at Cape Isabella, Lieutenants Arbuthnot and Becker landed and found a second communication from Captain Nairs, left there July 29, 1875. Letters for the alert and discovery and a record of the Pandora's visit were deposited at this point. A second attempt to reach Cape Isabella for the purpose of a more thorough examination of the cask, described by the first landing party, and supposed by Captain Young to contain letters or dispatches, resulted in the Pandora spending three weeks in a struggle with the ice for an approach. When Cape Isabella was finally reached, after days of delay and disappointment, the cask which had caused so much anxiety and interest was found to be empty. So much time had been lost in the disappointing effort to reach Cape Isabella that the season was far advanced and the Pandora found herself in a most critical position in the ice pack. To proceed northward had become out of the question by the 27th of August, and furious storms literally drove the ship out of Smith Strait to the southward. Captain Young's personal disappointment at the turn of affairs was only surpassed by the disappointment of the crew, who, after the buffeting and danger of their recent experience, showed an eagerness to risk passing a winter in some snug harbor. The pack gradually receded as the Pandora made her way toward Hakluyt Island, and the way was clear for an immediate return to England. The only important incident of the return voyage was the meeting with the alert and discovery in latitude 54 degrees 38 minutes north, longitude 44 degrees 30 minutes west. The gallant little Pandora, continuing in her course, made Portsmouth Harbor on the 3rd of November, 1876. Following in chronological order the interesting voyages of the Pandora, but of a totally different character, was the remarkable land journey of over 2,819 geographical miles by Lieutenant Schwadka, USA, with W.H. Gilder, in the years of 1878 to 1879, undertaken for the purpose of discovering the Franklin records, should they still exist on King William Land, or in the vicinity of the route 
taken by the survivors of the Erebus and Terror. Lieutenant Frederick Schwadka was of Polish descent, American by birth, and had served with distinction in the 3rd Cavalry. His daring and courage led him to a desire for Arctic adventure, and having secured leave of absence from the government and the support of the National Geographic Society, he left New York on the 19th of June, 1878, in the Esther, with four companions, under the following instructions. Upon your arrival at Repulse Bay, you will prepare for your inland journey by building your sledges and taking such provisions as are necessary. As soon as sufficient snow is on the ground, you will start for King William Land and the Gulf of Boothia. Take daily observations, and whenever you discover any error in any of the charts, you will correct the same. Whenever you shall make any new discoveries, you will mark the same on the charts, and important discoveries I desire to be named after the Honorable Charles P. Daly and his estimable wife, Mrs. Maria Daly. Any records you may think necessary for you to leave on the trip, at such places as you think best, you will mark Esther Franklin Arctic Search Party, Frederick Schwatka in command. Date, longitude, and latitude. To be directed to the President of the National Geographic Society, New York, United States of America. Should you be fortunate in finding the records, remains, or relics of Sir John Franklin or his unfortunate party, as I have hopes you will, you will keep them in your or Joe's control, and the contents thereof shall be kept secret and no part thereof destroyed, tampered with, or lost. Should you find the remains of Sir John Franklin, or any of his party, you will take the same, have them properly taken care of, and bring them with you. The carpenter of the Esther will, before you start on your sledge journey, prepare boxes necessary for the care of relics, remains, or records, should you discover the same. Whatever you may discover or obtain, you will deliver to Captain Thomas F. Berry, or whoever shall be in command of the schooner Esther, or such vessel as may be dispatched for you. You are now provisioned for 18 months for 12 men. I shall, next spring, send more provisions to you, so that in the event of your trip being prolonged, you shall not want for any of the necessaries of life. You will be careful and economical with your provisions, and will not let anything be wasted or destroyed. Should the expedition for which it is intended prove a failure, make it a geographical success, as you will be compelled to travel over a great deal of unexplored country. Winter quarters were established at Camp Daly on the shore ice of Hudson Bay, and intercourse kept up among the natives of Chesterfield Inlet for the purpose of enlisting their support on the sledge journeys planned for the spring and to secure all available information regarding Sir John Franklin or his unfortunate crew. By the 1st of April, the sledge party started on the long march towards King William Land. Lieutenant Schwadka was accompanied by the original party of four white men and 14 Eskimos. The sleds were drawn by 42 dogs, the loads aggregated about 5,000 pounds on the day of starting, consisting largely of walrus meat for the dogs, a liberal equipment of guns, ammunition, and articles of trade, besides the following list of provisions. Hard bread, 500 pounds. Pork, 200 pounds. Compressed corned beef, 200 pounds. Corn starch, 80 pounds. Oleomargarine. 40 pounds, cheese, 40 pounds, coffee, 40 pounds, tea, 5 pounds, molasses, 20 pounds. This, it will be seen, was only about one month's rations for 17 people, and was, in fact, nearly exhausted by the time the party reached King William Land. Dependence was placed on the hunting and abundance of game. 522 reindeer, besides musk oxen, polar bears, and seals 
were secured in the course of the entire journey. Traveling overland to the Back River, the party experienced all the fatigues incident to sledge progress, especially the Americans, who, unaccustomed to long marches, suffered greatly from blistered feet and muscular soreness. The country seemed alive with game, and on the 11th of May seven reindeer were killed, and on the 13th as many as nine. The northern shore of the Back River is bounded by high hills, almost a mountain range, and inland could be seen rocky hills piled together, barren and forbidding. About noon on the 14th, the party came upon some freshly cut blocks of snow turned up on end, a sure sign of natives in the vicinity, and farther on footprints in the snow as well as a cache of musk ox meat. Following the tracks after breaking camp the next day, the party soon reached several igloos, and communication was immediately established with the inhabitants. The chief spokesman was an Okjulik, who with his family comprised all that was left of the tribe which formerly occupied the western coast of Adelaide Peninsula and King William Land. From this interesting and important witness, much information about the Franklin party was gained. When quite a little boy, he had seen some white men alive, and from the description, it might have been Lieutenant Back and his party. Years later, he saw a white man dead in the bunk of a big ship, which was frozen in near an island about five miles west of Grant Point on Adelaide Peninsula. He and his son had seen the tracks of white men on the mainland. The natives had boarded the ship at intervals, and, not knowing how to use the doors, had cut a hole in the side on a level with the ice and entered for the purpose of stealing wood and iron. In the following spring, the ship had filled with water and sunk. There were evidences that people had lived aboard the ship, as some cans of fresh meat mixed with tallow were found. There were knives, forks, spoons, pans, cups, and plates aboard and afterwards a few articles were found on shore after the vessel had gone down. Another native described seeing two boats on the back river containing white men, and he also saw a stone monument on Montreal Island containing a pocket knife, a pair of scissors, and some fish hooks, but no papers of any description. After an encampment of two days and a half, Lieutenant Schwatka continued his journey accompanied by some of these natives as guides. In native encampments beyond Ogle Point and Richardson Point, an old woman was found who proved an interesting witness. She had been one of a party who had met some of the survivors of the Erebus and Terror on Washington Bay. She described seeing ten white men dragging a sledge with a boat on it. The Inuits encamped near the white men, and stayed in their company about five days. The natives had killed some seals, which they shared with the white men. In return, the old woman's husband had been given a knife and other articles, now lost. The white men looked very thin, and their mouths were dry and hard and black. The natives moved on, but the white men could not keep up with them, and remained behind. The following spring, the old woman had seen a tent, standing on the shore at the head of Terror Bay. In it were dead bodies, and outside were others covered with sand. There was no flesh on them, nothing but bones and clothes. About the tent were knives, forks, spoons, watches, and many books, besides clothing and other personal articles. Lieutenant Schwatka visited the cairn erected by Captain Hall over the bones of two of Franklin's men, near the Pfeffer River. A few relics were gathered up in the vicinity of Adelaide Peninsula, one a bunk fixture with the initials LF in brass tacks upon it. Cape Herschel on King William Island was reached in June. Lieutenant Schwadka made a thorough examination of the western shore of the island as far as Cape Felix. At Cape Jane Franklin, Captain Crozier's camp was found where the entire company of the two abandoned ships had remained some time. 
strewn about were many relics of the party and the grave of Lieutenant Irving. Gilt buttons were found among the rotting cloth and mold at the bottom of the grave, and upon one of the stones at the foot of the grave was found a silver medal, two and a half inches in diameter, with a bas-relief portrait of George IV, surrounded by the words, Georgius IV, D.G. Britanniarium, Rex 1820, and on the reverse, a laurel wreath surrounded by Second Mathematical Prize, Royal Naval College, and in closing, awarded to John Irving, Midsummer 1830. The remains of Lieutenant Irving were brought home for burial in Edinburgh. The record deposited by McClintock on the 3rd of June, 1859, was also found. Much of it was illegible, and the cairn in which it had been deposited had been destroyed by natives. The return from King William Land was started September 19. It will be remembered that for months the party had subsisted entirely on game found in the locality, that their original supply of provisions had lasted a little more than 30 days, and that the return was in the face of the fast-approaching winter. Fortunately, reindeer were seen daily in immense herds. We cut quantities of reindeer tallow with our meat, remarks Gilder, probably about half our daily food. Breakfast is eaten raw and frozen, but we generally have a warm meal in the evening. Fuel is hard to obtain, and consists entirely of a vine-like moss called ekshutik. Reindeer tallow is also used for a light. A small flat stone serves for candlestick, on which a lump of tallow is placed, close to a piece of fibrous moss called mune, which is used for a wick. The tallow, melting, runs down upon the stone and is immediately absorbed by the moss. This makes a very cheerful and pleasant light, but is most exasperating to a hungry man, as it smells exactly like frying meat. Eating such quantities of tallow is a great benefit in this climate, and we can easily see the effect of it in the comfort with which we meet the cold. Directing his course toward the great Fishback River, Lieutenant Schwatka began its ascent in November. The cold was intense, from 20 degrees to 70 degrees below zero. We found the traveling on Back River much more tedious than we had anticipated, writes Gilder. Owing to the bare ice in the vicinity of the open water rapids and the intense cold which kept the air filled with minute particles of ice from the freezing of the steam of the open water. On December 28, 1878, Lieutenant Schwatka decided to abandon travel on the Great Fish Back River, owing to the scarcity of game in the vicinity. The Inuit hunters, having reported the land sledging in good condition toward the southeast, indeed much better than upon the river, and indications pointing to an abundance of game in that direction, the party immediately struck out for Depot Island. The extreme cold experienced at this period of the journey was trying beyond expression and had a serious effect upon man and beast. Even iron and wood were affected, strong oak and hickory breaking to the touch like icicles. It was a matter of great difficulty to keep the guns in working order, and the wary game would hear the sound of the crunching of the hunter's tread on the snow at long distances. I have frequently heard, remarks Gilder, the crunching of the sled runners on the brittle snow, a ringing sound like striking bars of steel, a distance of over two miles. The mean temperature for December was minus 50.4 degrees Fahrenheit, the lowest minus 69 degrees. On January 3, the thermometer fell to the lowest point experienced by Lieutenant Schwatka's party and stood at minus 70 degrees in the morning and minus 91 degrees at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. The party had long been without the fatty food so essential to retain bodily warmth in these fearful temperatures, 
and the dogs, although fed upon frozen reindeer meat, which, however, has but little nourishment in it in that state for cold weather, began to sicken and die. The small amount of blubber now remaining only served for lighting the igloos at night, and a cooked meal could only be indulged in on days when the party remained in camp and could gather moss for fuel. To add to the general misery under which the return journey was continued, wolves were frequently met with, so ravenous and bold that they attacked the dogs for the purpose of eating the meat thrown out to them. On another occasion, Tulua was out hunting on the 23rd of February, writes Gilder, when a pack of about 20 wolves attacked him. He jumped upon a big rock, which was soon surrounded, and there he fought the savage beasts off with the butt of his gun until he got a sure shot, when he killed one, and while the others fought over and devoured the carcass, he made the best of the opportunity to get back into camp. It was a most fortunate escape, as he fully realized. Two days later, the same hunter, while following a reindeer not far from camp, was surprised to meet another Inuit, whom he found to be an acquaintance. From this man he learned that Depot Island was about three days' journey off. Returning to camp with this happy intelligence, it was decided to push on and lighten the sledges at the igloo of this native the following day, and then by forced marches reach Depot Island as soon as possible. The prospect of finding ships in the harbor with news from home and friends did much to revive the hope and spirits of the jaded party, and when, as they approached their destination, friendly natives were encountered, their joy and emotion knew no bounds. But though their reception among the Inuits had been warm and hearty, their joy was tempered with disappointment to find that the only ship in the bay was at Marble Island, and that Captain Barry of the Esther had failed to deposit at Depot Island a thousand pounds of bread and other provisions belonging to Lieutenant Schwatka, upon which he had depended. This failure to keep a promise resulted in the party of 22 hungry travelers and 19 starving dogs being forced upon the hospitality of the natives, and in less than a week famine existed in camp, and the situation became desperate. Storms had prevented the hunting of walrus and seal until the eighth day after their arrival. In the meantime, Lieutenant Schwatka, with two companions, had pushed on to Marble Island for assistance. All they had to eat was a little walrus blubber, and in a forced march of 24 hours, they covered 75 miles. The desperate situation in the settlement at Depot Island is described by Gilder as follows. People spoke to each other in whispers, and everything was quiet, save the never-ceasing and piteous cries of the hungry children begging for food which their parents could not give them. Most of the time I stayed in bed, trying to keep warm and to avoid exercise that would only make me all the more hungry. Four days later, the hunters were successful in killing a walrus, and this timely relief enabled the members of Schwatka's party to continue their journey to Marble Island. On the first day out, they met a native with relief for the camp. On Saturday, March 21, 1880, the ship George and Mary was reached, where a warm welcome awaited them from Captain Baker. When freed from the ice in the spring, this ship carried the explorers back to civilization. It will be remembered that, during the entire journey, the reliance for food for man and beast was solely upon the resources of the country that the white men lived exclusively upon the same fare as the Eskimos, and that the return sledge journey was accomplished during an Arctic winter acknowledged to be of exceptional severity by the natives. To Lieutenant Schwatka's excellent management and thorough fitness for his position as commander was due the success of the expedition. All our movements were conducted in the dull, methodical, business-like manner of an army on the march, writes Gilder. Every contingency was calculated upon, 
and provided for beforehand, so that personal adventures were almost unknown or too trivial to mention. The results of this remarkable journey are summed up in a leading English newspaper, published September 25, 1880. Lieutenant Schwatka has now dissolved the last doubts that could have been felt about the fate of the Franklin expedition. He has traced the one untraced ship to its grave beyond the ocean, and cleared the reputation of a harmless people from an undeserved reproach. He has given to the unburied bones of the crews probably the only safeguard against desecration by wandering wild beasts and heedless Eskimos which that frozen land allowed. He has brought home for reverent sepulture in a kindlier soil the one body which bore transport. Over the rest, he has set up monuments to emphasize the undying memory of their sufferings and their exploits. He has gathered tokens by which friends and relatives may identify their dead and revisit in imagination the spots in which the ashes lie. Lastly, he has carried home with him material evidence to complete the annals of Arctic exploration. End of chapter 17, part 2. Chapter 18 of The Great White North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great White North by Helen S. Wright. Chapter 18 The Jeanette Expedition. 1879 to 1881, in command of Captain George W. DeLong, leaves San Francisco, touches at Unalaska August 2nd, reaches Lawrence Bay, East Siberia August 15th, last seen by whale bark, sea breeze near Herald Island, September 2nd. The Jeanette beset in ice pack september fifth never again released daily routine of officers and crew ship springs a leak a frozen summer sight of new land a second winter in the pack the jeanette crushed abandonment the retreat the fate of the three boats death of de long's party melville's search the american arctic expedition of eighteen seventy nine commanded by lieutenant george w de long of the united states navy was equipped and financed by mr james gordon bennett proprietor of the new york herald the object of the expedition was to reach the north pole by way of bering strait the bark rigged steam yacht of four hundred twenty tons pandora which had already seen considerable service in arctic water was purchased from sir allen young by special act of congress she was allowed to sail under american colors be navigated by officers of the united states navy and to change her name from pandora to jeanette the jeanette was reinforced and refitted for the arduous service expected of her and her officers and crew thirty-three in number carefully selected for their especial fitness for the undertaking among the number lieutenant de long and lieutenant chip the executive officer had seen arctic service while attached to the u s steamer juanita which had been sent by the government in search of the polaris in eighteen seventy three engineer melville had been attached to the tigress while that ship had been on the same errand 
and seaman William F. C. Nindeman had sailed on the Polaris and been a member of the Ice Drift Party. Lieutenant John W. Dannenhauer, U.S. Navy, was appointed navigator. Dr. J. M. Ambler, surgeon. Jerome J. Collins, meteorologist. Raymond L. Newcomb, naturalist. And William M. Dunbar, ice pilot. The Jeanette left San Francisco July 8th and moved slowly toward the Golden Gate amid the cheers and waving of handkerchiefs from thousands of spectators on the wharves and on Telegraph Hill. A salute of ten guns was fired from Fort Point, while a convoy of white sailed craft of the San Francisco Yacht Club escorted her out to the broad Pacific. Pursuing her course, the Jeanette made for Unalaska, one of the Aleutian Islands, which she reached August 2nd. There, additional stores were taken aboard, and four days later she pursued her course to St. Michael's, Alaska, where she anchored the 12th of August. Dogs and fur clothing were purchased, and two Alaskans, Anakin and Alexei, were hired to accompany the expedition as dog drivers. By the 25th of August, she had reached St. Lawrence Bay, East Siberia, where Lieutenant DeLong learned that a ship supposed to be the Vega had gone south in June. She then rounded East Cape and touched at Cape Zerdsey, from which point Lieutenant DeLong sent his last letter home. Captain Barnes of the American Whale Bark Sea Breeze saw the Jeanette under full sail and steam on the 2nd of September, 1879, about 50 miles south of Herald Island. On the 3rd of September, she was sighted by Captain Kelly of the Bark Dawn, and at about the same time, Captain Baldry of the Helen Mar and several other whalers saw smoke from the Jeanette's smokestack in range of Herald Island. She was standing north. These were the last tidings heard of the expedition by the outside world for over two years. On the 5th of September, the Jeanette having boldly entered the ice in an attempt to push through and winter at Harold Island or Wrangell Land was beset and never again left the ice pack, but drifted at the mercy of this formidable foe until she was crushed and finally sank many months afterward. Hoping against hope that a release would come first in the fall with the promise of indian summer then in the spring with the breaking up of the ice pack captain delong saw the weeks and months glide by and followed the complicated drift of the jeanette as she coquetted with her jailer turning and twisting in her course suffering the constant pressure of her enemy that hourly threatened her destruction and pursuing an uneven drift north and eastward. The daily routine during the long imprisonment was practically as follows. 6 a.m. Call executive officer. 7 a.m. Call ship's cook. 8.30 a.m. Call all hands. 9 a.m. Breakfast by watches. 10 a.m. Turn to clear fire hole of ice, fill buckets with snow, clean up decks. 11 a.m. Clear foc'sle. All hands take exercise on the ice. 11.30 a.m. Inspection by executive officer. 12. Meridius. Get soundings. 1 p.m. One watch may go below. 2 p.m. Fill barrels with snow. 
clear fire hole of ice. 3 p.m. Dinner by watches. 4 p.m. Galley fires out. Carpenter and Bosun report departments to executive officer. 7.30 p.m. Supper by watches. 10 p.m. Pipe down. Noise and smoking to cease in forecastle and all lights to be put out except one burner of bulkhead lantern. Man on watch report to the executive. During the night, the anchor watch will examine the fires and lights every half hour and see that there is no danger from fire. All buckets will be kept on the starboard side of the quarter deck, ready for use in case of fire. This program was varied only as contingencies arose by threatening disaster from ice pressure, by the chase of bears, the capture of walrus and seals, or by hunting parties who traveled over the ice in search of game or took a daily run with the dogs. Wintering in the pack, comments the long, may be a thrilling thing to read about alongside a warm fire in a comfortable home, but the actual thing is sufficient to make any man prematurely old. On January 19, 1880, owing to serious convulsions of the ice, the Jeannette sprung a leak. The deck pumps were at once rigged and manned and steam raised on the port boiler to run the steam pumps. This last caused great difficulty and delay owing to the temperature in the fire room being minus 29 degrees, the seacocks being frozen, which necessitated pouring buckets of water through the manhole plates before the pumps could be operated. Through Melville's indomitable energy, the pumps were effective by afternoon. Though all hands worked until midnight, the serious situation was only partially controlled. The men working knee-deep in ice water, and the men standing down in the forepeak, stuffing oakum and tallow in every place from which water came. Under the direction of Lieutenant Chip, a bulkhead was built forward of the foremast, which partially confined the water. In the meantime, Melville, working night and day, rigged an economical pump with the Baxter boiler with which the ship was pumped for nearly 18 months. Lieutenant Dannenhauer, who had been suffering for some time with his eyes, had become totally incapacitated for service, and on the 22nd of January submitted to an operation performed by Dr. Ambler. Two days later, the long comments on the gravity of his own responsibilities. My anxieties are beginning to crowd on me. A disabled and leaking ship, a seriously sick officer, and an uneasy and terrible pack with constantly diminishing coal pile and a distance of 200 miles to the nearest Siberian settlement. These are enough to think of for a lifetime. The drift of the Jeannette for the first five months had covered an immense area. She had approached and receded from the 180th meridian, drifting back to within 50 miles from where she had entered the pack. By the 3rd of May, however, fresh southeast winds began and the ship took up a rapid and uniform drift to the northwest. Hope for release, which had been buoyant in May, was deferred until June, and when that month glided by with no signs of liberation, it passed to July and gradually faded with the brief passage of a frozen summer. The Jeannette, again uncertain in her drift, 
added to the general disappointment of the commander. The ring of despair and realization of failure are voiced in an entry August 12th. Observations today show a drift since the 9th of five and a half miles to south 38 degrees east. The irony of fate. How long, O oh Lord, how long? On September 1st, the Jeanette, for the first time since her imprisonment, stood on an even keel. But four days later, one year from the time she flung her fortunes to the enemy, she was again held fast in its frozen grip. During the month, she was put in winter quarters for the second time. The approach of the long night with its added anxieties brought little change to the members of the expedition. The question of fuel was the most serious problem, and the amount used was figured to the most economical basis. Weary days dragged along without novelty or change. So far as I know, writes DeLong in January 1881, never has an Arctic expedition been so unprofitable as this. People beset in the pack before have always drifted somewhere to some land, but we are drifting about like modern flying Dutchmen, never getting anywhere, but always restless and on the move. Coals are burning up, food being consumed, the pumps are still going, and 33 people are wearing out their hearts and souls like men doomed to imprisonment for life. If this next summer comes and goes like the last without any result, what reasonable mind can be patient in contemplation of the future? For Long, weary months were to elapse before a relief came to break the monotonous situation. On May 16, 1881, the Jeanette stood in latitude 76 degrees, 43 minutes, 20 seconds north, longitude 161 degrees, 53 minutes, 45 seconds east. Land was sighted to the westward, which proved to be an island, later named Jeanette Island, the first that had greeted the weary eyes of officers and men since March 24, 1880, when the ship had been in sight of Wrangell Land. On May 24, a second island was seen. On the 31st, Melville Dunbar, Nindemann, and three others started with a dog sledge and provisions for an investigation of the newly discovered island. The party landed on June 3rd, hoisted the American flag, and formally took possession of the land in the name of the United States and giving it the name of Henrietta Island. They built a cairn and deposited a record. The journey had been wrought with great danger and hardship. The ice between the ship and the island had been something frightful, writes DeLong. After digging, ferrying, and its attendant loading and unloading, arm-breaking hauls and panic-stricken dogs made their journey a terribly severe one. Near the island, the ice was all alive, and Melville left his boat and supplies, and, carrying only a day's provisions and his instruments, at the risk of his life, went through the terrible mass, actually dragging the dogs, which from fear refused to follow their human leaders. If this persistence in landing upon this island in spite of the superhuman difficulties he encountered, is not reckoned a brave and meritorious action. It will not be from any failure on my part to make it known. The approach of spring had revealed to Dr. Ambler a pale and stricken crew. Dan and Hauer, 
had long been a sufferer. Lieutenant Chip was ill. Mr. Collins was recuperating slowly from a severe illness. Alexei, the Alaskan, was suffering from ulcers, and others of the crew showed incipient signs of scurvy. On the 12th of June, 1881, while in 77 degrees, 15 minutes north latitude and 155 degrees east longitude, the Jeanette experienced a final pressure from the ice from which she sank within a few hours. As soon as it was realized that her fate was sealed, orders were issued that all provisions, boats, etc., should be transported to a safe distance upon the ice. This was done without confusion or excitement. When the order was given to abandon the ship, writes one of the officers, her hold was full of water, and as she was keeling 23 degrees to starboard at the time, the watch was on the lower side of the spar deck. The men encamped upon the ice, and by four o'clock on the morning of the 13th, Amid the rattling and banging of her timbers and ironwork, the ship righted and stood almost upright. The flows that had come in and crushed her slowly backed off, and she sank with slightly accelerated velocity. The yardarms were stripped and broken upward parallel to the masts, and so, like a great gaunt skeleton clapping its hands above its head, she plunged out of sight. Those of us who saw her go down, adds Chief Engineer Melville, did so with mingled feelings of sadness and relief. We were now utterly isolated beyond any rational hope of aid with our proper means of escape, to which so many pleasant associations attached, destroyed before our eyes and hence it was no wonder we felt lonely and in a sense that few can appreciate but we were satisfied since we knew full well that the ship's usefulness had long ago passed away and we could now start at once the sooner the better on our long march to the south the following week was spent in preparations for the retreat the route was laid due south, it being the intention of Captain DeLong to make for the Lena River after a brief stop at the new Siberian island. The day's march was accomplished under the most trying circumstances. The lateness of the season and the ruggedness of the ice necessitating road-making, bridging, and rafting or dragging the loads through slush and water that lay knee-deep in the path. The footgear of the men became practically useless as a result of constant wettings, and every device was resorted to to keep the bare feet from contact with the ice. A large number, writes Melville, marched with their toes protruding through their moccasins some with the uppers full of holes out of which the water and slush spurted at every step yet no one murmured so long as his feet were clear of ice and i have here to say that no ship's company ever endured such severe toil with so little complaint another crew perhaps may be found to do as well but better never nine loaded sledges and five boats carrying sixty days provisions had to be hauled across the moving floes in the course of the day the road had to be travelled no less than thirteen times seven times with loads and six times empty-handed thus walking twenty-six miles and making an advance of two the sick with the hospital stores and tents were under the care of dr ambler 
Thus, the march over the frozen ocean was continued for several weeks, when, to the consternation and dismay of Captain DeLong, he found upon taking observations that by the northerly drift of the pack they were losing ground daily and had drifted some twenty-four miles to the northwest this disheartening intelligence was kept from the men with the exception of melville and dr ambler changing their course to south southwest the party continued their slow and wearisome progress until the eleventh or twelfth of july when the mountainous peaks of an island gladdened the eyes of the shipwrecked crew inspired to renewed effort the men pushed on finally landed and captain de long took possession in the name of god and the united states naming this new territory bennett island nine days were spent on this island during which the boats were repaired a cairn was built and a record left the final departure from bennett island took place august sixth in the meantime the brief summer had gone already young ice was forming and the streams and rivulets that had gladdened the men's eyes upon their arrival had disappeared as the cold grasp of winter prepared to hold them fast it had been decided by captain de long to divide the party into three sections and to proceed by boats to this end lieutenant chip was assigned to the second cutter in command of nine men chief engineer melville to the whaleboat in command of nine men de long reserving the command of the first cutter and twelve men instructions to chip and melville directed that they should keep close to the captain's boat but if through accident they should become separated to make their way south to the coast of siberia and follow it to the lena river then ascend the lena to a russian settlement for the next eighteen days the retreat was made by working through leads hauling the boats out and making portages across floe pieces that barred their progress and occasionally as much as ten miles was made a day to the southwest vexatious delays were caused by the fast approaching winter and upon reaching darioski one of the new siberian islands the pinch of diminishing rations began sorely to be felt game which had been occasionally secured during the early part of the retreat had been scarce of late and the outlook began to take on the gray aspect of a desperate future from now on the retreat was one long desperate struggle against famine in gales and piercing cold describing the experiences of september seventh melville writes standing to the southward we shortly came up with a large flow alive with small running hummocks and stream ice it was blowing stiffly the sea was lumpy and our boats careering at a lively rate pumping and bailing to keep afloat we suddenly came unawares upon the weather side of a great flow piece over which the sea was breaking so terribly that for us to come in contact with it meant certain destruction it was floating from four to six feet above water its sides either perpendicular or undershot by the action of the waves which dashed madly over it the surf flying in the air to a height of twenty feet and where the sea had honeycombed it and eaten holes upward through its thickness a thousand water spouts cast forth spray like a school of whales round about 
down sail and away we pulled for our lives the long being fifty or a hundred yards in advance of me and so much nearer danger hailed me to take him in tow which i did and together we barely managed to hold our precarious position the second cutter was away behind again but upon coming up seized the whale-boat's painter and so we struggled in line and at last succeeded in clearing the weather edge of the flow it was a long pull and a hard pull the sea roared and thundered against the cold bleak mass of ice lying away from it like snowflakes and freezing as it flew the sailors blinded by the wind and spray pulled manfully at the oars their bare hands frozen and bleeding and the boats tossed capriciously about with the wild waves and the unequal strain of the tow line drenched to the skin by the cruel icy seas which poured in and nigh filled the boats the overtaxed men as they faced the dreadful death-dealing sea and murderous ice edge found new life and strength and performed wonders our boats were well bunched together and although it was now pitch dark we could yet for a while discern each other looming up out of the black water like spectres and plunging over the crests of the waves presently the second cutter faded away but as mine was the fastest boat of the three i experienced no difficulty in following the long indeed in my anxiety to obey the order keep within hail i at times barely escaped running the first cutter down toward midnight continues melville we approached the weather edge of the pack the roar of the surf reaching our ears long before we could see the ice i involuntarily hauled the whaleboat closer on the wind and by so doing lost sight of the first cutter but the terrible noise and confusion of the sea warned me beyond doubt of the death that lay under our lee presently out of the darkness there appeared the horrid white wall of ice and foam not a second too soon ready about and out with the two lee oars if she misses stays this of course from the heavy sea she did and quick as thought my orders were obeyed as we turned slowly round a wave swept across our starboard quarter filling the boats to the seats ye gods what a cold bath and now we were in the midst of small streaming ice broken and triturated into posh by the sea in grinding flows and this was hurled back upon us by the reflex water and eddying current in the rear of the pack which was rapidly moving before the wind with bailers buckets and pumps doing their utmost the two lee oars brought us around in good time and we filed away on the other tack the waves still leaping playfully in as though to keep us busy and spice our misery with the zest of danger when day broke neither of our companion boats was in sight the wind had moderated greatly and we were now in quiet water among the loose pack perhaps the most miserable-looking collection of mortals that ever crowded shivering together in a heap we looked indeed so utterly forlorn and wretched that just to revive and thaw as it were my drowned and frozen wits i burst forth into frenzied song of a truth as we sat shaking there 
Our situation was nigh desperate. We were down to an allowance of a pint of water to each man per day, now that DeLong was separated from us. But upon the suggestion of someone in the boat, I set up the fire pot and made hot tea. We were thus breakfasting when the first cutter hove in view. I at once joined company, and shortly after, the second cutter made her appearance and we were again together the sea soon calmed les miserables thawed out the morning became as pleasant as the memorable may mornings at home and we again were bright and alive with hope the following day september twelfth after a night's encampment upon a floe the party landed in Semenovsky and the hunters had the good fortune to secure a deer which provided them for the first time in many months a full and delicious meal cape barkin the point of destination was found to be only ninety miles distant and after a day's rest and depositing a record at Semenovsky island the party embarked once more full of hope and courage that cape barkin might be reached after one more night at sea the three boats sped forward to the southwest in a rising sea the gale increased and the heavy seas grew hourly more formidable and threatening de long and chip were experiencing great difficulty in the management of their overloaded boats melville in his endeavor to obey the order to keep within hail was all but swamped by the fury of the waves as they broke over the whaleboat in an endeavor to answer signals from de long melville shouted down the wind that he must run or swamp de long waved back motioning him onward melville hoisted sail shook out one reef and the whale boat shot forward like an arrow. De Long then signaled Chip. For an instant, the second cutter was seen in the dim twilight to rise on the crest of a wave, then sink out of sight. Once more she appeared. A tremendous sea broke over her. A man was seen striving to free the sail. She sank again from view and though seas rose and fell one after another the second cutter with all on board was never seen again the whaleboat plunged on at a spanking rate and was soon out of sight of de long the question now was whether she would outlive the gale and to ensure greater safety, Melville ordered a drag anchor to be made of tent poles weighted with such available material as came to hand. What a night! Lying anchored at the mercy of the gale, bailing out with pumps, buckets, and pans the heavy seas as they broke over the boat. Hungry and thirsty men, soaked to the skin with repeated ice-cold baths half frozen from exposure to the icy blasts a little whiskey was all they had during that fearful night and in the morning a quarter of a pound of pemmican served as breakfast to the wretched crew the gale still raged about them with unabated fury but by afternoon it had abated sufficiently for them to get under way and the morning of the fourteenth found them sailing through young ice and in shoal waters which they avoided by steering to the eastward all day short rations of a quarter of a pound of pemmican three times a day without water was all they had and another miserable night settled upon the toilers as they bailed the water-logged whaleboat the water turning to slush the minute it was in the boat the men were now undergoing severe sufferings from thirst 
The following day they were fortunate in reaching one mouth of the Lena River, and proceeding up this stream, they disembarked for the first time after five days of misery. Taking shelter in a deserted hut, lately vacated by natives, they thawed their aching bodies around a cheering camp fire, brewed a pot of tea, and ate a stew made of a few birds shot at Semenovsky Island. But their swollen limbs, blistered and cracked hands, gave them excruciating pain, and another sleepless night added to their misery. Two more toilsome days were spent pooling up the river and encamping at night under a cold and cheerless sky. On the 19th of September, 1881, Melville's party had the good fortune to fall in with natives who treated the forlorn men with great kindness and generosity, and on the 26th of September they reached the Russian village of Gemovialak, where they subsisted until they were able to communicate with the commandant at Belun. Upon the separation of the boats already described, the long experienced the same threatened destruction of the first cutter that had caused Melville so much anxiety in the whale boat. After three miserable days and nights of exposure to the merciless seas, he decided to make a landing by wading ashore September 17th at a point 73 degrees 25 minutes north latitude, 26 degrees 30 minutes east longitude. Owing to the shallow water, it was found necessary to abandon the boat, and the wretched and feeble party, destitute save for four days' scant provisions, began their fatal march on the inhospitable tundra of northern Siberia in search of a settlement ninety-five miles distant. The long record of this weary tramp is one long agony of a slowly perishing party. Everything was abandoned that was not absolutely necessary. But in spite of lightened loads, the half-frozen men limped and hobbled slowly along, falling in their tracks, the weaker assisted by the stronger, but even then the ground covered was inconsiderable, so that on September 21st, upon reaching some deserted huts, the long records. According to my accounts, we are now 37 miles away from the next station, and 87 from a probable settlement. We have two days' rations after tomorrow morning's breakfast, and we have three lame men who cannot make more than five or six miles a day. Of course, I cannot leave them, and they certainly cannot keep up the pace necessary to take. The hunters were fortunate in securing occasional deer, but the unfortunate condition of Erickson, whose frozen feet necessitated the amputation of his toes, retarded their progress, and October came in cold and blustery to find the miserable party still far away from human aid. For nine days more they struggled along the barren shores of the Lena. Game failed, and their food was exhausted. Erickson died and was buried in the river. Nindemann and Noros started on a forced march for assistance from the nearest settlement at Kumark Circa. They carried their blankets, one rifle, 40 rounds of ammunition, and two ounces of alcohol, but no food. On October 10th, the long makes the following entry. 120th day. Last half ounce alcohol at 5.30. At 6.30, send Alexei off to look for ptarmigan. Eat deerskin scraps. Yesterday morning ate my deerskin footnips. 
light south southeast airs, not very cold, under way at eight. In crossing creek, three of us got wet, built fire and dried out, ahead again until eleven, used up, built fire, made a drink out of the tea leaves from alcohol bottle, on again at noon, fresh south southwest wind, drifting snow, very hard going, Lee begging to be left, some little beach and then long stretches of high bank, ptarmigan tracks plentiful, following Nindeman's tracks, at three halted, used up, crawled into a hole in the bank, collected wood, and built fire, Alexi away in quest of game, nothing for supper except a spoonful of glycerin, all hands weak and feeble but cheerful, God help us. Three days later there is an entry, we are in the hands of God, and unless he intervenes, we are lost. On October 16th, the faithful hunter Alexei broke down, and the next day he died. On the 21st, Cack was found dead between the captain and Dr. Ambler, and about noon, Lee died. And on October 22nd, DeLong writes, one hundred and thirty second day, too weak to carry the bodies of Lee and Cack out on the ice. The doctor Collins and I carried them around the corner out of sight. Then my eye closed up. On Monday, October twenty fourth, there is the simple entry: one hundred and thirty fourth day, a hard night. And three days later, Iverson broken down, and the next day, Iverson died during early morning. On October 29th, 139th day, Dressler died during night. On October 30th, Sunday, the last record of the brave DeLong was written. 140th day, Boyd and Gertz died during night. Mr. Collins dying. The forced march of Nindeman and Noros is one of the most remarkable tests of human suffering and endurance in the annals of Arctic history. It is a record of traveling across the wilderness without food except as they brought down an occasional ptarmigan and lemming sighting with the eyes of starving men a herd of deer which fled before they could approach sufficiently near to fire at them struggling through wretched days to crawl into a snow hole at night where they lay the night through wet to the waist alternately sleeping for five minute intervals one man rousing the other that he might knock his feet together to keep them from freezing and taking up the march upon the strength of an infusion of arctic willow tea and boot sole crossing a couple of streams they sought shelter from a raging gale in a wretched hut where a refuse pile of deer bones were burned and eaten near another hut was found a little rotten fish this eked out with strips cut from sealskin clothing was all that stayed the pangs of hunger as they marched on the sixteenth of october found their strength fast waning noros was complaining of illness and spitting blood two days later they reached a place set down on later maps as bull Corps. it consisted of three deserted huts near by was a half kayak with something in it noros tasted it it was blue moulded and tasteless to them but it was fish and they took it with them to the other huts they found nothing more, and after gathering some driftwood, they made a fire and tried to find some food in the moldy fish. 
On Friday, October 21st, they were too weak to push on, but spent the day in careful husbanding of their resources. Measuring their fish, they found that by taking each two tin cupfuls a day, they had enough for ten days. Sewing up the fish in their foot nips and skull caps, they arranged straps to these bundles for carrying. The next day, while still too weak to proceed, they heard a noise outside the hut, like a flock of geese sweeping by, and Nindemann, seizing his gun, looked through the crack of the door, seeing something moving, which he thought were reindeer. Nindemann advanced when the door suddenly opened and a man stood on the threshold. Seeing the rifle, the man fell upon his knees, but when Nindemann reassured him by throwing the weapon to one side, friendly communication was established between the stranger and the forlorn man. Sympathizing with their desperate Light. he let them know by signs that he would return in three or four hours or days they could not tell which about six o'clock the same evening the stranger accompanied by two other natives returned bringing with them a frozen fish which they skinned and sliced and while Nindemann and Noros were devouring the first real food that they had had for many a day, the men brought in deerskin coats and boots for them. Assisting them into the sleighs, they drove off with them along the river to the westward for a distance of about fifteen miles to where some other natives were located in two tents. These treated the sailors with great kindness. By signs and pantomime, Noros and Nindemann tried in every possible way to explain to these natives about De Long and the remainder of the first cutter's party, but they failed to understand, and two days later, after reaching Kumar Circa, the same efforts were renewed without success in despair of securing assistance the men implored to be taken to balen which they reached october twenty sixth an interview with the commandant at balen left the men still uncertain if they were understood or the plight of de long's forlorn party made clear to the official who however repeated that he would take a paper to the captain who Nindemann supposed to be his superior officer, sick and weak from dysentery, scantily clothed and insufficiently fed, the men were located in a miserable hut which had been assigned to them when on the evening of November 2nd, 1881, the door opened and a man dressed in fur entered. As he came forward, noros exclaimed my god mr melville are you alive we thought that the whale boats were all dead the official having already knowledge of the safety of the whale boats party had immediately communicated with melville who in all haste came to balen the whale boat party were now on their road from Geomovilak to Balen. The intrepid Melville was now determined upon an immediate search for De Long's party, and to this end hastened back, meeting Dane and Hauer at Burlock, where he gave him instructions to proceed with the entire party to Yakutsk, a distance of twelve hundred miles and to communicate with the russian government and the united states minister melville was by no means recovered from his long exposure 
and his frozen limbs caused him great suffering but nevertheless he went back over the track of Ninamin and noros step by step on november tenth the natives who had accompanied him announced they must return as the provisions were exhausted but melville commanded them to go on declaring they would eat dog as long as the twenty-two lasted and when these gave out he should eat them such determination won the day and they proceeded to the settlement of north balon here a native brought him one of de long's records left on the march from these natives he learned in which direction the records had been found and pressing on in spite of his frozen feet which were in such a condition that he could no longer wear his moccasins he reached november thirteenth the hut where de long's first record had been left a distance from north balen of thirty-three miles could de long's chart but have shown the native settlement of north balen the whole party would doubtless have been saved on november fourteenth following the northeast bank of the river he came to the shores of the arctic ocean and found the flagstaff where articles from the first cutter had been cached loading his sled with all the articles found there including logbook chronometer and navigation box he returned to north balen with fresh dog teams he set out again november seventeenth in an endeavor to find the hut where ericsson died fierce storms and lack of food forced melville to take refuge in a snow hole dug about six feet square and three or four feet deep the storm continued to blow writes melville the whole of that night the next day and the next night it was impossible to move until the next day morning when it cleared up a little but in the meantime we had nothing to eat it was too stormy to make a fire to make tea and the venison bones which the natives had dug out were full of maggots we chopped this up in little cubes and swallowed it whole which made me so sick after it warmed up in my stomach that i vomited it all out again melville reached kumark circa november twenty fourth and at balen three days later after an absence of twenty-three days in which he travelled no less than six hundred and sixty-three miles over the tundra of northern siberia in the face of an arctic winter upon reaching yakutsk december thirtieth eighteen eighty one where danenhauer and his party had preceded him melville retained ninaman and bartlett to assist him in the spring search and instructed danenhauer to proceed with the other nine men to irkutsk distant over nineteen hundred miles from thence to america the spring search was made under the following instructions from the navy department at washington omit no effort spare no expense in securing safety of men in second cutter let the sick and the frozen of those already rescued have every attention and as soon as practicable have them transferred to a milder climate department will supply necessary funds in the meantime l p jackson special correspondent of the new york herald had arrived in irkutsk on his way to the lena delta the navy department detailed l p noros to accompany him lieutenant giles b harbor u s navy accompanied by master w h schutze 
had been sent to search for Lieutenant Chip and his party. Melville, with Nindeman and Bartlett as assistants, engaged three interpreters and reached Bale on the second week in February. A month was spent in collecting dogs and provisions and establishing depots of supplies at Mat Thai and Kaskarta. On March 16, 1882, accompanied by Nindeman, Melville proceeded to a place called Usterda, where Captain DeLong had crossed the river to the westward. A search was now made for the hut where Erickson had died. Snow covered the country and effectively obliterated all traces of previous travelers. Storms forced their return to Cascarda, and a fresh start was made. The party divided to ensure a more thorough search. We followed the bay, says Mr. Melville in his narrative, until late in the evening, having visited all the headlands. Finally, we came up to the large river with the broken ice. I jumped upon the headland or point of land making down in the bay and found where an immense fire had been made. The fire bed was probably six feet in diameter. Large drift logs hove into it and a large fire made, such as a signal fire. I then hailed Nindaman and the natives, saying, Here they are. They thought that I had found the place where the DeLong party had been. Nindaman came upon the point of land and said that neither he nor Noros had made a fire of that kind, only a small fire in the cleft of a bank. But he was sure that this was the point of land they had turned going to the westward and that this was the river along which he and Noros had come. It is the custom of people here, continues Melville, in making a search to go facing the river, and when they see anything to attract them, drop off the sled and examine it, or pick it up and go on. In this manner, about 500 yards from the point where the fire had been, I saw the points of four sticks standing up out of the snow about 18 inches and lashed together with a piece of rope. Seeing this, I dropped off the sled and, going up to the place on the snowbank, I found a Remington rifle slung across the points of the sticks and the muzzle about eight inches out of the snow. The dog driver, seeing I had found something, came back with the sled, and I sent him to Nindeman to tell him to come back, he having gone as far up the river as the flatboat. When they returned, I started the natives to digging out the snowbank underneath the tent poles, I supposed that the party had got tired of carrying their books and papers and had made a deposit of them at this place and erected these poles over the papers and books as a landmark that they might return and secure them in case they arrived at a place of safety. Nindeman and I stood a little while, got up on the bank, and took a look at the river. Nindeman said he would go to the northward and see if he could discover anything of the track and find the way to Erickson's hut. I took the compass and proceeded to the southward to get the bearings of Stelbovoy and Matvai so I might return that night in case it came on to blow. In proceeding to a point to set up the compass, I saw a tea kettle partially buried in the snow. One of the natives had followed me, and I pointed out to him the kettle, and advancing to pick it up, I came upon the bodies of three men, partially buried in the snow, one hand reaching out with the left arm of the man raised way above the surface of the snow, his whole left arm. 
I immediately recognized them as Captain DeLong, Dr. Ambler, and Ah Sam, the cook. The captain and the doctor were lying with their heads to the northward, face to the west, and Ah Sam was lying at right angles to the other two, with his head about the doctor's middle and feet in the fire, or where the fire had been. This fireplace was surrounded by driftwood, immense trunks of trees, and they had their fire in the crotch of a large tree. They had carried the tea kettle up there and got a lot of arctic willow which they used for tea and some ice to make water for their tea and had a fire. They apparently had attempted to carry their books and papers up there on this high point because they carried the chart case up there, and I suppose the fatigue of going up on the high land prevented their returning to get the rest of their books and papers. No doubt they saw that if they died on the river bed, where the water runs, the spring freshets would carry them off to sea. I gathered up all the small articles lying around in the vicinity of the dead, I found the ice journal about three or four feet in the rear of DeLong. That is, it looked as though he had been lying down and with his left hand tossed the book over the shoulder to the rear or to the eastward of him. Referring to the journal, continues Melville, I found that the whole of the people were now in the lee of the bank in a distance of about 500 yards. In the meantime, the native that had gone for Nindemann had brought him back. The three bodies were all frozen fast to the snow, so fast that it was necessary to pry them loose with a stick of timber. In turning over Dr. Ambler, I was surprised to find DeLong's pistol in his right hand, and then, observing the blood-stained mouth and beard in snow, I at first thought that he had put a violent end to his misery. A careful examination, however, of the mouth and head revealed no wound, and releasing the pistol from its tenacious death grasp, I saw that only three of its chambers contained cartridges, which were all loaded, and then knew, of course, that he could not have harmed himself else one or more of the capsules would be empty. I believe him to have been the last of the unfortunate party to perish. When Ah Sam had been stretched out and his hands crossed upon his breast, the long apparently crawled away and died. Then, solitary and famishing in that desolate scene of death, Dr. Ambler seems to have taken the pistol from the corpse of DeLong doubtless in the hope that some bird or beast might come to prey upon the bodies and afford him food, perhaps alone to protect his dead comrades from molestation. In either case, or both, there he kept his lone watch to the last, on duty, on guard, under arms. It now remained but to find the other bodies and bury the dead. In due time this was accomplished. Melville writes of the spot chosen as follows. The burial ground is on a bold promontory with a perpendicular face overlooking the frozen polar sea. The rocky head of the mountain, cold, austere as the sphinx, frowns upon the spot where the party perished. And, considering its weather-beaten and time-worn aspect, it is altogether fitting that here they should rest. I attained the crest of the promontory by making a detour of several miles to the southward of its majestic front, and then toiling slowly to the top. Here I laid out by compass a due north and south line, and one due east and west, and where they intersected, I planted the cross which marks the tomb of my comrades. There, in sight of the spot where they fell, 
the scene of their suffering and heroic endeavor where the everlasting snows would be their winding sheet and the fierce polar blasts which pierced their poor unclad bodies in life would wail their wild dirge through all time there we buried them and surely heroes never found a fitter resting place lieutenant harbour was also in the field as was mr jackson correspondent of the new york herald a thorough search was made of the delta for chip's party without avail congress having appropriated twenty five thousand dollars for the expense of bringing home to america the bodies of de long and his unfortunate party lieutenant harbour and master schutze of the relief ship rogers which had been burned off the coast of siberia in december eighteen eighty one left the lena in eighteen eighty three after a year's search bringing with them the remains end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen part one of the great white north this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the great white north by helen s wright chapter nineteen part one international circumpolar stations failure of dutch expedition greeley expedition reaches lady franklin bay life at fort conger sledge journey of brainerd and lockwood farthest north greeley's journey to interior of grinnell land lake hazen failure of relief ship neptune to reach conger in eighteen eighty two official plans for greeley's relief in eighteen eighty three proteus crushed in ice garlington's retreat greeley's abandonment of fort conger greeley reaches cape sabine the beginning of a hard winter death of members of the party from starvation and cold shay's brilliant rescue of the remnant of the lady franklin bay expedition in eighteen eighty four the plan for establishing international circumpolar stations within or near the arctic circle for the purpose of recording a complete series of synchronous meteorological and magnetic observations was outlined in a well thought out paper delivered by lieutenant carl weyprecht a h navy before the german scientific and medical association of graz in september eighteen seventy five soon after the return from his remarkable journey in the tekethof though lieutenant weyprecht did not live to see his splendid scheme carried into effect the cooperation of prince bismarck and the hearty endorsement of the plan by a commission of eminent scientists as well as the decision of the international meteorological congress which reported that these observations will be of the highest importance in developing meteorology and in extending our knowledge of terrestrial magnetism resulted in the international polar conference at hamburg october one eighteen seventy nine in which eleven nations were represented and a second conference at bern august seventh eighteen eighty at which it was decided that each nation should establish one or more stations where synchronous observations should be taken from august eighteen eighty two with the exception of the dutch expedition the scheme was successfully carried out and the stations established without accident norwegians boskoff allen fjord norway under direction of m axel s steen swedes ice fjord spitzbergen under direction of mr eckholm russians 
Sagaster Island, mouth of Lena, Siberia, under Lieutenant Jurgitz. Russians, Muller Bay, Nova Zembla, under Lieutenant Andreev. Americans, Port Barrow, North America, under Lieutenant Ray, U.S. Army. Americans, Lady Franklin Bay, 81 degrees, 44 minutes north, under Lieutenant A.W. Greeley, U.S. Army. English, Great Slave Lake, Dominion of Canada, under Lieutenant Dawson. German, Cumberland Bay, west side of Davis Strait, under Dr. Giza. Danes, Gottdorp, Greenland, under A. Paulson. Austrian, Jan Mayen, North Atlantic, 71 degrees north, under Lieutenant Volkermuth, A. H. Navy. As to the unsuccessful Dutch expedition, the Varna sailed from Amsterdam July 5, 1882, bound for Dixon Harbor, but was beset in the Kara Sea in September. She was crushed in December 1882 when the crew took refuge on board Lieutenant Hofgaard's vessel, the Dimpfna, which had also been forced to winter in the pack. Nevertheless, Dr. Snellen did his utmost to procure regular observations from their besetment until the following August, when they started by boat and sledge for the coast of Nova Zembla. By August 25th, they reached the south point of Legat Island, where they met the Nordenskjold and were safely landed in Hammerfest, September 1st, 1883. The inestimable value of the combined and systematic record of the scientific observations secured by the international circumpolar stations is a matter of public record. The success was complete, and all but the American nation might well be proud of the management and protection offered to the fearless men detailed to the splendid work. The unparalleled disaster which overtook the Lady Franklin Bay expedition under Lieutenant Greeley and his brave companions, through no fault of their own, but by a series of mismanaged accidents, for which there was neither excuse nor condemnation, leaves a blot upon the American records which the centuries cannot obliterate. If the simple and necessary precaution had been taken, writes Markham, brother of the famous explorer, of stationing a depot ship in a good harbor at the entrance of Smith Sound, in annual communication with Greeley on one side and with America on the other, there would have been no disaster. And he continues, if precautions proved to be necessary by experience are taken, there is no undue risk or danger in polar enterprises. There is no question as to the value and importance of polar discovery and as to the principles on which expeditions should be sent out. Their objects are explorations for scientific purposes and the encouragement of maritime enterprise. Lieutenant Greeley's party consisted of three officers besides the commander, 19 men of the army, including an astronomer, a photographer, and meteorologist, and two Eskimos, sailing from St. John's, Newfoundland, July 7, 1881. They were conveyed in the sealer Proteus to Littleton Island, where they hunted up the mail of the alert and discovery, then proceeded in open water to Cape Lieber, 81 degrees, 37 minutes north. There the ship was delayed by encountering ice in Hall Basin. By August 11th, she had pushed through and safely landed the party at the old winter quarters of the discovery in 1875 to 1876. Immediate preparations were made for building a house, and after all supplies were landed, the Proteus sailed home, leaving Lieutenant Greeley and his party at Fort Conger. 
indications of approaching winter appeared as early as august twenty seventh and the season proved one of unusual severity sledge journeys hunting parties and exploring trips combined with regular duties scientific observations exercise and moderate amusements ensured the party a season of successful labor and good health traveling in one instance a week in another ten days in frightful temperatures averaging seventy three degrees below freezing lieutenant lockwood and dr o pavy surgeon of the expedition with their companions endured the severity with surprising energy the ice conditions of robeson channel were ascertained and depots established at cape sumner for use in the following spring the sun left on october fifteenth and was absent one hundred and thirty-five days the curious effect upon the mind produced by the long arctic night is recorded in december about the tenth writes lieutenant greeley in his report a few of the men gave indications of being affected by the continual darkness but such signs soon disappeared and cheerful spirits returned the eskimos appeared to be the most affected on the thirteenth jens edward disappeared leaving the station in early morning without mittens and without breakfast sending two parties with lanterns to describe a half-mile circle around the station his tracks were soon found leading towards the straits he was at once pursued and was overtaken about ten miles from the station near cape murchison he returned to the station without objection and in time recovered his spirits no cause for his action in this respect could be ascertained dr pavy who had spent the previous year among the eskimos said that this state of mind was not infrequent among the natives of lower greenland and often resulted in the wandering off of the subjects of it and if not followed by their perishing in the cold as early as february nineteenth eighteen eighty two lockwood and brainard made a dog sledge trip to one of the depots deposited the previous autumn a journey over the foot ice of twenty miles on the twenty ninth of february lieutenant lockwood accompanied by brainard four other men and two dog teams made an experimental trip to thank god harbor preparatory to his proposed grand expedition along the coast to northern greenland visiting the grave of charles francis hall lockwood wrote in his journal the following touching tribute the headboard erected by his comrades as also the metallic one left by the english still stands how mournful to me the scene made more so by the howling of the winds and the thick atmosphere it was doubtless best that he died where he did i have come to regard him as a visionary and an enthusiast who was indebted more to fortune than to those practical abilities which cain possessed yet he gave his life to the cause and that must always go far toward redeeming the shortcomings of any man the concluding lines of the inscription on the english tablet i think good to captain hall who sacrificed his life in the advancement of science november eighth eighteen seventy one this tablet has been erected by the british polar expedition of eighteen seventy which followed in his footsteps and profited by his experience dr pavy accompanied by sergeant rice and eskimo jens with a dog sledge started march nineteenth eighteen eighty two for the north of grinnell land 
a supporting sledge under Sergeant Jewell accompanied him as far as Lincoln Bay. On April 1st, an unfortunate accident to the sledge runner caused a five days delay at Cape Union. Sergeant Rice and Eskimo Jens made a forced march back to Fort Conger and secured a new runner. Storms retarded their advance, but in spite of the rough condition of the ice, all supplies were brought up to Cape Joseph Henry and left there April 20th. Two days later, a violent storm set in, and after it subsided, the party pushed on toward Cape Hecla. A lane of open water was seen extending from Crozier Island round Cape Hecla. As this channel rapidly increased in width, a retreat was decided on, but to his consternation, before land could be reached, Dr. Pavy found himself adrift on a flow in the polar ocean. Fortunately, the flow was driven against the land near Cape Henry, and after abandoning all articles not absolutely indispensable, he escaped to the mainland, but was obliged to give up further explorations. In the meantime, Lieutenant Lockwood had completed his preparations, and the advance party consisting of Sergeant Brainerd and nine men dragging four Hudson Bay sledges left Fort Conger April 3, 1882, to be followed the next day by Lieutenant Lockwood with two men and one dog sledge under instructions to explore the coast of Greenland near Cape Britannia in such direction as he thought best to carry out the objects of the main expedition. The extension of knowledge regarding lands within the Arctic Circle. The 5th of April, Lockwood joined the advance party at Depot A. On the afternoon of the 8th, they reached Cape Sumner. Bags of pemmican were added to the sledge loads for dog food. The parties encountered violent gales and extreme cold, 81 degrees below freezing, as they pushed on to Newman Bay. The hard experience of sledge travel was already telling upon the men, and at this point, four were sent back, being unfit for continued field work. Pushing on for Repulse Harbor, with 300 rations and eight men, Lockwood advanced in the face of storms, rough ice, and broken sledges at the average rate of nine miles per day. The men suffered much from snow blindness and the unwanted fatigue of dragging the heavy sledges through areas of soft, deep snow. At Cape Bryant, which was reached April 27th, a rest of two days was taken, during which Raynard, with two companions, visited the highest point of Cape Tolford. On the 29th of May, Lieutenant Lockwood sent back the supporting sledgemen and, with Brainerd and the Eskimo Christensen, the dog sledge and 25 days' rations, pursued his journey north across the polar ocean to Cape Britannia, which was reached May 5th after six journeys, the last a very short one. From the top of the mountains, 2,050 feet, writes Lockwood, which forms Cape Britannia, I got a good view all around. Towards the northeast lay a succession of headlands and inlets as far as I could see, some fifteen or twenty miles, and this was the character of the coast beyond as far as I got. They had followed out the letter of their instructions and had reached the destination mentioned therein but finding it possible to continue their explorations, 
they pushed on over land never before explored by man crossing the frozen ocean and reaching mary murray island the tenth of may the party were now suffering from cold and insufficient food to husband their rations they had eaten very little of late the dogs were ravenous for food and when feeding time came it was amid blows from the men and fights among the dogs that the distribution was made in spite of serious delays by violent wind and storms by floes so high that the sledge was lowered by dog traces by ice so rough as to necessitate the use of the axe before they could advance and by widening water cracks which delayed their progress these men pushed boldly on and on may fifteenth eighteen eighty two made a world's record reaching on that day lockwood island eighty three degrees twenty four minutes north latitude forty two degrees forty six minutes west longitude gaining a considerable elevation lockwood unfurled mrs greeley's pretty little silken flag and for the first time in two hundred and seventy-five years another nation than england claimed the honors of the farthest north and the union jack gave way to the stars and stripes from this point the most northerly land seen was cape washington beyond to the north lay an unbroken expanse of ice interrupted only by the horizon haven coast trended to the northeast in a succession of high rocky and precipitous promontories evidences of vegetation and game were found in this high latitude lemmings ptarmigan foxes and hares found their way to these desolate shores and small plants struggled for a foothold in the uncongenial soil as we think of lockwood writes charles landman his biographer at the end of his journey with only two companions in that land of utter desolation we are struck with admiration at the courage and manly spirit by which he was inspired biting cold fearful storms gloomy darkness the dangers of starvation and sickness all combined to block his ice pathway and yet he persevered and accomplished his heroic purpose thereby winning a place in history of which his countrymen may well and will be proud to the end of time the return was even more arduous than the advance and as they pursued their weary trail thoughts wandered to home and creature comforts what thoughts one has when thus plodding along writes lockwood in his journal home and everything there and the scenes and incidents of early youth home again when this arctic experience shall be a thing of the past but it must be confessed and lamentable it is as well as true that the reminiscences to which my thoughts often most recur on these occasions are connected with eating the favorite dishes i have enjoyed while in dreams of the future my thoughts turn from other contemplations to the discussion of beefsteak and equally absurd to whether the stew and tea at our next supper will be hot or cold joining the supporting party at cape sumner the entire party suffering from exhaustion and snow blindness reached fort conquer june first eighteen eighty two during the absence of lockwood lieutenant greeley had left fort conquer april twenty sixth eighteen eighty two and penetrated grinnell land reaching lake hazen a glacial lake some five hundred square miles in area 
Lake Hazen was again visited by Greeley in June, following up Very River to its source. The farthest reached was 175 miles from the home station between Mount C. A. Arthur and Mount C. S. Smith, which evidently formed the divide of Grinnell Land between Kennedy Channel to the east and the Polar Ocean to the west. Ascending Mount C. A. Arthur, the highest peak of Grinnell Land, Greeley stood 4,500 feet above the sea and saw to the north of Lake Hazen snow-clad mountains and distant country to the southwest was also covered with eternal snows. Lieutenant Lockwood subsequently supplemented Greeley's discoveries of the interior of Grinnell Land with the result that jointly 6,000 square miles of territory was examined, an accomplishment which determines the remarkable physical conditions of North Grinnell Land. It brought to light fertile valleys supporting herds of musk oxen and extensive ice cap, rivers of considerable size, and a glacial lake hazen of extensive area. Traces of Eskimos having wintered at Lake Hazen, as shown by permanent huts, were a source of surprise to the explorers. Successful to such a degree as were these geographical explorations, writes Greeley. They were strictly subordinated to the obligatory observations in the interests of the physical sciences. Systematic and unremitting magnetic observations served to round out knowledge by enabling scientists to calculate the secular variation of the magnetic declination of the Smith Sound region. Apart from the general value of the meteorological series, it has most fully determined the climactic conditions of Grinnell Land. The tidal observations were so complete at the station and so amply supplemented by outlying stations that scientists have determined not only the co-tidal lines of the polar ocean with satisfactory results, but also learned from them that the diurnal inequality of the tidal wave conforms at Fort Conger to the sidereal day. The pendulum observations have been classed as far the best that have ever been made within the Arctic Circle, and the determination of gravity therefrom has been singularly successful. Botanical, zoological, and anthropological researches were pursued with similar unremitting attention, so that the scientific work of the expedition may be considered as satisfactory and complete, especially in view of the high latitude of the station. Summer had passed, and though the men had scanned the horizon, long and earnestly for promised relief no ship reached them a second winter passed in the slow monotony characteristic of the arctic night in order to facilitate his retreat in case the relief vessel of eighteen eighty three failed to reach him freely laid down stores at cape baird before the sun returned in february 1883. Under his orders, Lieutenant Greeley was to abandon Fort Conger not later than September 1st and retreat southward by boat until he met the relief vessel or Littleton Island was reached, where he would find a fresh party with fresh stores awaiting him. As early as December 2nd, 1881, Active steps were taken at the War Department in Washington for the relief vessel of 1882. Estimates for an appropriation of $33,000 asked for, and negotiations for supplies opened with firms at St. John's and with the Danish government for stores to be delivered in Greenland. 
in May 1882, a board of officers attached to the Signal Service met at Washington to consider plans for the relief expedition. And the ultimate result was that the sailing from St. John's, Newfoundland, on July 8, 1882, of the sealing vessel Neptune, with Mr. William M. Beebe, Jr., a private in general service, and formerly secretary to the chief signal officer in charge of the relief work. The Neptune touched at Godhaven on the 17th and took on supplies, then directing her course slowly and with difficulty across Melville Bay, she came in sight of Cape York on the 25th. Littleton Island was reached on the 29th, where she was blocked by ice and obliged to return and anchor in pandora harbor the next forty days the neptune made fruitless efforts to enter cane sea in the course of her many failures to penetrate to the north she found anchorage between cape sabine Revoort island where Beebe examined the english cache made by the discovery in eighteen seventy five this cache of so much importance to Greeley's men later was found to contain one barrel of canned beef, two tins, forty pounds each, of bacon, one barrel, one hundred and ten pounds, dog biscuit, two barrels, one hundred and twenty rations each, biscuit, all in good condition, two hundred and forty rations consisting of chocolate and sugar, tea and sugar potatoes wicks tobacco salt stearin onion powder and matches in fairly good condition Beebe failed to leave any provisions of his own on august twenty fifth after a fourth trial to penetrate the pack the neptune returned to littleton island with the intention of making depots natives being in the vicinity who in all probability would steal any deposits left Beebe concluded to postpone making the cash and proceeded to cape sabine here he deposited according to his orders two hundred and fifty rations one-eighth of a cord of birch wood and a whale boat the neptune then made a fifth attempt to penetrate the pack and again on September 2nd, her sixth and final effort. Finding it impossible to advance, she returned to Littleton Island, and a second depot of 250 rations was cached. She now started on her homeward voyage, September 5, 1882, Beebe having carried out to the letter his instructions from the signal office for the relief of the lady franklin bay expedition and left two depots of two hundred and fifty rations or ten days supply returned to st john's carrying safely from the barren shores of the arctic two thousand rations or a full supply for three months the return of the relief party of eighteen eighty two made the expedition that was to follow the next summer one of grave importance in the course of official communication on the subject between the chief signal officer and the secretary of war general hazen stated that it is most desirable that the officer and the enlisted men who are to go next year be detailed as early as practicable in order that they may be trained and have experience in rowing and managing boats and in the use of boat compasses it is desirable that men be selected whose service has been in the northwest and it is also important that the entire party before going should be familiar with boats and their management under all conditions in the secretary's reply the suggestion is volunteered 
it seems that it would be much more desirable to endeavor to procure from the navy the persons who are needed for this relief party to this general hazen made answer to change the full control of this duty now would be swapping horses while crossing the stream and when in the middle of the stream to manage it with mixed control or even with mixed arms of the service under a single control would be hazardous and such action is strongly advised against by the many persons of both army and navy i have discussed the subject with the ready knowledge of boats and instruments is but a very small part of the indispensable requisites in this case this whole work has required a great deal of attention and study from the first and i have not a doubt but that any transfer of control now would result in failure to convey all the threads of this half-finished work and that it would work disastrously in many ways in view of these facts i would consider the transfer now of any part of the work to any other control as very hazardous and without any apparent promise of advantage first lieutenant ernest a garlington of the seventh cavalry having volunteered his services was ordered february sixth eighteen eighty three to report at washington since his graduation from the military academy in eighteen seventy six he had served with his regiment at fort buford dakota territory four enlisted men who had volunteered were also ordered from dakota the proteus was chartered and made ready for her voyage a request was made by the chief signal officer on the fourteenth of may that a navy vessel should be detailed for service in connection with the expedition as escort to bring back information render assistance and take such other steps as might be necessary in case of unforeseen emergencies the yantic under commander frank wilds was selected and underwent such preparation as the limited time permitted garlington was instructed to examine if possible all depots of provisions and replace any damaged articles of food and if the proteus could not get through the party and stores should be landed at lifeboat cove the vessel sent back and the party should remain the yantic was to accompany the proteus as far as littleton island and render such assistance as might become necessary lieutenant j c caldwell of the navy having volunteered his services was detailed to accompany garlington the proteus and the yantic left st john's the twenty ninth of june eighteen eighty three and were soon out of sight of each other the proteus encountered ice in melville bay garlington examined the nares cache of eighteen hundred rations on southeast gary island sixty per cent of the rations proving to be in good condition there is no record that the forty per cent were replaced from the proteus's stores littleton island was passed without a cache being left there the ice prevented an advance and garlington thereupon decided to go to cape sabine to examine cache there leave records and await further developments at half past three the proteus came to anchor at payer harbor reichschley she remained at her anchorage from three thirty to eight p m the stay of four hours and a half at cape sabine was a turning point in the history of the relief expedition it was made up of golden moments it is true that no one could predict 
that by that time next day the Proteus would be at the bottom of the Kane Sea. It is also true that Garlington's instructions had been officially construed as not including the formation of depots on the way north, and that the importance of reaching Lady Franklin Bay had been impressed upon his mind as the main purpose of his enterprise. At the same time, it was known with tolerable certainty that two months later Greeley would be at that point if he carried out his intentions and the commander of the relief expedition although not expressly directed to land anywhere had been instructed that if landing should be made at points where caches of provisions were located he was if possible to examine them and replace any damaged articles of food now there were two caches at or near cape sabine one of them left by Bibi the year before was around the point of the cape the other left by naris in eighteen seventy five was on stalknecht island a long low rock in the harbour itself due west from brevoort island and close to it the position of the cache was well known Bibi had visited it in eighteen eighty two the proteus was now at payer harbour probably within half a mile of Stalknecht Island, and on board the vessel were the four depots of provisions of 250 rations each that had been arranged at Disco to be in readiness for landing at some tune and at any time. Garlington ordered two privates to land and take a set of observations while he went with a party of men to examine the caches the repair of a cache and the set of observations are all the work reported as having been done at cape sabine on the way north garlington then put to sea and followed the open leads of water to the northward after an advance of twenty miles the ship was stopped by the pack near cape albert the following day she was crushed and the crew and relief party took to the floe throwing overboard such stores and provisions as came to hand lieutenant colwell was the last man to leave the ship garlington and his party of fifteen men two whaleboats and provisions for forty days reached cape sabine in safety he now followed the wilds garlington agreement which said should proteus be lost push a boat with party south to yantic garlington's record left by him on brevoort island read in part depot landed five hundred rations of bread tea and a lot of canned goods cache of two hundred and fifty rations left by expedition of eighteen eighty two visited by me and found in good condition english depot in damaged condition not visited by me cash on littleton island boat at isabella u s s yantic on her way to littleton island with orders not to enter ice i will endeavour to communicate with these vessels at once everything in power of man will be done to rescue the greeley's brave men it transpired writes greeley that there was no boat at isabella that garlington's orders to replace damaged caches were imperative and disobeyed that he had no knowledge that the littleton cache was safe that at sabine he took every pound of food he could reach though told that greeley was provisioned only to august eighteen eighty three and that after colwell's skill had brought garlington safe to the yantic he did not even ask wilde to go north and lay down food for greeley otherwise doomed to starvation on september thirteenth eighteen eighty three garlington wrote from st john's newfoundland to the chief signal officer u s army washington it is my painful duty to report total failure of the expedition the proteus was crushed in pack in latitude seventy degrees fifty two minutes 
longitude 74 degrees 25 minutes and sunk on the afternoon of the 23rd july my party and crew all saved made my way across smith sound and along eastern shore of cape york thence across melville bay to upernavik arriving there on twenty fourth of august the yantic reached upernavik second of september and left same day bringing entire party here to-day all well to telegraphic inquiries from the signal office asking what stores had been left for greeley came answer no stores landed before sinking of ship about five hundred rations from those saved cached at cape sabine also large cache of clothing by the time suitable vessels could be procured filled provisioned etc it would be too late in the season to accomplish anything this year we leave to the imagination the alarm aroused by the sudden realization of what this failure meant to our fellow countrymen at fort conger from july eighteen eighty two to august eighteen eighty three not less than fifty thousand rations were taken in the steamers neptune yantic and proteus up to or beyond littleton island and of that number about one thousand were left in that vicinity the remainder being returned to the united states or sunk with the proteus the date of garlington's letter read september thirteenth with what horror did it dawn upon the public mind that the abandonment of the well-supplied station at fort conger was ordered not later than september first even now greeley and his men leaving behind them a scant year's army rations and carrying with them every pound of food possible were making their hazardous retreat in heavily laden boats through waterways crowded with ice acted on by strong currents and high winds the recurring heavy gales keeping the pack in constant motion to and fro against the precipitous and rock-bound coast time and again writes greeley only the most desperate efforts and measures secured the safety of the specially strengthened launch while the whaleboat escaped destruction only by speedy unloading and drawing up on floes every cache however small was taken up ending with damaged mouldy bread etc at cape hawks end of chapter nineteen part one chapter nineteen part two of the great white north this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the great white north by helen s wright chapter nineteen part two international circumpolar stations fort conger had been abandoned august ninth eighteen eighty three on september thirteenth the whaleboat had been left behind afterward recovered and the men were fighting their desperate way across the pack to the shore the following day greeley made this entry in his journal the absence of sufficient light to cast a shadow has had very unfortunate results as several of the men in the past few days have been sadly bruised or strained when no shadows form and the light is feeble and blended there is the same uncertainty about one's walk as if the deepest darkness prevailed the most careful observation fails to advise you as to whether the next step is to be on a level up an incline or over a precipice these conditions are perhaps the most trying to sergeant brainard who being in advance selecting our road finds it necessary to travel as rapidly as possible a few bad falls quite demoralize a man 
and make him more than ever doubtful of his senses traveling slowly with our heavily laden sledges we rarely suffer much from this trouble as our steps are slow and uncertain at the best but when a jar does come on a man pooling his best it gives his system a great shock and strain on september seventeenth all articles that were not of vital importance were abandoned and yet the men were hauling about six thousand pounds at the end of a weary day sergeant brainerd wrote in his journal turned in at eleven p m after ten hours of the severest physical strain as the sleeping bags of those of us in the teepee are protected from the ice by only one thickness of canvas our comfort can be imagined three days later he adds we are now carrying burdens which would crush ordinary men but the texture of the party is of the right sort and adversity will have very little effect upon our spirits on september twenty ninth eighteen eighty three greeley made a landing at a point midway between cape sabine and isabella after fifty-one days of the most arduous travel the retreat from conger to cape sabine writes greeley involved over four hundred miles travel by boats and fully a hundred with sledge and boat the greater part of which was made under circumstances of such great peril or imminence of danger as to test to the utmost the courage coolness and endurance of any party and the capacity of any commander as to my officers and men it is but scant justice to say that they faced resolutely every danger endured cheerfully every hardship and were fully equal to every emergency and they were many of our eventful retreat on october fifth lieutenant lockwood says we have now three chances for our lives first finding american cash sufficient at sabine or at isabella second by crossing the straits when our present rations are gone third of shooting sufficient seal and walrus nearby here to last during the winter our situation is certainly alarming in the extreme these men were shelterless with but a small food supply with impassable barriers of ice north and south some hunted on land others on ice some put up stone huts others searched for cairns and records the arctic night had settled upon them before their huts were barely finished these huts of heavy granite stones dug from the snow and ice lifted with swollen and bleeding hands put in place with back-breaking efforts by enfeebled weary men and into them they crawled with torn clothing hand and foot gear in holes covering shivering aching bodies in this desperate plight scouts returned with news of the sinking of the proteus and with the notice from lieutenant garlington describing the disaster his plans and his retreat and the caches of provisions at cape sabine relying on the expressed promise that everything within the power of man will be done to rescue the brave men at fort conger from their perilous position greeley at once endeavored to move his party near that point camp clay was established on bedford pym island which was reached october fifteenth with forty days rations to tide over two hundred and fifty days of darkness and misery until help could come another hut was erected by the same arduous methods employed in building former huts the rock walls were about two feet thick and three feet high outside this wall was an embankment of snow at first four feet thick but as the season advanced the winter gales buried the hut entirely in snow the whale-boat just caught on the end walls 
and under that boat was the only place in which a man could even get on his knees and hold himself erect. Sitting in our bags, the heads of the tall men touched the roof. Compared to our previous quarters, writes Greeley, the house is warm, but we are so huddled and crowded together that the confinement is almost intolerable. The men, though wretched from cold, hard work and hunger, yet retain their spirits wonderfully. It now behooved the party to gather in the stores from all the caches, and this was done under the most trying conditions. The news of the loss of the Jeanette was learned by a newspaper found among the stores and brought in with other articles. Records and instruments of the Lady Franklin Bay expedition were safely cached early in October on Stalknecht Island. During the few remaining days of flight, the hunter, long with the Eskimo, remained out of the flow in the intense cold, ill-fed, without shelter, for the purpose of securing seals or other game that might be seen. A seal was all that was secured under the most trying circumstances. When certain of the stores were examined to ascertain their condition, the dog biscuits were evidently bad, but when this bread, thoroughly rotten and covered with green mold, was thrown on the ground, the half-famished men sprang to it as wild animals would. October 26th, 1883 marked the last day of sunlight for 110 days. The hunters still pursued their labors, but without success. However, on the last day of the month, Bender was fortunate enough to kill a blue fox with his fist. It was caught with its head in a meat can. All rations had been collected except 144 pounds of beef, cached by Norris in 1875, 40 miles distant at Cape Isabella. A further reduction of the quantity of food served to each man was inaugurated November 1st. The following day, Rice, Frederick, Ellison, and Lynn started in the Arctic night for Cape Isabella. On the fifth day out, they reached their destination after the most hazardous travel in temperatures ranging from minus 20 degrees to minus 25 degrees, with only 16 ounces of food per day to each man. Taking up their cache of meat, they started on their return journey. On reaching their first camp after 14 hours of hard travel, Ellison, who had done this day's work on a cup of tea and no food, was found to have frozen both his hands and feet. Our sleeping bag was no more nor less than a sheet of ice, writes Frederick in his journal. I placed one of Ellison's hands between my thighs and Rice took the other, and in this way we drew the frost from his poor frozen limbs. This poor fellow cried all night from pain. This was one of the worst nights I ever spent in the Arctic. Continuing the next two days with their half-frozen comrade, they reached Eskimo Point. Here they cut up an abandoned iceboat for fuel and endeavored to thaw out Ellison's limbs and dry his clothing. When the poor fellow's face, feet, and hands commenced to thaw from the artificial heat, says Frederick, his sufferings were such that it was enough to bring the strongest to tears. After laboring nineteen hours for the welfare of their suffering comrade, Rice and Frederick attempted to advance. We tried to keep Allison in front of us, but to no avail. He would stagger off to one side, and it seemed every moment that the frost was striking deeper into the poor man's flesh. We fastened a rope to his arm, then the sledge, as it now took three men to haul our load, but every few rods the poor fellow would fall and then sometimes he was dragged several feet. No person can imagine how that poor man suffered. Unable to haul Ellison any farther in the face of a gale 
and the piercing temperature of minus 20 degrees. It was decided that Rice should start for Camp Clay for assistance. With only a bit of frozen meat for food, he started alone in the Arctic darkness and traveled 25 miles in 16 hours, reaching the camp at midnight. Immediate relief was started, Sergeant Brainerd and Christensen leading the advance to be followed two hours later by Lieutenant Lockwood, the doctor, and four of the men. The fearful night spent by Frederick, Lynn, and their frozen companion can hardly be pictured. We tried to warm him, says Frederick, but as we lay helpless and shivering with the cold, and poor Allison groaning with hunger, his frozen lips did not permit him to gnaw the frozen meat and pain you can imagine how we felt lynn was a strong able-bodied man but the mental strain caused by ellison's sufferings made him weak and helpless in fact i was afraid that his mind would be impaired at one time we were but a few hours in the bag when it became frozen so hard that we could not turn over and we had to lay in one position eighteen hours until to our great relief we heard brainard's cheering voice at our side there was nothing more welcome than the presence of that noble man who had come in advance with brandy for ellison and food for all the rescue party although weak and half starved themselves reached ellison with all dispatch to find him in a very critical condition his hands and feet were frozen solid his face frozen to such an extent that there was little semblance of humanity if november was ushered in with such misfortune the succeeding months record a history of unparalleled misery and suffering the hunters were ever on the alert and the occasional game brought in was the only cheer that surrounded these famishing outcasts a seal a bear a few boxes dovekies and ptarmigan were all that the desolate land gave forth to the unremitting vigilance of the hunters and reduced to the last extremities of famine shrimps seaweed reindeer moss saxifrage and lichens were diligently sought for and devoured on thanksgiving day what irony in the mere name these men celebrated by a little extra allowance of food and greeley wrote in his journal to-day we have been almost happy and had almost enough to eat on december ninth there is rejoicing because brainerd and long shot two blue foxes we are all very weak writes lieutenant lockwood ten days later and i feel an apathy and cloudiness impossible to shake off it is a great difficulty to know each night just how much bread to save for breakfast on the morrow hunger to-night fights hunger to-morrow morning i always eat my bread regretfully if i eat it before tea i regret that i did not keep it and if i wait until tea comes and then eat it i drink my tea hastily and do not get the satisfaction i otherwise would what a miserable life when a few crumbs of bread weigh so on one's mind it seems to be so with all the rest all sorts of expedients are tried to cheat one's stomach but with about the same result on december twenty first lieutenant greeley says sergeant brainerd is twenty-seven to-day i gave him half a gill of rum extra on that account regretting my inability to do more for him he has worked exceedingly hard for us this winter and while all have done their best his endurance unusual equanimity of temper 
and impartial justice in connection with the food have been of invaluable service to me. Moldy hard bread and two cans of soup make a dinner for twelve, says Brainerd. At Fort Conger, ten cans of soup were needed to begin dinner. But even the dire calamity which now confronts us is insufficient to repress the great flow of good nature in our party generally. A terrible scene occurred in our wretched hut during the morning, writes Brainerd, March 24, 1884. While preparing breakfast, tea, the cooks had forgotten to remove the bundle of rags from the ventilators in the roof, and the fumes thrown off by the alcohol lamps being confined to the small breathing space soon produced asphyxia. Beaterbick, one of the cooks, was the first to succumb to its effects, and Israel immediately afterwards became insensible. At the suggestion of Gardiner, all the rest of us rushed for the door and the plugs were at once removed from the roof and the lamps extinguished. By prompt attention, Dr. Pavy succeeded in reviving Israel and Beaterbick. Those who went outside were less fortunate than those who fainted in their bags. As soon as they came in contact with the pure outside air, all strength departed and they fell down on the snow in an unconscious state. In consequence of the absence of all animation, many of us were frostbitten, Lieutenant Greeley and myself quite severely. The lives of several of the men were probably saved through the noble efforts of Gardiner, who, though weak and sick, did all in his power to get us in the hut. During the excitement of the hour, about half a pound of bacon was stolen from Lieutenant Greeley's mess, and as soon as the fact became known, great indignation was expressed that in our midst lived a man with nature so vile and corrupt, so utterly devoid of all feelings of humanity, as to steal from his starving companions when they were thought to be dying. A deed so contemptible and heartless could not long remain concealed from those who had been injured. We were not disappointed in the discovery that Henry was the thief. He had literally bolted the bacon, and his stomach was overloaded to such a degree that, in its enfeebled state, it could not retain this unusual quantity of food, and his crime was thus detected. Jens afterwards reported having seen him commit the theft, and illustrated by signs his manner of doing it. Poor suffering Ellison, he writes a few days later. This morning he turned to the doctor and said, my toes are burning dreadfully and the soles of my feet are itching in a very uncomfortable manner. Can you not do something to relieve this irritation? He little dreams that he has neither toes nor feet, they having sloughed off in January. On March 21st, Greeley makes this entry. A storm prevents hunting. It is surprising with what calmness we view death, which, strongly as we may hope, seems now inevitable. As the gaunt and ghostly form of death laid its fatal touch upon the weakest one by one, a strong man stole food from comrades and stole again and justly forfeited his right to live. Then, one by one, they died, the Eskimo Christensen from exhaustion, and Lynn. He asked for water just before dying, and we had none to give. 
then Rice sacrificed his life for others, dying in the arms of his comrade Frederick near Baird Inlet, where he had gone in search of a hundred pounds of English beef abandoned in November that Ellison might be brought to camp alive. Then Lockwood died and Jewel failed and soon joined his sleeping comrades and yet in face of horror crowding upon horror there is an entry on easter sunday we heard on our roof a snowbird chirping loudly the first harbinger of spring in the meantime the chief dependence of this rapidly diminishing party was derived from the gathering of shrimps or sea lice the small crustacea were from one-eighth to one-half of an inch in length consisting of about four-fifths shell and one-fifth meat and about seven hundred of them were required to weigh an ounce dr pavy says writes brainerd in his journal may twentieth eighteen eighty four that our food must be something more substantial than these shrimps or none of us can live long i caught twelve pounds of these animals to-day and one pound of marine vegetation returned very much exhausted from this trip cannot last much longer caterpillars are now quite numerous on the bare spots of cemetery bridge he writes a day or two later yesterday bender saw one of these animals crawling over a rock near the tent and after watching it intently for a moment he hastily transferred it to his mouth remarking as he did so this is too much meat to lose on may twenty ninth there was a southeast gale and drifting snow brainerd and long returned from their day's hunting with a few pounds of shrimps and a donkey on returning to the tent writes brainerd dr pavy and laylor refused to admit me to their sleeping bag in which i occupied a place physically i could not enforce my rights in this matter my condition bordering on extreme exhaustion and wishing to avoid any unpleasantness i crawled into one of the abandoned bags lying outside as the only alternative this bag was frozen and filled with snow can my sufferings be imagined they certainly cannot be described suffering with rheumatism and smarting under the sense of wrong done me by my sleeping bag companions mental agony was added to physical torture to-day i caught six pounds of shrimps this evening june sixth dinner consisted of a stew composed of two boot soles a handful of reindeer moss and a few rock lichens the small quantity of shrimps which i furnish daily are sufficient only for the morning meal wednesday june eleventh eighteen eighty four long returned at one thirty a m from the open water bringing with him two fine guillemots which he had killed one of these was given to the general mass and the other will be divided among those who are doing the heavy work for their weaker companions this evening a great misfortune befell me the spring tides have broken out the ice at the shrimping place and my nets have been carried away and lost my baits poor and miserable as they were are gone also it is anything but pleasant to reflect that to-morrow morning we will have no breakfast except a cup of tea it was quite late when i returned this evening from shrimping and everybody had retired i did not have the heart to awaken the 
poor fellows but i let them sleep on quietly under the delusion that breakfast would await them at the usual hour in the morning how i pity them i made a flag or distress signal as it might be more properly termed which i intend placing on the high rocky point just north of our tent where it may be seen by any vessel passing cape sabine ten days later the whistle of the thetis blown by captain schley's orders to recall his searching parties fell lightly on the ears of the dying commander of the lady franklin bay expedition i feebly asked brainard and long if they had strength to go out writes greeley and they answered as always that they would do their best from the cutter as it entered the cove lieutenant colwell straining his eyes recognized the familiar landmarks of the year before there on the top of the little ridge fifty or sixty yards above the ice foot was plainly outlined the figure of a man instantly the coxswain caught up the boat hook and waved the flag the man on the ridge had seen them for he stooped picked up a signal flag from the rock and waved it in reply then he was seen coming slowly and cautiously down the steep rocky slope twice he fell down before he reached the foot as he approached still walking feebly and with difficulty colwell hailed him from the bow of the boat who all are there left seven left as the cutter struck the ice continues schley colwell jumped off and went up to him he was a ghastly sight his cheeks were hollow his eyes wild his hair and beard long and matted his army blouse covering several thicknesses of shirts and jackets was ragged and dirty he wore a little fur cap and rough moccasins of untanned leather tied around the leg as he spoke his utterance was thick and mumbling and in his agitation his jaws worked in convulsive twitches as the two met the man with the sudden impulse took off his glove and shook colwell's hand where are they asked colwell briefly in the tent said the man pointing over his shoulder over the hill the tent is down is mr greeley alive yes greeley's alive any other officers no then he repeated absently the tent is down who are you long before this colloquy was over low and norman had started up the hill hastily filling his pockets with bread and taking the two cans of pemmican colwell told the coxswain to take long into the cutter and started after the others with ash reaching the crest of the ridge and looking southward they saw spread out before them a desolate expanse of rocky ground sloping gradually from a ridge on the east to the ice-covered shore which at the west made in and formed a cove back of the level space was a range of hills rising up eight hundred feet with a precipitous face broken in two by a gorge through which the wind was blowing furiously on a little elevation directly in front was the tent hurrying on across the intervening hollow colwell came up with low and norman just as they were greeting a soldierly-looking man who had come out of the tent as colwell approached norman was saying to the man there is the lieutenant 
and he added to Caldwell, This is Sergeant Brainerd. Brainerd immediately drew himself up to the position of the soldier and was about to salute when Caldwell took his hand. At this moment, there was a confused murmur within the tent, and a voice said, Who's there? Norman answered, It's Norman, Norman who was in the Proteus. This was followed by cries of, Oh, it's Norman, and a sound like a feeble cheer. Meanwhile, one of the relief party, who in his agitation and excitement was crying like a child, was down on his hands and knees, trying to roll away the stones that held down the flapping tent cloth. There was no entrance except under the flap opening, which was held down by stones. Caldwell called for a knife, cut a slit in the tent cover, and looked in. It was a sight of horror, continues Schley. On one side, close to the opening, with his head toward the outside, lay what was apparently a dead man. His jaw had dropped, his eyes were open but fixed and glassy, his limbs were motionless. On the opposite side was a poor fellow, alive, to be sure, but without hands or feet, and with a spoon tied to the stump of his right arm. Two others, seated on the ground in the middle, had just got down a rubber bottle that hung on the tent pole and were pouring from it into a tin can. Directly opposite, on his hands and knees, was a dark man with a long matted beard in a dirty and tattered dressing gown with a little red skull cap on his head and brilliant staring eyes. As Caldwell appeared, he raised himself a little and put on a pair of eyeglasses. Who are you? asked Caldwell. The man made no answer, staring at him vacantly. Who are you? Again, one of the men spoke up. That's the major, Major Greeley. Caldwell crawled in and took him by the hand, saying to him, Greeley, is this you? Yes, said Greeley in a faint, broken voice, hesitating and shuffling with his words. Yes, seven of us left. Here we are, dying, like men. Did what I came to do, beat the best record. The scene, as Caldwell looked around, was one of misery and squalor. The rocky floor was covered with cast-off clothes, and among them were huddled together the sleeping bags in which the party had spent most of their time during the last few months. There was no food left in the tent, but two or three cans of a thin, repulsive-looking jelly made by boiling strips cut from the sealskin clothing. The bottle on the tent pole still held a few teaspoonfuls of brandy, but it was their last, and they were sharing it as Caldwell entered. It was evident that most of them had not long to live. Caldwell immediately sent Chief Engineer Lowe back to the cutter to put off to the bear with Long to report and to bring the surgeon with stimulants while he fed the dying men with bits of the food he had with him. As their hunger returned, they cried piteously for more. Fearing too much at one time would injure them, Caldwell wisely dissuaded them, but when Greeley found that he was refused, he took a can of the boiled sealskin, which he had carefully husbanded and which he said he had a right to eat, as it was his own. The weaker ones were like children, petulant, rambling, and fitful in their talk, absent, and sometimes a little incoherent. The bear, having by this time arrived, Sergeant Long was lifted from the cutter aboard and there told his pitiful tale. All were dead except Greeley and five others, 
and they were on shore in sore distress. Sore distress. It had been a hard winter, and the wonder was how in God's name they had pulled through. No words, says Schley, can describe the pathos of this man's broken and enfeebled utterance, as he said over and over, a hard winter, a hard winter, and the officers who were gathered about him in the ward room felt an emotion which most of them were at little pains to conceal. Soon after, the Thetis came in sight, and her officers, including brave Melville, whose last sad offices for De Long had been but lately finished, went ashore and aided those from the bear in the care and succor of the forlorn party. As soon as possible, the men were carefully moved on stretchers and carried in boats to the ships but not before a hurricane had broken upon them, which made the labor hazardous and difficult. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Emery of the Bear was making a careful collection of all the articles belonging to the camp. Near the sleeping bags were found little packages of cherished valuables, carefully rolled up and addressed to friends and relatives at home. The survivors, too, had already done up and addressed their own, and, strange as it may seem, a pocketbook was found containing a large roll of bills carried by the owner for some unaccountable reason to the barren shores of Lady Franklin Bay. It was not difficult to move the bodies of the dead there was only a thin covering of sand above the mounds that formed the graves. Looking out from the side of the hut to the ice foot, Caldwell's attention was fixed by a dark object on the snow. Following a path which led to it from where he stood, he found the mutilated remains of a man's body. It was afterward identified from a bullet hole writes Schley, as that of Private Henry, who had been executed on the 6th of June. Wrapping it in a blanket, Caldwell carried it to the landing place, where a seaman took the bundle on his shoulder. Presently, the boat came off, and all who had remained on shore were taken on board the bear. The ships returned to Payer Harbor. The next day, June twenty third, Lieutenant Emery, accompanied by Seabree and Melville, and a number of men made a second search at Camp Clay, which lasted several hours. Everything was gathered up and brought away. The officers of the Thetis, meanwhile, had secured from Stocknecked Island Greeley's tin boxes containing his scientific records and standard pendulum. The relief squadron in 1884, under Captain W. S. Schley and Commander W. H. Emery, and fitted out under the personal orders of the Honorable W. E. Chandler, Secretary of the Navy, had brilliantly executed its commission and had outrivaled the early Scotch whalers, to whom a bounty had been offered by Congress for the speedy rescue of Greeley, in pushing boldly through the middle ice. No relief or expeditionary vessels ever ventured at so early a date into the dangers of Melville Bay, writes Greeley. That the United States Navy one in the race for Sabine is an illustration of the wonderful adaptability and abundant resources of the representative American seaman, which so well fits him for coping successfully with new and untried dangers, and makes him a worthy rival of our kin across the sea. 
in triumph they bore the remnant of the lady franklin bay expedition home to relatives and friends only six reached america alive brave pitiful allison had died at godhaven july eighth six soldiers out of a company of twenty-five broken in health yet courageous in spirit and loyal to a nation that through a hard winter a hard winter in sore distress had left them to their fate end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the great white north this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by katerina the great white north by helen s wright chapter twenty nansen the man first arctic experience plans the crossing of greenland carries out his great undertaking voyage on the fram drifting with the current life aboard nansen and johansen start for the pole difficulties of travel the farthest north the retreat a winter on the franz josef land attempt to reach spitzbergen by kayak the meeting at cape flora with frederick jackson home in the windward the character of the explorer nansen is best summarized in the brief paragraph explaining his plan for the first crossing of greenland my notion he says was that if a party of good ski lobers were equipped in a practical and sensible way they must get across greenland if they began from the right side this latter point being of extreme importance for if they were to start as all other expeditions have done from the west side they were practically certain never to get across they would have the same journey back again in order to reach home so it struck me that the only sure road to success was to force a passage through the flow belt land on the desolate and ice-bound east coast and thence cross over to the inhabited west coast in this way one would burn all one's ships behind one there would be no need to urge one's men on as the east coast would attract no one back while in front would lie the west coast with all the allurements and amenities of civilization there was no choice of route forward being the only word the order would be death or the west coast of greenland between these lines one sees the fibre of this man who deliberately stakes out his course and invites a race with death to the goal of victory who carefully curtails to the minimum the possibility of failure who thoughtfully removes from weaker companions all temptations that might jeopardize his chances of success and who carries through a plan scoffed at by the world as the impracticable scheme of a madman there is an indescribable charm about this bold norwegian who was a terrible one for falling into brown studies as a child of whom his masters wrote he is unstable and in several subjects his progress is not nearly so satisfactory as might have been expected who combines a gentle childlike disposition with an indomitable will never doubting for an instant that he is right and the world wrong and who steadfastly goes to work to prove his point born in eighteen sixty one near christiana educated in the university of his native city fond of all the sciences trained as a zoologist a natural athlete an expert ski lober a good hunter with a spirit for adventure which is totally careless of all creature comforts fritz of nansen at twenty one stood on the prow of the viking a norwegian sealer bound for the arctic seas ready to meet a foe worthy of his medal this trip to east greenland waters for the purpose of gathering zoological specimens was followed by his appointment the same year as curator in the natural history museum at bergen the return of the northern in eighteen eighty three from his second remarkable journey to greenland determined nansen upon a similar journey the success of which he carefully planned Nordenskjöld had made fifteen marches on the inland ice from Sofia Harbor south to Disco Bay and reached an altitude of 4,900 feet, sending skilled laps on skis a farther distance of 140 miles, where they reached an elevation of 6,600 feet on the marvelous ice cap which still rose before them. Accompanied by three Norwegians, Otto Sverdrup, 
Lieutenant Olaf Christian Dietrichson of the Norwegian Army and Christian Trana and two laps, Balto and Ravna, Nansen sailed on the Danish steamer Thyra from Scotland, May 9, 1888. The Thyra was to carry the little band of explorers the first stage of their journey to Iceland. At Faroe Islands, Nansen learned of the extremely bad condition of the ice round Iceland. The east coast of the island was reported inaccessible. By May 17, the Thyra stood off the Westmana Islands, and later she passed Ray Janus, which carries the only lighthouse Iceland possesses. Anchoring off Thingere, the party took leave of the Thyra, and, warmly welcomed by Herr Graham, the merchant of Thingere, they evaded the Jason, which was to convey them to the coast of Greenland. On the morning of June third, the expectant party sighted a little steamer slowly working inwards. As she came nearer, she was found to be the isofold of the Norwegian whaling company. She anchored and sent a boat on shore, amid increasing excitement. I had begun to suspect the truth, says Nansen, when, to my astonishment, as well as joy, I recognized in the first man who stepped ashore Captain Jacobson of the Jason. Our meeting was almost frantic, but the story was soon told. He had reached Isafjord and, not finding us there, had thought of coming on to Durafjord with the Jason. But with the strong wind blowing, it would have taken his heavily rigged ship a whole day to make the voyage, and, as the Norwegian company's manager most kindly offered to send the Isafold to fetch us, he had taken the opportunity of coming too. Farewells were hastily said. Willing hands transferred the baggage, which consisted, in addition to the usual alpine outfit, of Canadian and Norwegian snowshoes, instruments, food, fuel and sleeping gear, a load of 1,200 pounds for their five sledges, and a restive and unwilling pony bought of her Graham, and the isofold steamed out of the fjord and to the northwards. For six weeks the Jason made fruitless attempts to land the impatient explorers on this barren coast of Greenland, when July 17, 1888, Nansen and his party attempted by boat to make Cape Dan, from which they were separated by an ice stream ten miles wide. When Ravna saw the ship for the last time, writes Balto the Lab, he said to me, What fools we were to leave her to die in this place. There is no hope of life. The great sea will be our graves. Sleeping upon the floes at night, dragging or rowing their boats by day, the journey to the coast was perilous and dangerous in the extreme. After several days they found themselves being carried south upon the floe, and, straight away from shore, at a pace that rendered all resistance completely futile. July 20th, says Nansen, I was roused by some violent shocks to the floe on which we were encamped, and thought the motion of the sea must have increased very considerably. When we get outside, we discover that the floe has split in two not far from the tent. The labs, who had at once made for the highest points of our piece of ice, now shout that they can see the open sea. The swell is growing heavier and heavier, and the water breaking over our flow with ever-increasing force. The blocks of ice and slush, which come from the grinding of the flows together and are thrown up round the edges of our piece, do a good deal to break the violence of the waves. The worst of it is that we are being carried seawards with ominous rapidity. Taking refuge upon a stronger and larger flow, the party evaded the issue with courage and resignation, though it must be confessed the poor laps were not in the best of spirits. They had given up hope of life and were making ready for death. A night of fearful promise succeeded a day of imminent peril. Sverdrup took the watch and paced alone the sea-washed flow. Several times he had stood by the tent door prepared to turn his comrades out. Once he actually undid one hood, says Nansen, took another turn to the boats and then another look at the surf, leaving the hood unfastened in case of accidents. A huge crack of ice was swaying in the sea close beside us and threatening every moment to fall upon our flow. The surf was washing us on all sides. The other boat, in which Balto was asleep, was washed so heavily that again and again Sverdrup had to hold it in its place. A second time he came to undo the tent hood, but just as things looked their worst, the flow changed her course and as if directed by an unseen hand sailed toward land, and took refuge in a good harbor. On July 29th, the fates were kind, and they made a landing at Anoritok, 62 degrees 5 minutes north, nearly 200 miles south of Cape Dan. Following the shore to the north, they fell in with natives near Cape Bill. The ice journey commenced from Ninivik, 64 degrees 45 minutes north, which was reached August 10, 
after pursuing their journey up steep, irregular slopes, covered with soft snow and beset with dangerous crevasses. They made only forty miles inland after seventeen days of most arduous travel, and reached an elevation of six thousand feet. It was now late in the year, writes Nansen, and the autumn of the inland ice was not likely to prove a gentle season, so the fact that it was considerably shorter crossing to the head of one of the fjords in the neighborhood of Good Thap to Christian's Hap was an argument that had its weight. I consulted the mayor again and again, made the calculations to myself, and finally determined upon the God Thap route. The point where I thought of getting down was that which we actually hit, and which lies at about latitude 64 degrees 10 minutes north. The rest of the party hailed my change of plan with acclamation. They seemed to have already had more than enough of inland eyes, were longing for kindlier scenes, and gave their unqualified approval to the new route. Sails had been rigged to the sleds, and with the terrific winds which swept the ice cap, advance was assisted by this means, the men marching on skis. So frightful were the storms that raged over these desolate snowfields that at night it seemed as if the tent would be torn to shreds, and before a start could be made in the morning, the sledges had to be dug out of the drifts and unloaded, so that their runners might be scraped clean of snow and ice, a task which we found anything but graceful in the biting wind. But the cruelest work of the whole day was getting the tent up in the evening, for we had to begin by lacing the floor and walls together, as this had to be done with the unprotected fingers, we had to take good care not to get them seriously frozen. One evening, when I was at work, says Nansen, I suddenly discovered that the fingers of both my hands were white up to the palms. I felt them and found they were as hard and senseless as wood. By rubbing and beating them, however, I soon set the blood in circulation and brought their color back. The labs suffered from snow blindness, and all were burned by the sun's rays. This was largely due to the want of density in the air and the reflection of the rays from the level expanse of snow. About ten in the morning of August 31st, writes Dietrichsen, we saw land for the first time. We were upon the crest of one of the great waves, or gentle undulations in the surface, and had our final glimpse of a little point of rock which protruded from the snow. It lay, of course, far in the interior, and for many days had been the only dark point save ourselves and the sledges on which our eyes could rest. At an altitude of nearly eight thousand feet, they toiled on for days over the interminable desert of snow, there was no break in the horizon, no object to rest the eye upon, and a course was laid out by the diligent use of the compass alone. From the second week in September, the party had been anxiously looking for the beginning of the western slope. On September 19th, Balto's joyful cry of, Land ahead, greeted the advancing sledge fleet. The ice conditions had become more formidable in character, the gradual descent treacherous in the extreme. It was a curious sight for me to see the two vessels coming rushing along behind me, says Nansen, with their square Viking Lake sails showing dark against the white snowfields and the big round disk of the moon behind. Faster and faster I go flying on, while the ice gets more and more difficult. There is worse still ahead, I can see, and in another moment I am into it. The ground is here seamed with crevasses, but they are full of snow and not dangerous. Every now and then I feel my staff go through into space, but the cracks are narrow and the sledges glide easily over. Presently I cross a broader one and see just in front of me a huge black abyss. I creep cautiously to its edge on the slippery ice, which here is covered by scarcely any snow, and look down into the deep, dark chasm. Beyond it I can see crevasse after crevasse, running parallel with one another and showing dark blue in the moonlight. I now tell the others to stop, as this is no ground to traverse in the dark, and we must halt for the night. The joy of having crossed the ice cap, and the prospect of successfully passing the inland ice to the more congenial soil of the western coast, caused the little band to meet cheerfully the most arduous labor in a perilous descent over crevasses and glacier, mountain and valley into the promised land, of which old Ravna spoke with enthusiasm. I like the west coast well. It is a good place for an old lap to live in. There are plenty of reindeer, it is just like the mountains of Finnmarken. Having reached the coast, it became essential to reach civilization as well, and to expedite the journey it was found desirable to go by sea. The lack of a boat was a small consideration to men who had boldly sailed sledges across the Greenland ice cap. For though wood, tools and materials were lacking, 
there was the tent and plenty of willow bushes around, some six or seven feet in height. Ribs made of these would not be as straight as we could wish, says Nansen, and would not stretch the canvas very evenly, but the main thing was to get her to carry us. By the evening the boat was finished. She was no boat for a prize competition, indeed in shape she was more like a tortoise shell than anything else. In this crazy little craft Nansen and Sverdrup rowed away to get relief from the inhabitants of Gottthab. Their companions remained in Amaralik fjord in charge of the sledges and equipment. Great was the rejoicing in Godthab when the explorers reached there, and immediate preparations were made to succor the remainder of the party. These had slowly moved in the direction of Godthab and gratefully welcomed the Eskimos who met them with supplies. Unfortunately, the party missed the last European vessel that left port that season and were obliged to spend the winter in Greenland. Letters and dispatches, however, had been carried by the Eskimos down the coast to the Fox, McClintock's old vessel in his famous search for Sir John Franklin, and this veteran little craft carried the thrilling news of the first crossing of Greenland to Europe. The winter passed, and on April 15th, the settlement rang with a single shriek. The ship! The ship! Joyfully the brave band of explorers received news from home, and almost sorrowfully prepared to leave their hospitable friends of Godthab. On May 21st, 1899, Nansen and his companions made their triumphant entry into Copenhagen, and, concludes Nansen, May 30th we entered Christiana Fjord and were received by hundreds of sailing boats and a whole fleet of steamers. When we got near the harbor and saw the ramparts of the old fortress and the quays on all sides black with people, Dietrichsen said to Ravna, Are not all these people a fine sight, Ravna? Yes, it is fine, very fine. But if they had only been reindeer, was Ravna's answer. Previous to his famous journey across Greenland, in one of his many conferences with Dr. H. Rink, that veteran explorer of Greenland, Nansen was addressed by Mrs. Rink, who said to him, You must go to the North Pole, too, some day, and without hesitation he answered her emphatically, as though his mind had long ago been made up on that point. I mean to. From his twenty-third year, Nansen had bent his mind and energies upon that great journey into the polar regions, upon which he did not embark, however, until nine years later. In the meantime, he was appointed curator in the Museum of Comparative Anatomy at Christiana University. In the Danish Geographical Journal for 1885, Mr. Lützen, colonial manager at Julian's Harp, gave an interesting account of certain relics of the ill-fated Jeanette expedition picked up by Eskimos on the West Greenland coast. Among these articles was a list of provisions, signed by Captain De Long, a manuscript list of the Jeanette's boats, a pair of oilskin breeches marked Louis Noros, the name of a member of the Jeanette's crew, the peak of a cap with F. C. Lindemann or Nindemann written on it. It was plain to Dr. Nansen that these articles had drifted no less than 2,900 miles and in a period of 1,100 days. Nor could he escape the conviction that a current passes across or very near the pole into the sea between Greenland and Spitsbergen. Upon this hypothesis, Dr. Nansen urged his plan to take a well-provisioned ship, built on such principles as to enable it to withstand the pressure of ice, for on the same drift ice and by the same route it must be no less possible to transport an expedition. In spite of the madness of his scheme, its condemnation by many of the most eminent Arctic authorities of Europe and America, the Norwegian government extended its patronage, and the store thing granted 11,250 pounds toward the expenses of the expedition, the remainder being collected by private subscription. The Fram, 800 tons displacement, was built with especial attention to the construction of the shape of the hull, so as to offer the greatest possible resistance to the attacks of the ice. She carried requisite provisions for dogs and men for five years, and coal for four months steaming at full speed. The Fram left Norway in June 1893, skirted the north coasts of Europe and Asia, and put into the polar pack ice near the New Siberia Island, September 22, 1893. Frozen fast in the ice three days later, the Fram stood off northwest of Sonikov Land in 78 degrees 50 minutes north, 134 degrees east. It now behooved the company to ship rudder, clean the boilers, and prepare for winter. No idle moments could be spared. Rigging must be cared for, sails inspected, provisions of all kinds got out from the cases down in the hold and handed over to the cook, 
and the smithy called upon for his offices in repairing bear traps, hooks, knives, etc. A busy life is a happy one, and the Fram's company lived in harmonious good fellowship and drifted leisurely with the great ice pack, just as Nansen had predicted they would, with only occasional visits from bears to break the monotony of complete isolation. In December, Nansen, who had read Dr. Kane's fearful experiences in the Arctic night, with insufficient food for dogs and men, suffering from the ravages of scurvy, compares his own condition in the comfortable warm quarters on board the Fram. No aging or depressing effects had been felt by any member of his party. The quiet, regular life seemed to agree with them, and with good food and profusion and variety, a warm shelter, plenty of exercise in the open air, and cheerful diversions in the shape of instructive books and amusing games, the men kept up a cheerful balance of good health and spirits. Nevertheless, the patience of all on board was sorely tried before the cruise was over. The drift of the ship during the thirty-five months of her besetment was uneven and irregular. Her zigzag course as she receded or approached her goal encouraged or disheartened her enthusiastic crew. She met bravely and withstood in a remarkable manner threatened disaster from the ice pressures. Wild enthusiasm greeted the slightest advance, such as was found February 16, 1894, when the observations showed 80 degrees 1 minute north latitude, a few minutes north of the observations taken the week before. And a corresponding depression is noticed when contrary winds retired or actually forced the Fram to retrace her hard-earned progress. It is not surprising that Nansen's adventurous spirit grew restive under the enforced inactivity of the Fram's uncertain drift. Early in the year 1894, one finds his mind working upon the deep-laid plans to force the issue with the enemy, and eventually he announced his intentions of attempting one of the most daring and hazardous sledge journeys in the annals of Arctic adventure. His plan was to leave the ship with one companion, advance over the frozen polar ocean as far as possible, and without making an effort to rejoin the ship, retreat by way of Franz Josef Land and Spitsbergen back to Norway. February 26, 1895, he officially informed the crew that after his departure, Captain Sverdrup was to be chief officer of the expedition, with Lieutenant Scott Hansen second in command. On the 14th of March, 1895, the Fram stood in 84 degrees, 4 minutes north, 102 degrees east, and amid a parting salute with flag, pennant and guns, Nansen's third and final sledge dash to the north was taken. Johannesson, who had been chosen as his companion for this arduous undertaking, was in all respects qualified for the work, an accomplished snowshoer equaled by few in his powers of endurance, a fine fellow physically and mentally. Off they went, accompanied for a short distance by several of the crew. Three sledges drawn by twenty-eight dogs were loaded with two kayaks and provisions for one hundred days for the men and fifty days dog food. Nansen and Johannesson, fully confident that fifty days would see them at the pole, plunged into the unknown and met bravely the pitiless foe. Hummocks and ridges, lanes and slush, cold and exhaustion, these were the impediments to progress. It was Nansen's rule to march nine or ten hours, broken by a midday halt for a little rest and a bit to eat. These stops were a bitter trial to the men exposed to the merciless winds without fire or shelter, to be followed by the uncomfortable task of disentangling the dog's traces before they were able to take up the march again. On March 29th they were grinding on, but very slowly. The dogs were showing signs of weakening. There was endless disentangling of the hauling ropes. On April 3rd they were making the desperate way over ridges and lanes which had frozen together with rubble on either side. It was impossible to use snowshoes, there being too little snow between the hummocks. Thick weather, with deceptive mists making all things white, added to their miseries. Irregularities and holes in the spaces between, so that the men and dogs stumbled blindly on, crashing into pitfalls and cracks and running the grave risk of broken bones. On April 6th the ice grew worse and worse. After an advance of only four miles, Nansen and Johannesson were in despair. The following day the limit of patience was reached, a world's record made. Nansen found himself in 86 degrees, 13.6 minutes north, about 95 degrees east longitude, a distance of 121 geographical miles from the Fram, with 235 miles between himself and the Pole. Twenty-three days had passed. Nansen and Johannesson turned their backs upon a veritable chaos of ice blocks, 
stretching as far as the horizon, and prepared for their retreat to Cape Fligely. On this remarkable journey southward, confidently expected by Nansen to extend over not more than three months, but which in reality lengthened to 153 days, the courage and ability of these men was tested to the utmost. Frightful gales which disrupted the pack, and thick fogs which made advance almost impossible, added to their discomforts and privations. The dogs reduced in strength from exhaustion and lack of food, died one by one, over killed and fed to the survivors. The work of hauling became heavier and heavier as their numbers diminished. The men had the misfortune to allow their watches to run down, thereby making their longitude observations uncertain, the result of which was that they travelled far out of their course in search of the land which persistently remained hidden. Early in June it became necessary to curtail the rations, and although they steadfastly kept to weights, in order that their remaining provisions would last, they were reduced June 18 to a frugal supper of two ounces aleuronic bread and one ounce butter per man, and crept into their sleeping bags hungry and exhausted. The capture of a seal relieved the situation that threatened to become very serious. At last, on July 24, the tired eyes of the travelers rested upon something rising above the never-ending white line of the horizon, and the joyful cry was raised of, Land! Land! Progress to the happy hunting ground was exasperatingly slow and not without its startling adventures. Johannesson was attacked by a bear, and without the prompt action on the part of Nansen would doubtless have proved its victim. Open water was reached August 6, 1895, and, by dint of paddling and hauling up on the floes to advance by sledge, on August 16 they stood on the dry land of Huon Island. Continuing on their journey, they soon realized that the rapid approach of winter would make the effort to reach Spitzbergen impossible, so they encamped on one of the outlying islands of Franz Josef Land, and building themselves a stone hut covered with walrus hides, prepared to spend the winter. Bears and walrus were plentiful, and supplied them with abundant food. Other game was occasionally shot. The cold Arctic night found them, on the whole, quite comfortable in their hut. The train oil lamps kept the temperature in the middle of the room about freezing. For nine months Nansen and Johannesson hibernated thus, with no variation to their existence but the taking of the most necessary meteorological observations. With the return of spring the two wild men made every preparation for their journey to Spitsbergen. This was no easy matter, considering they lacked everything, and the few reserved stores of flour and chocolate had mildewed and spoiled during the winter. On May 19, 1896, the sledges stood loaded and lashed, and after leaving inside the hut a short report of their journey and adventures, Nansen and Johannesson started for Spitsbergen. Though the winter had been long and monotonous, adventure greeted them frequently in their advance. Nansen nearly lost his life by falling into a water hole. They were delayed by a gale, during which they nearly lost their kayaks. Seeing these frail crafts, with the, all they possessed on board, drifting rapidly away from their moorings, Nansen sprang into the icy water and made a desperate attempt at rescue. Meanwhile, Johannesson paced restlessly up and down the ice in an agony of suspense. With strokes growing more and more feeble, the swimmer realized the desperate situation and, putting forth his last benumbed energies in a final stroke, grasped a snowshoe which lay across the end. All but frozen, Nansen had great difficulty in getting into the kayak, and still more trouble in paddling to land. Numb and shivering, the bint biting his very marrow, he yet had courage to fire at two ox which he secured for a warm and welcome supper. In the meantime, their meat was nearly gone. The outlook was anything but promising. In these frail, weather-worn, canvas-covered kayaks, twelve feet long, about two and a half feet wide, and hardly more than one and one-fourth feet deep, there was yet a journey of two hundred miles of ocean, more or less encumbered by ice, which intervened between them and Spitzbergen, where their only hope lay in being taken aboard one of the small vessels which visited these shores every summer. The future for Nansen and Johannesson was indeed desperate, but a happy chance brought them timely deliverance, and the dramatic meeting with Frederick G. Jackson, June 17, 1896, in the isolated regions of Franz Josef Land, terminated one of the most brilliant retreats in Arctic history. Mr. Jackson and his companions, who for two years had been making most valuable scientific observations and collecting specimens in all departments of natural science which the islands and surrounding seas afforded, welcomed the wanderers with open arms, brought them to the house, 
fed and warmed them, and, best of all, gave them news from home and letters. It was not surprising that the first night was spent in reading home letters, which Jackson had faithfully carried for them into these desolate regions, and in talking over the strange adventures now so happily ended. For at last their work was done, and, as Nansen said, he didn't want to sleep, he felt so happy. So the days passed rapidly until the windward came, which brought yearly supplies to Jackson and carried home the adventurous explorers. They reached Bardo Haven August 13. All that was needed to complete the happiness of the homecoming was news of the Fram, and this was not long withheld. On August 20, 1896, the joyful tidings of the arrival of the Fram reached Nansen in a brief telegram sent from Skyervo, Kernangam Fjord. She had pursued her monotonous drift to her highest point to the west-northwest, 85 degrees 57 minutes north, 60 degrees east, changing to a south-southeast direction to 84 degrees 9 minutes north, 15 degrees east, where she remained nearly stationary from February until June, 1896. The open summer permitted Captain Sverdrup to push through her ice barrier and, by the judicious use of explosives, blast her way to the open water August 13, 1896, north of Spitsbergen. End of chapter 20